about as loud as I can make it, I think. If everyone would please take your seat, we're going to start our meeting. Please take your seats. Thank you. And if you don't have a seat in here, there is an overflow room um, back here. If you do not have a seat, we're still uh, maintaining social distance and mask wearing. So thank you, everyone. All right, I'm going to call the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, November 10th, 2020, to order. Today we're going to start with an invocation by Pastor Mark Childers of the Bayside Community Church, West Bradenton Campus, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you're able. We'll bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we just uh, come before you today with thankful hearts. Uh, first of all, to be called children of God, we thank you. Thank you that we live in a great nation, a great city. God, we're so privileged and blessed by you and, and your many blessings, God. And we pray today that, God, you would lead, God, and direct these proceedings today. God, I pray that your presence would be felt here. God, you'd pour out your spirit here. God, pour out your blessings upon every county, city official. God, every servant of this community. God, we pray you bless them today, God, as we are in, in very difficult times. God, we just pray that we would be led by you in all that we do. God, I thank you for, first, that we recognize you today, that you are still the God of this nation. So, God, we honor you with everything that we say, everything that we do. God, I pray that it brings glory and honor to your name. And, God, that you would bless this city, bless this county with every decision that we make. That you would continue to help us to grow and to flourish. And, God, that we would continue to be your people led by your spirit. God, we love you. We thank you for all of these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We're going to start this meeting with an announcement. This is a required announcement that the first public hearing for consideration of the Jackson Crossings Phase 2 Green Reuse Area designation will be held later in this meeting. All right, we have items scheduled for time certain. Um, 11.30, any items pulled from the consent agenda, taking a lunch break approximately around noon. At 2 o'clock, we have item 63, which is discussion of ongoing issues relative to coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, extension of the local state of emergency, and at 2.30, item number 64, recognition of outgoing commissioners. Are there uh, updates to the agenda, Madam Administrator? Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board. There are several updates for this morning beginning with changes to the awards presentations and proclamations. This is item eight, adoption of proclamation declaring racism as a public health crisis and supporting all efforts to address racism and public health disparities. A written comment submitted through the online public comment form was added to this agenda item. Under changes to the consent agenda, financial management, item 20, adoption of the FY20 budget amendment resolution B-20-1. 111 budget resolution B-20-111 was updated and replaced at the request of the clerk's office to reflect additional adjustments required for the close of September 30th, 2020 for the following items within the resolution. The dollar amount in item 5 was amended from 33,498 to 34,640 because of an update in the interest payment due to the Department of Children and Families. Item number eight was added for the Supervisor of Elections CARES Act reimbursement. Item nine was added to reflect transfers to the radio fund and to the stormwater management fund. Under changes to advertise public hearings under financial management, item 61, adoption of resolution R-20-158 regarding the infrastructure sales tax and amending the project scope. The infrastructure sales tax project and equipment list which is attached to resolution R-20-158, was updated and replaced to coincide with changes 
to the budget resolution B-21-029, which is item 66 on this agenda. Then changes to your regular agenda, agenda under the administrator, item 63, discussion of ongoing issues relative to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, an extension of the local state of emergency and weather emergency update. The subject of this item was updated to include a weather emergency update, the resolution R-20-182, declaring a local state of emergency for Tropical Storm Eta was attached, and the Week 28 Reopening Strategies Report and ongoing responses to COVID-19 pandemic presentations were added. Under Financial Management, item number 66, the execution of guaranteed maximum price GMP addendum to agreement number 19-TA003144 CD for construction management at risk services for Manatee County Lincoln Park Pool adoption of budget resolution B-21-029. The budget resolution B-21-029 was updated to reflect the increase of $232,014 to the infrastructure sales tax project and equipment list for the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the Lincoln Park pool project and a reduction of $610,000 on the infrastructure sales tax project and equipment list for the Coquina Trail Phase 2 project. Then under changes to the commissioner agenda, under Commissioner Benack, item 69, annual performance evaluation for the county administrator, Sherry Corrier, the June 2020 and November 2020 evaluation ratings and comments were added to this agenda item. And then additions to the consent agenda under financial management, item 70, execution of interlocal agreements regarding CARES Act funding, request to approve and authorize the county administrator to execute interlocal agreement between Manatee County and the City of Holmes Beach for the CARES Act funding, funds to be used in accordance with the CARES Act, and then approval and authorize the County Administrator to execute the interlocal agreement between Manatee County and the School District of Manatee County for the CARES Act funding, funds to be used in accordance with the CARES Act once the interlocal agreement is approved and executed by the School District of Manatee County. And thank you very much. Those are all the changes today. All right, great, thank you. All right, are there items to be pulled from the consent agenda by any of the commissioners? Anybody, Carol? Um, yes, I'd like to pull 52. And I'd like to just make a um, comment on item number 30 that a lot of people in the public would have asked, I wish it could have kind of been public that we uh, gave a report on this, but uh, we have uh, we are approving 1.9 million to go to the Bradenton River Library. That'll be a 4,200 um, foot square foot expansion, and 20,000 has been donated by the Friends of Bradenton River um, towards that project. So we've been waiting for that for years. So that's all I had to say about that one. All right. Anything else, commissioners? All right, so item number 52 has been pulled. We'll come up at 11.30. All right, then we're going to go ahead and uh, move to awards, presentations, and proclamations. We have a presentation of the November Employee of the Month Award to Rich D'Alessandro. Welcome. Good morning, County Commissioners, County Attorney Clegg, and County uh, Administrator Corrier. Ava Eady for Neighborhood Services. I'm very proud to be here to uh, speak about Rich D'Alessandro, our November Employee of the Month. Rich is one of those employees that every one of his colleagues can agree on. They are proud of every day. He exemplifies uh, the ACE philosophy, has an amazing work ethic. Rich is uh, decent. He's just truly decent at heart, and he has positivity in spades. I've never seen anybody overflow with positivity like Rich does. He's done nothing but thank us for hiring him four years ago. He has brought it every day. He's a um, customer service professional on the front lines, and with his colleagues, 
He is that guy that comes with all the creativity and stick to and step in and help and lend a hand every day. So without further ado, I'd just like to introduce our um, library manager, Elizabeth Partridge, and she's going to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Um, I am uh, excited to be here because I've only been here for three months and already I get this exciting opportunity to recognize somebody on the staff. Um, I spent some time with Rich the other day, getting to know him and understanding, you know, how did he actually earn this uh, recognition? And it took all of five minutes for me to understand he earned it by being himself and by caring and um, wanting to give his best to this community. The one thing that I noticed immediately is that he is selfless. He will talk about the successes of his team before himself, and he loves this county. So you cannot go wrong with an employee like that. So I don't know as much about him as his coworkers do, so I'm going to introduce Hal Harmon, his supervisor, who will talk a little bit more about him. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, County Commissioners and County Administrator, for the opportunity to say a few words about uh, Rich, uh, my staff member. My name is Hal Harmon. I'm the uh, supervisor of the Rocky Bluff Library in Ellington. And I've had the privilege of being Rich's supervisor twice now at two different libraries. And uh, he's such a pleasure to work with. Um, he's got a tremendous work ethic, and he's got a real passion for public service. He uh, has mentioned to me on many times that if he knew what a wonderful place Manatee County was to work for, he would have done this many, many years ago. Um, during my tenure at the Rocky Bluff Library, he has been involved in a lot of projects which have made some major contributions to the library. Just recently, he helped us reorganize our whole collection to make it more browsable and easy to use for patrons. Um, during the COVID situation, he was very important uh, to help me get the library prepared for reopening. Uh, I don't know that I could have done it without him. Um, he has also taken a supporting role in our books by mail department, a service where we send books to people who are homebound and can't make it into the library. Um, as a neighborhood library, uh, Rich gives care and attention to each of the patrons that come into our library from the community. And uh, that care and attention is also extended to our veterans community, which he kind of holds near and dear to him. Um, this past year, he put on a Veterans Day social. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to do it this year because of COVID, but um, it was a very meaningful event for the community and for Rich uh, to have veterans tell their stories uh, to one another. Um, I can say, I think speaking for the staff, that we all appreciate uh, working with Rich and uh, he's not just a good team member, but we also consider him a friend. Um, this is a well-deserved honor and uh, congratulations, Rich. Okay, Rich, you're not getting off that easy. You gotta come up and say a couple words. Now's the time to say whatever you want. I left, I left my speech at home. <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't have one, but first I'd like to, to say thank you so very, very much to uh, the, the entire, from Sherry on down through Ava. I mean, you guys have been around me the entire time I've been here. Always, always uh, in good moods, always leading, always just sharing and, and supporting us more than anything else. And I hear some stories about Ava, which I can't share. <laughs> she helps so many people in so many ways, just quietly behind the scenes. It's absolutely amazing. I would like to echo what uh, part of the invocation. Uh, this county surely is blessed. Uh, the, the leadership in this county uh, make all the right decisions. They don't make them easily. I've, I've watched a number of commissioner meetings, and, and, uh, and I know today you've got a long day ahead of you. But uh, you're so dedicated to this county and to, to what we, we need here. And, and today's times with COVID-19 around like it is, at this point, this many months into it, COVID-19 fatigue, you hear that word a lot. Uh, 
nobody shows it around here in this county. Everybody just comes to work with a smile on their face. Everybody helps everybody, and it's, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm fortunate to be part of a, a fantastic, fantastic team of, of uh, people, and they do make it a pleasure to come into work every day. I want to thank you very much for this consideration, and um, I was blindsided by this as well. I never, never expected this at all, but it's, it's really a, a team effort here, and I thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. All right, we got we got a couple we got a couple of commissioners who want to say some comments. First of all, Commissioner Trace want to say a comment. All right, Rich, as you know, I'm I don't know if retiring is quite the right word, but <laughs> we're going to be seeing a lot of each other. Uh, love the library system. I'm a voracious reader, and uh, you're going to have to show me all those collections so I can get them read. Oh, next four years. That's my that's my that's my goal. Thank you, um, and I'll be happy to do that, but I know you do read because you've uh, read to our children in our uh, big storytelling festival, uh, and yes, we appreciate uh, the time that you've given Ferdinand the Bull and Donkey Walkie are two of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Donkey Walkie. Donkey Walkie. A great one. And, and, and Rich, it's, gr it's great to see you honored here. Um, you know, it, it, it took me a little while, Rich, this is me, uh, oh, Betsy yeah, Benack. <laughs> It, it took me a little while to figure it out that my husband was the one who actually first introduces because he was a teacher to your kids, so I know that you've known him for a long time. So it's great to see you get this recognition. I will tell Bob about it when I go home. It's just been a lot on my mind, but it's so great to see you here today get this recognition. Thank you so very, very much. I really appreciate it. And okay. tell Bob that uh, he's the lucky one there with the two of you, okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> All right. Well, this is great. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we're going to move up to proclamations. Move uh, to accept the proclamations. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion for acceptance of the proclamations by uh, Commissioner Trace, seconded by Commissioner Bellamy, I think I heard. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 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 Okay. Uh, chair votes aye, motion passes. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start with the first proclamation, which I am going to read. Um, very pleased to be able to read. This is adoption of proclamation recognizing the Mayor's Feed the Hungry program. So we're going to come down to this podium. Mayor's Feed, come on, girlie, lead the game. Come on up, guys. Come on, Mayor. Come on, Mayor. Everybody involved. All the mayors. Judy, everybody. Yep. I've never heard that happen okay. since I've been here. here. Ever. First for me. Um, yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> All righty. <coughs> Proclamation, Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida. Whereas the main... I read. Whereas the Mayor's Feed the Hungry program is an all-volunteer program started in 1987 by former Sarasota Mayor Freddie Atkins to help feed hungry citizens in our communities. And whereas this program has been endorsed by the mayors of Anna Maria, Bradenton, Bradenton Beach, Holmes Beach, Town of Longboat Key, Palmetto, Sarasota and Venice, as well as the chairpersons of the Manatee County, Sarasota County and Northport Commission and whereas, since 1987, the Mayor's Feed the Hungry program has collectively given away over 3.5 million in food gift cards and over 600 tons of food free of charge to member agencies or recipients. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has directly impacted many area residents, resulting in lost income and food uncertainty, and the Mayor's Feed the Hungry program will be a vital lifeline for many families during the upcoming holiday season. And whereas the Manatee County Board of County Commissioners acknowledged the needs of the residents of Manatee County by setting aside $25,000 in CARES Act funding for each of the cities within the county's boundaries to support the Mayor's Feed the Hungry program, totaling $150,000. 
Now therefore be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida recognizes and values the Mayor's Feed the Hungry program and celebrates over 30 years of success achieved by dedicated volunteers and member agencies in helping to meet this overwhelming community need. Adopted with a quorum present and voting this 10th day of November 2020, and I got to sign it as the chairman. So, all right. All right. Hi, my name is Joel Swallow. I'm the volunteer chairman of Mayor's Feed the Hungry. And I've been involved with it for over 30 years. It's been a real blessing to see it grow. This is the largest grant or gift, whatever you want to call it, from uh, any individual city or group or county. And it's going to feed an awful lot of people. What we do with the money is get to buy $10 food gift cards from Publix. They give us a 4% discount if we buy 100,000 at a time, which we try to do. But uh, the cards can be used for food only, no tobacco, alcohol, or lottery. And they're distributed through our agencies who have their clients that they screen for the very needy people. And uh, they can use the card to buy what they would like to have. So it gives them a little dignity and choice for their meal or for their children or for baby food. You don't get those kind of things from big banks or food banks. But they're here 24-7. We focus on the holidays. So this is really going to help us for the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, and Christmas. And that's where a big need is. Uh, there are a lot of hungry people because of the virus. It's even worse because of unemployment. So you can imagine. So it's a miracle that you guys are that generous here in Manatee County. I'm trying to get Sarasota County to do it, but uh, uh, so far, no good. But that's why I don't ever give up. But uh, it's going to push us with what we normally get uh, closer to that $4 million mark, which is not really a goal, but it's just a blessing to be able to give that much food away to hungry people. So on behalf of all of our volunteers, all the mayors, uh, we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you and bless you. I'd like to ask uh, Miss Shirley to say a few words, one of our long-term members. Yeah, Miss Shirley, that's a great work. I'd like to say good morning to all of you and um, I'm Shirley Pearson, and um, I'm trying to keep from being emotional here because I really appreciate and especially thank all of you, you know, for what you're doing. Uh, this gift is so precious, and I know personally how much it's going to help the people that we serve in our community on a daily basis. I serve as director uh, here in Palmetto at Mount Carmel Community Resource Center. Strength and Action Inc. And as I said, I see on a daily basis the needs, people have lost their jobs and all of this. And this is going to help tremendously our clients. And I just want to, I just look out there and I just want to just run out there and hug all of you for doing this for us, Sherry. <laughs> Commissioner Moore and Reggie Benek, all of you, this special thank you. And not only, you know, um, I was just like, and I had asked uh, uh, the, uh, the law enforcement in this community works with us too, with May I Be the Hungry. Mm -hmm. And I had talked to um, Sheriff Wells this morning and he can come, but I know he loves and he works with uh, Matthew the Hungry as well because he's been working with us for 10 years now. And any time you get your family involved with something, that tells me your heart is involved with it. He brings his kids, Tyler and Brody and his wife, Lapita, every time, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas to help give this food out. So 
when we come together, and then Police Chief Tyler back there, he brings his officers and to help us out, and, and the mayors, Mayor Brian, all of them, and they help us when we give this food out on Thanksgiving and Christmas. And when we come together as a community, then comes success. And we need to continue to work together, all of us, law enforcement, commissioners, everybody in the city, to help our community. A special thank you again. I'm going to go now before I get emotional. <laughs> really, thank you so Where much. New mayor. Um, I, I just, I want uh, everybody to recognize how much this group of people, everybody back here, not only do they help, but when we're distributing food, especially at Mount Carmel, the one I'm most familiar with. Did you know that the islands send staff, they send law enforcement, they send code enforcement, Bradenton does, uh, a lot of the different communities. It's not just what you see here in the dollars. They, they really jump in and help to make a difference. So I just want to say kudos to, to all the mayors and all the uh, law enforcement, because they come and help. So I just want to give a lot of credit, and God bless Ms. Shirley. Yes, God bless Ms. Shirley. <laughs> Thank you again for this. Uh, and we can't give enough credit to Joel Swallow, who has worked on this program. And uh, he drags me to Sarasota to try to beat up on them to do better. And set this Manatee County is set, setting such an example. So, Joel, thank you for your work. Without you, we could not have done this. And uh, we've done this for 20 years together. Mm -hmm. And he's even enlisted my wife, Mickey, to go <laughs> to work, too. So, thank you all. We really appreciate the money. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Good I just want to say thank you to all the mayors, uh, Chappie, Titsworth, um, Mayor-elect Jean Brown, uh, so good to see you here. Thank you all for showing up today on this special day, and um, we're very happy that the federal government gave us this money, we didn't <laughs> make it up, yeah. and that we could share it, and I, I really credit staff for getting this money out in a creative way. It's Sometimes, you know, it's funny when you get all this money at once, it's not easy to figure out how to get it out into the community, but this is a fabulous way to get it out in the community, so I appreciate all the help from everybody. Next up is adoption of proclamation designating November 2020 is National Animal Shelter and Rescue Appreciation and Adopt a Senior Pet Month in Manatee County. Is there anyone here that would like to um, receive this proclamation with uh, Commissioner Whitmore? They're in the hallways. Okay, yes, we have our... Before I start, people. I, I have to say something while my friends are still here. I've been on the county commission for 13 years. I've been an elected official before then for 16 years. And I have never, ever seen our boards not vote for a proclamation. And today we had that. And it's turned political. I may not agree with some things that will come before us on proclamations, but whoever brings them forward, it's here to support because some people don't feel like I do. And um, I just had to say that because in all my years, I don't know if that's ever happened, and I'd like to ask the clerk of the court to provide me, if they can, if we've ever voted against proclamations as a board. So 
I'm sorry. I'm just so upset about that. But I wanted to, it's a good thing. I got my animal friends here. And thank you, Betsy, for allowing me to present this today. Also, we have with us today, um, we have friends of Manatee County that's going to say a little something and tell you what's going on with them. And also, Shelter Manatee, I don't know if they were able to make it, but that is the nonprofit group that started that's actually raising actually hundreds of thousands of dollars they've already raised now to build the new shelter out of the two million dollar commitment that they had um, committed to so pam was going to try to make it i don't know if she's here yet okay. and here are our hard-working friends whereas november is national animal shelter and rescue appreciation month which or recognizes manatee county animal services partnering shelters and dedicated rescue organizations and whereas november is national adopt a senior pet month which recognizes manatee county animal services partnering shelters and rescue organizations dedicated to help older pets find loving forever homes great animals that are often the last to be adopted from shelters and whereas Manatee County Animal Services is on the community's only open admission shelter that in Congress with the other area, in Congress with the other <coughs> area shelters and rescues provide the love and care to the community's abandoned and stray animals and has become a safe haven for homeless and abused animals providing them with a comfort and care. And whereas this month is dedicated to the hardworking people who support the efforts of the shelters and rescues, keeping pets safe and healthy. And whereas Manatee County is deeply committed to animal welfare and is dedicated to helping both the animals and the people we serve by returning lost pets to their owners. And whereas Manatee County Animal Services rescues almost 4,000 animals a year and could not do it without the dedicated shelters, rescue organizations, and volunteers in our community that provide year-round com compassion, proven dedication, love and care to all neglected, abused, abandoned, abandoned animals and homeless pets now therefore be it proclaimed by the board of county commissioners of manatee county florida that november 2020 shall be known designated and set aside as animal shelter and rescue appreciation and adopt a senior pet month adopted with a quorum presented the, the voting this voting day 10th of november and for the last time i'll be able to say it signed by our chairman betsy bennett so with that, I'm going to introduce the um, Animal Services Group, and then we'll have um, Karen Hodges speak on behalf of Friends of Manatee. Good morning. Oh, I'm short. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Sarah Brown, Chief of Animal Services. On behalf of Manatee County Animal Services, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you and to everyone in the community for the support of the animals in our community. We have a very, very passionate community for animal welfare, and it's something to celebrate. And that's what this month is all about. It's about celebrating the shelters, the rescue groups, our partners that help us continually achieve an over 90% save rate. We just ended the fiscal year with a 93% save rate, so we're really proud of that. But we couldn't do that without our partners. A huge shout out to the Friends of Manatee County Animal Services. Um, without them, we wouldn't be able to provide the above and beyond care that we can for the animals. So that's just huge kudos to them and to all of our other partners. Um, also, it's Adopt a Senior Pet Month. Um, we have fees waived through the end of the month. What a great time to adopt. Give these animals a second chance so they can, they can live out their golden years in a loving home. So thank you so much. Also, actually, while we're here, Dr. Johnson is our new shelter veterinarian, and I just wanted to introduce her. Maybe she wants to say a couple words. I'm sure she doesn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chief Brown. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Johnson. I, uh, I'm very excited to be here. I started with Manatee County Animal Services in April. Um, as most of my colleagues know, I am much more comfortable with animals than I am with people, so <laughs> I apologize if I'm a little awkward. Um, but I'm very excited to join such a hardworking, compassionate team. Um, we are all very in it for the animals. We do a lot of very hard work, um, and we, do, we go above and beyond for every case that 
we can. Um, and so we're very excited um, to keep pushing forward and do as much work as we can for the animals and the community that we serve. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Smile, Jake. Good morning, commissioners. It's um, I know we're here with a proclamation for uh, adopt a, a uh, uh, an animal shelter and rescue month, but I just wanted to say uh, all the residents and all the staff of Manatee County is very passionate about animals as they should be. But I just want to take a moment to thank this group that stands behind me and the group that is at the shelter and Friends of Manatee County Animal Services. They really are a, a passionate group and they every day put in 110% to the welfare and care of animals. Um, as a paramedic, I thought that, you know, I, I've seen a lot with humans, but what they go through with animals is just, it's heart wrenching day after day and they really do care a lot about the animals uh, and what they do. They're, they are an amazing group and I just want to tell them thank you. Real quick, um, I'm going to introduce Karen from Friends of Manatee County Animal Services. Am I allowed to take my mask off now? Let, let him wipe, let him wipe. <laughs> and then you can. Good morning, uh, my name is Karen Hodge. I'm a board member of the Friends of Manatee County Animal Services, a proud board member. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit of something that was prepared by our president. Um, Friends of Manatee County Animal Services works hand in hand, and sometimes we say hand in paw, with Manatee County Animal Services to enrich the lives of the shelter animals by raising funds to provide additional resources, medical care, lots of medical care, and heart room treatment. Since we formed in October of 2016, I can't believe it's been that long, we have treated over 300 heartworm positive dogs, spent over 140,000 in emergency and specialized care to make sure that MCAS animals get the help they need, get healthy, and find their forever homes. Foamcast, as we affectionately call it <laughs> for short, also fundraised for artificial turf, which I know a lot of you have been to see that, uh, for the fruit, two front play yards, provided fencing for new play yards, continued to purchase coranda beds for every dog so they don't have to sleep on the concrete at the shelter, and provide enrichment and foster supplies for every animal at MCAS. Friends of Manatee County Animal Services will continue to work hard, hand in hand, with MCAS and go above and beyond to help every dog and cat at the shelter. And I just want to say thank you for this recognition. I want to say thank you to Manatee County Animal Services and their amazing, hardworking staff, and also to the community. Without the community and their donations, we would not be able to do what we do for the animals. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for what you do every day for our animals that are in the shelter. There, um, you know, there's some really cute older pets there. Like, I, like you said, you know, I'm very, very tempted now that I'm going to have more time to, have to <laughs> get my get my Javier a buddy. But um, all right, well, thank you guys for everything you do, Carol. Uh, there's like an eight-year-old that's been on our marquee that desperately needs a home dog. Um, they have a few like that. But I think what we don't, we haven't recognized. I think it's three years now, or maybe four years we have officially been no kill that means we have we have saved 90 percent of adoptable animals that's what that means if there are before we used to, we had a 50 percent save rate we have like in the 90s now for three years in a row three years in a row and that doesn't get recognized and we have been trying since 2011 to get there and we finally did okay well good well clap for that all right, thanks everyone for being here. Next we're gonna do uh, adoption of proclamation, declaring racism as a public health crisis and supporting all efforts to address racism and public health disparities. Commissioner Bellamy is going to um, read the proclamation. Good morning, everyone. Prior to me starting, I just wanna thank everyone to um, for supporting um, the staff. Um, Pascal, I don't want to mispronounce your, um, your, your last name, but I'll tell you, thank you. You're 
uh, Mr. Barnett, Josh Barnett. So, so, so here, here we go. You know, I'll just read the proclamation, then I'll go from there. Proclamation Board of Manatee County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida, Declaration of Racism as a Public Health Crisis. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Dr. Martin Luther King, whereas the Manatee County Commissioner has demonstrated track record promotion of racial equity, inclusion and diversity that is exemplified in Manatee County's fair housing goals, the Inclusive Manatee Initiative and partnerships in racially, ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. Whereas Manatee County also has demonstrated a commitment to providing for the health and welfare of its residents by establishing a health care program for low income and uninsured adults and children's services ordinance to improve the social welfare of county youth. And whereas racism is a negative, social system with multiple dimensions including individual prejudices that are internalized and interpersonal and systemic racism that is institutional or structural and is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. Whereas racism unfairly disadvantages specific individuals and communities while unfairly giving advantage to other individuals and communities and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And Manatee County, collective prosperity depends upon the equitable access to opportunity for every resident regardless of the color of their skin. And whereas racism causes persistent discrimination and dis disparate outcomes in many areas of life, including housing, education, business, employment, and criminal justice, and an emerging body of research that demonstrates that racism itself is a social detriment of health. Whereas the U.S. Census of the Florida Department of Health report that in Manatee County, the racial residential segregation index is 49.74%. Residents of color experience dramatically higher unemployment rates. Black, 12.6%. Hispanic, 5.7%, white, 5%, face a higher poverty rate as a community, white, black, 23.5%, Hispanic, 24.7%, and whites at 11.1%, have a lower home ownership rates. Blacks are 40.6%, Hispanics, 47.8%. Whites, 74.3%, have substantially less annual medium income. Blacks at 39,000, whites at 41,000, I mean, Hispanics at 41,000, and whites at 57,000, as far as the house medium. It's a long one, so stay with me. Whereas, institutional racism and discrimination in Florida and Manatee County have also exacerbated a health divide between white residents and residents of color. And when people are healthy, they create strong, successful communities. Being healthy is about more than genetics. Our health depends on the conditions of our daily life where we live, work, and play. And these conditions are not the same for everyone in Manatee County. Compared to the white residents, black residents are more likely to be overweight or obese and die of heart disease, cancer, or stroke. Twice as many black residents die from diabetes, and blacks, Hispanics, babies are more likely to die in their first year of life. Health comes down to whether the conditions of our daily life presents us with options or obstacles. And whereas black communities, working class residents, and those that suffer from disabilities are more likely to experience poor health outcomes as a consequence of the social detriments of health. Health inequities stemming from economic in instability, education, physical, environment, living in food and broadband deserts are an inadequate access to health care system. 
Safe and affordable homes are essential for well-being. But where more than 55.9% of renters in Manatee County pay more than 30% of their income in rent and face housing challenges, income has a strong influence on health and longevity. And due to a history of discriminatory policies, residents of color are more likely to experience economic hardship than white residents. Whereas a contemporary example of this disparity is highly by the COVID-19 pan pandemic is its impact on the black community. According to a recent CDC MMWR study, blacks are hospitalized at a much higher rate than other groups and the death of the blacks in that study is twice of the rates of whites. And according to the Florida Department of Health, black residents of the state are disproportionately more likely to die of COVID-19. God be with the Jackson family and the Simpson family. While black residents make up 15.5% of the population, they represent 19.4% of the Floridians who have died of the virus. This disparity is even more acute when looking at younger residents. For example, black residents make up 18% of Florida's population from ages 25 to 44, while representing 44% of the deaths of this age. Whereas more than 100 studies have linked racism to worse health outcomes. Whereas the Manatee County Board of County Commission stands in the residence of Manatee County with declaring the declaration of racism as a public health crisis and acknowledge that all lives will matter in America only when there is recognition and affirmation that black lives matter. Now, therefore, be it resolved and ordered that the Manatee County Board of Commissioners assert the racism in public health crisis affecting our entire county. Work to progress as an equity and justice oriented organization with the Board of County Commissioners and the County Administrator and its staff leadership continue to identify specific activities to further enhance the diversity and ensure anti-racism principles across the county leadership, staffing and contracting. Promote equity through all policies and approved by the county commission and enhance educational efforts aimed and understanding, addressing and dismantling racism and how it affects the delivery of human and social services, economic development and public safety. Continue to advocate locally and through the National Association of Counties for relevant pol policies that improve health in black communities and support local, state, regional and federal initiatives that advance efforts to dismantle the systemic racism. Further, work to solidify alliances and partnerships with other organizations that are confronting racism and encourage other local, state, regional, and national entities to recognize racism as a public health crisis. Support community efforts to amplify the issue of racism and engage actively and authentically with communities of color wherever they live to always promote and support policies and the priorities in the health of all people, especially people of color, by mitigating exposure to adverse childhood experiences. Promote racial equity training with the goal of reaching all county commissioners, county leadership, and staff. Encourage racial equity training among all community partners, grantees, vendors, and contractors. Identify clear goals and objectives, including periodic reports to the Board of the County Commission. Commissioners to assess progress and, to cap and capitalize on opportunities to further advance racial equity. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County that it supports additional efforts in Manatee County, the state of Florida, and nationwide to address the racism and public health disparities due to racial inequities adopted with the quorum present and voting this 10th day of November 2020, signed by our chairman, Bessie Benang. With all that has been read, we know that we are in trying times and we have an opportunity. As I said, when we had the march a few months back, I encourage the minorities to tell their story. It's okay if people from the majority extend the ear and have an opportunity to listen and to learn. 
I recall the first day when I came in and said, I may not be George Floyd, but I have had a knee on the back of my neck for my entire life. We have a lot of struggles in our community, but we as leaders and individuals that are out amongst the crowd, take advantage of this declaration. Do your part, do your part and listen to minorities that may have a struggle. If you are an individual from the majority race and you have minority friends, listen to them because their stories, unfortunately, have hardships and have created issues amongst families and things of and what we deal with day in and day out. My final recommendation based on, on evidence base, before I acknowledge the leaders, and if anyone wants to speak, one, we want to acknowledge the role of racism on health inequities to commit to addressing the root causes of health inequities and focus on equity across all sectors. We want to establish a community collaborative to work with marginalized communities as designated health equity zones to develop plans and recommend policies that address housing, education, economic, and health inequities among marginalized communities in Manatee County. The third thing, which is a little extended, we want to develop and implement a three to five year plan, health equity plan with measurable objectives. Our county is a results first county, so this aligns with what we're already doing. Measurable objectives focus on addressing health inequities among marginalized populations in Manatee County to include a focus on increased access to chronic disease prevention and management programs for black slash African American families. Increase access to maternal and child services among black families. Improve access to culturally sensitive mental health care services for black African American families. Increase health care provider trainings. I think that's very, very important. Increase health care provider trainings on the social detriments of health and racism as a social detriment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and your leadership, Commissioner Bellamy. One thing, Madam Chair, I do not want to um, go without acknowledging some of our leadership in our community. I know we have representation from MCR here. We have representation from the NAACP. Um, I see representation from the Black Caucus. I do see um, our community <coughs> activists there. Um, and all of you all, all of you, we share this burden together, and we're going to want to unite and conquer this burden together. Thank you for everything that everyone do. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to go to a couple of commissioners. I will let you know that I did get a, a question about um, public comment on a proclamation. And I said, I don't, I don't remember Chair's ever doing partner. that before. But immediately after proclamations pu comes public comment on future agenda items. And I think uh, our commissioner has laid out um, kind of a plan for things he'd like to see on a future agenda. So that's when I'm going to take comments from the public. So we'll go ahead and go to commissioner comments if you have comments, and I'm going to go to public comments on future agenda items, and that's when folks that are here and want to speak to this issue will have an opportunity. Okay, Misty? Yes, I just want to say thank you, Reggie. I'm very pleased that you brought this forward and that Manatee County is joining universities and counties and cities and states through across America to recognize this problem. Um, this, there's a long standing systemic racism problem in this country, and that is what led us here today. Um, and it's lethal to some Americans. It really is. Um, it affects every dimension of life. Uh, you've talked about it, access to education, affordable housing, uh, other things that contribute to an increase in health issues like diabetes and health and heart disease and things that result in Americans having more illness and dying sooner than Americans that don't fight with those problems. Um, so I am pleased to hear you bring this forward. I hope it's the beginning of the discussion, and I hope that we commit as Manatee County residents to diversity and inclusion and a community that removes <coughs> these barriers to health care and everything else. Thank you very much. 
All right, Carol. I think we all need to take a deep breath. And uh, I think a lot of things have happened over the last week or so, and people are very emotional. I read the proclamation this weekend. Again, in all my years here, ever, has any no board not voted for proclamations that a commissioner brought up. Uh, even if I don't agree with some of it, I support my commissioner. Um, and I've never, ever heard of that. So uh, the Brainton Herald last night, before I go to bed, I always read Twitter. <laughs> and um, I saw that they said, well, uh, you're bringing this up today. And then I started seeing things this morning. People go, how dumb are you commissioners bringing this up now? How dare you? And what in the heck is going on? And the Herald had said, well, we have a more conservative board coming up. Well. Kevin Van Osterbridge is a coach with you at Manatee High School for years. This is not about that. It's not like it's going to be us and them up there. It's going to be what we represent the entire community. Um, all, all of this board, everybody voted for Reggie to come back to us when this George Floyd issue happened. And we put him in charge, more or less, to come up with a plan for us, right? We all did that in the other big room. And we were all very supportive of it. And we did do that. And I assume this is why this is here today, even though everybody in the community thinks we planned all this. I read it when everybody else did. Um, the sheriff in our budget, all of us, all seven of us voted for the budget this year. We allotted, what, 300000 350000 for diversity training. That was in the budget. The budget, the sheriff was here. He asked for it. We, how much did we? 200,000. 200,000. OK, that's in the budget because of that meeting that we had when over oh, the other side of the building. I saw my friend Patrick Carnegie here. And when I read this, yeah, some of it, may, people may have issues with some of the wording. The black community is very high risk in health in Manatee County. Patrick Carnegie, I know I'm asking, I'm begging you. I see Dr. Bensey here. The information given in this proclamation are facts. It's the black community has high blood pressure, kidney disease, dialysis, obesity. It's culture on how you eat, high salt, high fat. This is just a fact. We have brought proclamations before this community regarding the American Indian since I've been up here. Um, the Indian festival that we have here at the convention center, we brought a proclamation about that. I tried to tell my friends this morning, this to me was not any different. I was just, you know, it was came up before us, and you can either support or not support the commissioner. But again, I, I don't think that's ever happened. But what I'm here to do, say today is we're all here. We've got to take a deep breath. Reggie has a plan, and hopefully somebody's going to put all this in writing so we can look at it. And when the new commission comes, we can start working with what we all can agree on and what we can't. We got to start somewhere, and today I guess that was it. So I really want the actual experts, um, these numbers are not made up, to come before us when it's time to speak for public car uh, comment. I would love for Patrick to come up here. He has the largest federally qualified health center, maybe the first or the second, in the United States. He knows, and he runs by data, he gets funded by the federal government and the states because of this kind of stuff. So um, this is not made up. That's all I had to say. But again, I apologize to my friends that have sent me this. I did not know this was coming up. I read it Friday or, or Saturday or Sunday when I do my agendas. You know, it, our, every commissioner has to bring up whatever they want on a proclamation. We've all done it. And, you know, and that's their right. And we tasked Reggie to do this. And he's done it. And now, um, uh, we don't want conflict in Manatee County, please, everybody. Let's say our piece, say it respectfully, and take a deep breath, and let us commissioners get to work on Reggie's plan, massage it, whatever. But let's all work, and let's not, let's not divide this community. Just one other thing, I have a friend who's been married. Um, she works with me in my other job. Happened 10 days ago. She is married. Uh, she's married to somebody that works at in one of the local cities, who's black, who's a, in a management position. They were at Walmart on Cortez. They were shopping, grocery shopping, and a couple was kind of around them and kind of looking. And they walked out in the parking lot, and this white couple goes, "Can you believe he drives that kind of car?" And I'm going, "What?" I said, "This isn't where I live." 
So there are issues. And this happened 10 days ago, and I'm not going to give his name because, but he tells me this stuff, what, what's going on, and I just can't believe it still is. Guys, please, I'm asking my friends behind me, and people are listening, let's take a deep breath, and let's all work together, and let's not divide this community. Okay. Steve? Okay. Um, yes. Um, I hear what you're saying, Carol, um, but you know, um, I know it's difficult to vote against the proclamation. I, I admire your putting this on the agenda and doing it, Reggie. Um, unfortunately, the way I read it, when I interpreted it, it came out as this group here are all a bunch of racists. That as leaders in this community, we're not doing a good enough job to help your race and all the diversity that we need. And, and I take exception to that because I don't, I think we do a really good job up here of trying to fund as much money as we can into the black community to help. We've got, I think, $11 million on the agenda today to do the Lincoln Park pool, to do the Washington Park area. We've allocated, again, the 300 plus thousand for diversity. So I, I just didn't feel that this was properly vented mm -hmm. to, to the commissioners. You know, that it was just, it kind of came up and was thrown on here and we really didn't have a chance to talk about it. And so it, it just, I was kind of insulted. I just felt like, hey, you know, I've been here 40 something years. I've always, you know, ran a lot of businesses, hired a, a lot of different people of color in my businesses. <coughs> I, I certainly don't consider myself a racist. And then when I read through this, I was like, well, you know, I don't like the way, that, you know, this is worded pretty harshly. And again, that was just my interpretation. I'm not trying to, you know, you know, tell anybody else how maybe how they read it. But it, it, it was just something that just bothered me that I wish we had done it in a different form so that we could have all maybe gotten, you know, or at least for my benefit, some understanding. Because I understand where you're coming from and I agree with it. But at the same time, it was more, I took it more personal as kind of an assault on a, not just me, but the county and my constituents that I represent throughout the county. So that was, you know, my point, but, you know, I, you know, obviously I'll be gone here in a week. So, um, you know, I would certainly encourage you to keep pushing forward on this. And, and we do have some issues. We know that not just in this county in the whole country mm -hmm. on racism. I mean, it's, it's, it's prevalent out there and it's unfortunate that it is, but it's been that way since, you know, what the civil war, <laughs> you know, probably before that. And, uh, but, it, you know, maybe the time has come now to, to start, you know, trying to heal some of that stuff. And um, and that's, I just, you know, wanted to explain where I was coming from on it, Reggie. Uh, but again, I admire you for bringing it, in, bringing it forward. And I hope that uh, the next, over the next several years, we will maybe achieve some of these goals that you're looking at to bring down some of these percentages. So again, I thank you uh, for bringing it forward. But that that's where I was coming from. Reggie. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's a couple of things. First of all, I don't want any misunderstanding about tasking Reggie to do something as a commissioner. Uh, when the George Floyd um, incident came up, you know, we discussed it, and Reggie went back mm -hmm. and, and started working on it. And I think the word task can easily be misinterpreted. Um, so I want to make sure that I, that I address that. Um, commissioners don't really talk about proclamations. Never. <laughs> no, we don't. Commissions we don't really, don't, don't don't really talk ever. about proclamations. Um, proclamations come out um, on the agenda. The agenda normally comes out maybe sometimes three to five days prior to, and and we have a responsibility um, to to read it. Um, I, I understand what what you're saying, and um, the the thing that I think you all need to realize is uh, there has to be a different focus lens, and. Um, regardless of how it was interpreted, the reality of it is we need to take a stance and we need to address the issues that face the black community. And I don't feel bad for nothing that was on there because of the 49 years that I've lived and the 49 years that I've struggled. I do my best to have peace with everybody. But what you all could never share as a white person is the issues that African Americans go through day in and day out just because of their complexion. Mm -hmm. And I want you to understand something. 829-1971, from the day I've been born to this day, 
I still deal with racial issues. And it's still live and prevalent in our community, in our county, in our state. And you can look at a lot of different issues and, and break for us to bring forward. So I don't feel bad. As a matter of fact, I feel real good for the people that are here to support me. I'm very thankful. And I feel great about the challenge for us to take some of these action steps and move forward. And it's going to give me an opportunity to continue to serve my district, give me an opportunity to continue to serve my county, and make this a better place. That's what I'm striving for. Yeah, Reggie, you know what? You and I have had a lot of conversation in the past about racism. And I understand where you're coming from, but I think the problem for me was public health emergency. And it, it's not just about blacks. It's about Hispanics. It's about every different race in this county. So I just felt that, you know, maybe we didn't hit the mark on, on what we had talked about and that we were going to try to do. I don't think we did. I hear what you're saying, and you're 49 years. I got it. Um, I just didn't think that maybe this was the right way to go about it because, you know, there's a lot of other people affected, just as you say, and we're kind of leaving them out. So uh, that's why I didn't support it. I think we need to talk about it's people of all color, and I don't think any color should be left out of this equation. We all, in different ways, including white people, believe it or not, uh, you know, do get involved in racism. Um, you know, I, I, you know, somebody brought up Facebook. I see Facebook all the time, and I see the comments that are made. None of us are spared, um, and I do know it's worse for blacks. I get it. But at the same time, uh, when you say a public health emergency, I think Manatee County government uh, has really tried to make a difference and make sure that we're hitting what we can and doing what we can. If there's some ways that we can do better, then we need to know about it and hear about it. But, um, you know, it's all of Manatee County. I don't think that just, you know, one race should be mentioned in this. I think it should be all. So from that standpoint, Reggie, I do support you. Uh, you know I do. Um, I support the community. It's just figuring out the right way to go about it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to say something, then I'm going to go to public comment. I know y'all want to I talk. To we say, will have an opportunity to talk, but people are here. I know, Madam Chair, but I have to correct something that's 100% wrong. Okay, well, everyone will get an opportunity to speak. And I want to say it before public. Uh, everybody will get an opportunity to speak, Carol. As but chair, we've given we everyone an opportunity. I'm going to take my opportunity yeah. at this point. Um, you know, uh, with all due respect to Commissioner Ball, you totally missed the mark. The point <laughs> of this whole proclamation was to say out loud that black people are disproportionately impacted by the health crisis that we are in. Mm -hmm. And not only that, oh, that but that's all the pre-existing conditions that are disproportionately experienced by black people. You know, I remember, and I, you know, Stavia Bailey's here, and um, I remember when I was running for office in 2016, and the question came up about all black lives matter, and what's always the response? Well, of course, all lives matter. That's always the response, right? Mm -hmm. It totally misses the point. Thank you. All black lives, black lives matter is saying you need to be aware that we have a different situation. Mm -hmm. And I am so fortunate that I was taught by my parents that when I was very young. You have to be carefully taught, right? Mm -hmm. From uh, South Pacific, mm -hmm. you have to be carefully taught and you have to be aware. And that is what you're bringing to us. I read this proclamation over three times, trying to see if I could agree with all of the statements in it. I agree with Commissioner Johnson. It was a little harsh in some ways. Mm -hmm. But could I say it was wrong? Mm -hmm. No. I couldn't find a misstatement in the proclamation. What happens with a proclamation going forward, that is going to be up to the next board. But you've got to make people aware of the issues before you can do anything about it, right? You got to have awareness. So yeah, it's extremely uncomfortable. I, you know, I've had these discussions with many of my friends. You know, I can't put myself in a black person's shoes. I can't. 
I cannot know what it's like, but I can read, I can be empathetic. It's one of the worst things when you're in this job and you're empathetic, I'll tell you it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> to sure. be super empathetic. <laughs> but that is our job to try to help recognize the issues in our community. I think Reggie has laid that out. That's the way I feel, that's why I had no problem supporting this. Um, yes, I understand a lot of people are gonna be very angry. They think that we've identified Manatee County as something unique. And yeah, you know, Manatee County does have a long history of racism. <laughs> a long history of racism. Has it all gone away because, you know, enlightened people like me moved here in 1982? No. <laughs> No, I don't believe that. So I applaud you for bringing this forward, laying it out, where it goes from here. You know, it's a proclamation. Y'all are gonna have to make some decisions. So I look forward to how this comes forward, but um, you know, if we can't talk, we can't recognize, we can't move forward. So I think we're gonna be able to do that. All right, I saw Misty first actually, then Carol, and then Reggie, and then let's go. And I'm gonna be really quick because I wanna to get to public comment too. Um, and I just want to share with you what somebody that I work with very closely at Manatee County shared with me when trying to explain the response to Black Lives Matter when people say all lives matter. And what this person said to me is, replace the lives with the house, that all houses matter. All houses matter. But when that one house is on fire, people are running to that house to help that house. And that's how I thought that was such a great explanation of why just saying all lives matter isn't enough. Of course, all lives matter. But, but minorities live in a different world and face different challenges than white Americans do. And the first step is acknowledging that so that we can change that so that everyone is treated equally. Okay, Carol? And I said from day one, even before I, uh, we started on this issue, that there's some stuff that I thought was a little harsh that probably didn't need to be in it, but could be in it later down the road. But I supported this because it was a public health emergency, and I respectfully do not agree with Commissioner Baugh at all. The black community is, does have a public health emergency. Even though more whites have COVID, more blacks have comorbidities that they're dying from. And that's why I can't wait to hear from Patrick. Whether we, that is not, uh, whether you're white or black or racism or not, that's a fact, that's a fact. And I can't let that go if you, if you did not support this because of that issue. This, to me, when I read this, I voted this because of the, it was a public health emergency. And you've got the data, the information, the science. Um, somebody will get upset about me saying that. You've got Patrick Carnegie behind us that will say that. Okay, uh, Priscilla, then I'm gonna go to public This comment. is a problem that festers in our community and our nation. Mm -hmm. We must deal with it. We must change our attitudes. And Reggie is my brother, my mm -hmm. friend, and I think you did a tremendous job. The hardest things in life are the things that we are taught as young people that are wrong. Mm -hmm. And we must strive to get a path that heals us. And whether it's a public health or whatever, this is a festering thing and it's healing. And we need to heal. And uh, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime, but I have seen, I believe, and I think Reggie and I have talked on this more than once, we have made strides. It's not the same place Manatee County was in the 40s. Um, do we have a long way to go? Yes. Okay, well, um, we basically summoned our public health <laughs> folks here, even if you didn't sign up to speak, I'm gonna ask you to please come forward and speak because I know you guys are busy, so please state your name for the record. Patrick Carnegie, President and CEO of MCR Health. And uh, one of the first, I'll be brief because <laughs> facts are facts, even though today some people try to make facts irrelevant, but facts are the facts. And what Commissioner Bellamy read are the facts. I'll be glad to sit down with anyone at any time and share what the health disparities look like in our community. 
And you have to really question and, and ask yourself if you have a problem with seeing facts, what's really your issue? You know, it's not about, you know, we have to address and focus on the disparities. There's something that we deal with in healthcare called the social determinants of health. And I'll be glad to talk to you guys about that as well. But none of this changes without action and policy, right? There's been systematic racism in this country, in this county, for a long, long time. And that's created these disparities in health. It deals with housing, it deals with jobs, it deals with everything on the spectrum that leads to what we're facing here today. So again, I hope that we take this proclamation and that we move forward now with action that leads to policy that changes these health disparities. And then we'll realize equal and fair opportunity and access for everybody. But we've got to focus on the black community because we're disproportionately affected by the systematic racism that exists. Mm -hmm. That's the facts. There's no way that you're that small of a percentage of the population, but that big of a percentage of the population with all of the health disparities, crime, everything that you see that, that, that's a problem in our community. So again, I commend you for the proclamation. I commend all of the commissioners who supported the proclamation. And again, let's don't run away from the facts. Those things are true, and until we face it and we put policy in place to change things, it won't ever get there. Okay, so thank you for your time, and I look forward to working on whatever commission or uh, committee you put together to, to address these things and come up with some real policy and action to, to change things. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Bensey will be up next. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, County Leaders. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Bensey here, your County Health Officer with the Florida Department of Health in Manatee. I'm here with my cultural sensitivity team leadership from the Health Department. We do have a team in place. Uh, we've been uh, working on this issue, making sure that all of our employees have a voice and that they represent um, our clients and our community uh, every day that they provide services in our Health Department. Um, I have good news for you. Uh, we have gone in the last five years from the 24th to 17th in the state in terms of the health of our county. So we are definitely making improvements. The bad news is unless we address the issues that were presented today by Commissioner Bellamy, we will never become the best in terms of the healthiest county in Florida. So how do we address these issues? The Manatee Healthcare Alliance takes part every three years in the Community Health Improvement Plan mm -hmm. that's currently going on now. We've just completed the assessment. We look at data including Florida charts, and I would encourage everyone to go to that website because it does break down every indicator that we look at in the state regarding health by race. So you can see the, the changes that need to occur still in our community. However, because the CHIP is now occurring, the Community Health Improvement Planning process, we do have that opportunity to have more representation as we work on programs to improve the health of everyone in Manatee County. So we look forward to working with you, Commissioner Regime, uh Bellamy, and your uh, team. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, I'm going to, uh, Joshua, did you want to say something? Good morning, Commissioners. Joshua Barnett, Healthcare Services Manager for the County. Um, we have a privilege to hear and learn, and I don't have the lived experience, but it is a responsibility that I take to heart to make sure that people do have equitable support for the promotion of their health and welfare. And in our small section, we have hired a health equity researcher at the University of South Florida with soon to be Dr. Pascal Edward, and we are doing community level analysis to find out how our program can better address not just persons by color, but where persons are concentrated and where they live to help improve the equity of neighborhoods and the communities and those who live in them. So we look forward to our continuous learning 
um, our intentional outreach to do better and to see improvements, not just in the individual lives, but of those communities for generations to come. So we appreciate the opportunity to look into the statistics and live in the discomfort to do better. So we appreciate this. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and call people as they signed up to speak on uh, future agenda items. And some of you actually wrote down that you wanted to speak directly to this proclamation, which is fine, because it's obviously a future agenda item. So first up, I had Betty Rhodes. Would you please just, when you come to the uh, microphone, state your name for the record, and you will have three minutes to address the board. You already did. Uh, good morning. My name is Betty Sales Rose. I wasn't going to speak on the issue because what was presented was really good, and we do have that problem because I was born during the segregation year. But the really problem I had was this morning when I came into the Civic Center, I was Czech, and some old minorities was Czech, and I observed that somebody worked for you also. Uh, the lady told them to go ahead on. I told her, no, that's wrong. If you check me, you got to check her. But she told them to go ahead. So y'all need to get that problem because we do have it here. It is a lot of black, biased people here thinking they better than the other set. And I know I'm good. So if you check me coming in here, I see you frowning, Commissioner. Don't frown at me. I'm telling the truth. I was agreeing with you. Oh, okay. But well, shake your head if I can see it. That you Sorry. are. Okay. We're not going to interactor and yeah but i'm just saying i just saw uh, you know i'm just saying are manatee county ready for this i don't think so because you have some commission not going along with what he is saying it is here it is live because i'm gonna tell you something we had a biden in harris parade last sunday listen we didn't say nothing no police was over that saturday when they met at the trump rally train was out to the the soda mall. No police was involved. Now, when we come in, police got to be involved with us. So, what make you think the Trump was better than the Biden? Was it no better? So, this community is divided. I know it is. It's divided like I don't know what. And you need to agree on this proclamation because what he presented is for real. And I'm going to tell you something being a sales, nobody in here is better than me. I don't care what color your skin are. And another thing that we really need to get on, I'm going to tell you all, is this. The pool is going to be dedicated Thursday from 4 to 5. Y'all got three more things you all voted on when Commissioner Smith was here. That was where the Livingston project of the 80 acres to be like a little playground. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? How about Lincoln? Tom, that supposed to be finished with lights and everything where people would not have to cross over on US 41. What happened to that? And what happened to Brad Clemens? The swimming pool, where I call him Brad Clemens, rest his soul, over in East Brighton. What happened to that? Y'all voted on that as commissioner. And y'all need to finish that task and everything. And you see that <laughs> the director right there? She know me real well. Sherry, real well, and she know I'm fair, and she fair to everybody too, so you as commission need to get on the task and what you all supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have Rodney Jones. Mr. Jones, please state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to address the board on future agenda items. Greetings, uh, Rodney Jones. Uh, is this okay? You can take it off. Yeah, that'd be better. Yeah. A bit better for me. Yeah, Rodney Jones. Um, I heard a lot of talk. I even heard uh, kind of compared the uh, proclamation to do with the dogs. Uh, many times, dogs get treated a lot better than we do here. Um, it's uh, the it's a long term uh, racist climate here. I'm four generations deep. I've been heavily involved in volunteerism my whole life. My parents have been. Uh, solid community members. My mom's a 33, uh, retired, educated from Manatee County School District. My dad worked 45 days, uh, 45 years for General Motors, and uh, we're homegrown here. Um, and it is very, the, the, you can't say let's not get divided. And Reggie, um, I'm not here to support you at all. 
I'm here to support the issue because you've been the primary problem by not supporting black issues in the community. Um, and so to hear you, I would have rather had, uh, had Misty Serbia read that proclamation than you. Um, and, I, and I mean that, and that's a, a pretty common sentiment in the community that you've stood down on issues. But the facts are the city of Palmetto, uh, according to the University of Virginia Commonwealth, is the ninth most racist city in the state of Florida by research based. Uh, here, in, here in Manatee County, blacks make up 9% of the county, but make up 26% 26 26 of the arrests, meaning that we are the feed mill for Port Manatee. Uh, Cynthia Saunders, the school district superintendent, has been found guilty of fraud by the Florida Department of Education for dumping hundreds of students out of school to fraudulently increase the school district's graduation rates so we can get to that elusive A school district so Pat Neal can charge more for homes. That's the climate that we live in. Um, personally, myself, I don't think we'll be able to work with this administration. You, many of you know me, I'm the gentleman that's been arrested a couple times for protesting against racist policing and the conditions down in the school district. Right now, in the last school board meeting, we were locked outside, not allowed to enter a public meeting, violating the sunshine. That's the condition of Manatee County. You can't run from it, you can't placate it. It is, and I would assume have all of you removed and work with any of you because you've had ample opportunity. You too, Carol Whitmore, I've sent you emails that we have documented that we've asked you to come and meet with us as an at-large committee commission in the black community. You have not responded to those emails and actually told another uh, county commissioner that you were not going to respond. So you guys are sitting up here placating the truth and playing some kind of game. So I know the frontline activists and those that are moving forward, uh, we refuse to work with this administration and this regime. You've had ample time. Our goal is to um, run you out of office. And those, as, as we found out with Mayor Shirley Gruber, Mayor Shirley Gruber is kind of, uh, going to be indicted for fraud. Uh, for targeting Lincoln Memorial Academy. Reggie Bellamy, you haven't looked at one piece of paper regarding that school or voice of one opinion on what happened at that school to those black kids. So you guys are a sham. Uh, you are fake. And, uh, you know, so our, our goal is not to work with any of you, the frontline activists. Our goal is to have you removed. It's time. Oh, good timing. Susie Copeland. Good timing. Yeah, Susie will be followed by Tracy Pratt. Good morning, uh, Manatee County Commissioners uh, and the uh, Administrator. Thank you, uh, Reggie Bellamy, Commissioner. My Commissioner, I live in District 2. Thank you for bringing this proclamation forward. And I will say, when I read it, I had a conversation with a friend who said, how is racism a health issue? And I thought about it, and I said, growing up in the South, living in Florida for over 48 years, I did a self-evaluation of my life, and I thought, how many times have I experienced racism and the impact that it had on my psyche? That has been, so it is, a, not only whether you look at it from a housing, employment, uh, business perspective, criminal justice. We also have to look at it as a mental health issue. When people are discriminated against, when there are acts of racism inflicted upon them, you don't know how that makes a person feel. And I didn't read in the document anything about mental, but I want you to include that because unless you walk in my shoes, I can't walk in yours, but I'm walking in mine. And I can tell you what I have experienced in my 71 years of life and being discriminated against, making, uh, experiencing racism. That does something to an individual. And I encourage and I appreciate what you uh, commissioners did this morning. And I hope you will look at the uh, expand in your proclamation and ensure that every employee, every county, every, uh, including yourselves, go through a diversity and inclusion training. You've got to walk in our shoes. And when we say a Black Lives Matter, I believe that. But I also believe that all lives matter. But when, different, when my life is treated differently than yours, 
then I'm going to step to the plate and say, yes, black lives do matter because it encompasses me, my husband, my children, and my entire family and the community. So thank you so much for bringing this issue forward. It's tough to talk about. Racism is a very tough dis uh, discussion. But until we have these sit-down conversations, face-to-face, -face, being open, being honest, we will never move forward. So I ask you to please don't take it as an, an, an attack on you as being a racist. Listen, when you have the conversations, you, we, we're all going to discover really who we really are as individuals. So I encourage you to please let's keep moving forward. And thank you so much for what you've done today. I do appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Great comment. All right. Um, next up is uh, Tracy Pratt to be followed by Extavia Bailey. Good morning, Commissioners, County Administrator. Um, first, I would like to thank Reggie Bellamy for bringing this proclamation forward. I stand here before you today as an ally. Many of you know me as Chair of the Manatee County Democratic Party. Some of you may know me as a criminal justice reform advocate, as an attorney in the community. Today, I also want to share with you that I am married to a board certified family physician who works in population health across the state with vulnerable populations. And when I told him that I was going to come here today to support this proclamation, he said, hey Tracy, you need to check out the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. These are global leaders in population health and they have acknowledged that racism is a public health issue. Looking at data, they have recognized racial disparities dealing with life expectancy, child mortality, education, and economic opportunity. And today, we see the impact of these disparities across minority communities, particularly in relation to COVID-19. I want to thank all of you today for recognizing this, for those of you that did. For those of you that didn't, I really encourage you to look into it a little bit further. It is time to have this conversation in the community. It is time to acknowledge what we can do, and it is time to move forward. With that, I reserve the remainder of my time for anybody who's actually impacted by this due to the color of their skin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Extavia Bailey to be followed by Michelle Martin. Good morning um, to all the commissioners. Um, thank you for being here today. And I just want to say, Reggie, I come to support you um, on this proclamation. And many may know, and I am a black Republican, a conservative. And many of my friends call me and they ask questions because I get beat down in my community because of my views, but it doesn't mean as a black woman, I do not support my community. I am directly affected by this. So anyone who read that proclamation, the comments that I saw online last night of some of my Republican friends, some of my friends, I don't know what they are, it really hurt my feelings because they made it, it's, Vanessa, you know how I feel about you. Steve, I have respect for you, but it's not about leaving people out. It's about the black community. High blood pressure. When we were slaves, they gave us the rest of the meat from the pig. So we ate that meat that was left over for us that has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. What this proclamation is saying is that as a black community, we are going to start taking care of us. We are going to start making sure that we are healthy, that people are aware of what's going on. I commend Reggie. I commend everybody that supported it. I asked Vanessa, I asked Steve, from the bottom of my heart, support this. Tell your constituents, this is not about them. This is about black people rocking in black shoes. When I was 14 years old, I was sick. All my hair fell out. I had black dots in my head. I had stuff all over my face. I went to the clinic. They told my mom I was going through puberty. 
I was 14 years old. I hit puberty at nine. A year later, my white blood cells were depleted. My red blood cells were depleted. I had lupus. It took a year. I went to Blake. They diagnosed me with the rheumatoid arthritis. Nobody thought to keep checking. I don't know why. I, I can't remember. But when I got to All Children's, I had 11 of the symptoms of lupus. You have seven to qualify, 11 is that means you actually, I had every symptom of lupus. This is not about, let's stop making this political. Let's stop making this about black and white. All Reggie is doing as a black commissioner is saying, these are the problems in my community and we're gonna start addressing them. Dr. Bensey just came up here and told you all that these are the problems in the black community. We're not saying that white peoples don't matter or Spanish or brown. We're just saying that black people are now standing together. These are our problems. And in order for us to be productive citizens, in order for us to be productive in buying houses and getting jobs, we have to be healthy. In order for us to be able to take care of our community, we have to step up. We have to step up. And I commend everybody that's here that's speaking, that's standing, and that stood behind Reggie. It's time. So when you go back and tell your constituents why I changed my mind and voted for this proclamation, it's all because it's time for us to have conversations. It's time for us to stop talking and say, oh, well, it's white or it's racist. All lives do matter, absolutely. Black lives matter too. That's all we're saying about us. Every time black people say it's time to take care of us, doesn't mean we're trying to be racist against other people. Just 70 years ago, we had Jim Crow laws that were implemented, and I wouldn't even be able to come in here and sit with you, go to lunch with you, talk to you, be educated with you. This is 2020, and we're about to go into 2021. We're just saying, as human race, as whites, blacks, Spanish, Asians, browns, whatever you are, let's start moving together for the better. We can no longer let five people, 10 people get on Facebook and say that's racist. One person said, I'm a native of Manatee County and if they pass this proclamation, I'm leaving. That makes no sense. <laughs> so I ask you today, I have love for every single one of you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. But support Reggie because he understands and he's from this community. I just say, maybe you just don't understand right now. But you can speak to any one of us and we'll give you all the information what we've been through. And it's not about, let's take this political out. Stand with Reggie. Just stand with someone who's saying, I'm trying to do what's right for my community. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you. All right, uh, Michelle Martin is the last person I have signed up. Um, and uh, Please state your name for the record and you'll have three minutes. It's Michelle Martin and it seems like I have a lot more than three minutes. Three minutes. She got to take the last person's time. Just please go I ahead. Know. I came here with a uh, script to read um, in response to what you guys had put on the website, but the conversation today has shifted and I just want to publicly say, not just to commissioners, but to anybody who listens to this live, one of the problems that's happening here is that they blur words, and so that words don't have any meaning, and so we're arguing about something, and each of us is saying, um, we mean something different by that. So I can fully support that I don't want racism to be part of my life or anybody else's life. Fully support that. But to call this a public health issue, and to muddle the language so that Reggie's um, declaration is actually very militantly political. And then for all of us to come up here and talk about like it's a, a problem with diabetes and uh, high fat content, we're, we're putting so much stuff under this umbrella of health that the word itself doesn't have any meaning. And on the website, it is specifically saying that the county wants to work with BLM to ensure that our policies are written into, in such a way that we have equity, equitable outcomes across all communities. 
That is not your job. Your job is to protect the Constitution of the United States, which is equal opportunity, but not the guarantee of equal outcome. I want to remind you, that is a socialist agenda. Equitable outcomes is a socialist agenda, and you have a very clear mandate from, the Manatee, from Manatee County that we don't want a socialist agenda guiding our policies here. We don't want the county to support an organization who itemizes on their website that they want a national defunding of the police. That is the problem here. It is not that we don't support communities that need help, regardless of color, that that's, that's irrelevant, okay? Of course we want to help communities, anybody, white, black, anybody. But the idea that you guys would align with an organization specifically with a position to nationally defund the police is not okay for the residents of Manatee County. And for that reason, I would not support uh, Reggie, who's ignoring me, Reggie, I would not support that declaration because that muddies the issues and allows for the political, like the, um, it's making the issue of racism far beyond a public health issue. You're making it, it's, you're making it an equitable issue and uh, that in itself is racism. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to address the board on future agenda items? I think we have a few people in the audience, and then I'll go to the folks on the phone. Madam Chair. So, uh, yes, Rich. Can I just let her know? I, have to, I always watch the screen. I was not ignoring it. Yeah, he, uh, wa he watches all the speakers on the screen. So thank you for clarifying that. Please state your name. For the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board on the, um, any future agenda items that you'd like to see. Thank okay. You. I'm Deidre Larkins. Um, I'm here in representation of uh, Black Lives Matter locally. Uh, Black Lives Matter Minnesota Alliance is an organization dedicated to the empowerment of black lives by dismantling supremacy and systematic racism through the community by uh, community outreach, education, and civic action. What we've witnessed for many years in the experiences of black people around the nation for many decades have been very evident over this past year. In the wake of the fatal deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, not only did I see people that looked like me in the crowds, but I also see people, saw people in the crowds that looked like all of us in this room. Though the conversation of racism is a tough one, it's necessary. This proclamation is a chance to implement real change and create equitable living in the communities of color here in Manatee County. It's a chance to get it right, a chance for liberation, a chance to work better together, but most importantly, a time to learn from one another, to revisit outdated policies or implement new policies to address the disparities, to validate the experiences of black people and actually hear us to understand. I look forward to the positive change and the impact that this proclamation will bring. In closing, I'd like to leave you with this quote by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Thank you so much um, for all who supported this proclamation. I thank you, Commissioner Bellamy, for bringing this to the board. Um, thank you, Sherry, for everything that you do. Um, and I look forward to, to working with everyone together and having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Others that would like to address the board on future agenda items, please come forward. Good morning, commissioners and staff. My name is Frank McAndrews. I live in Bradenton. I don't have a speech. I was going to come up here and note the negative uh, things that some of the commissioners have said about this proclamation, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I've been moved by what I've heard, heard today. I really have. I'm not going to go negative. Um, you know, 350 years ago, the first black slave landed in Louisiana. 
This problem is deeply embedded in the American psyche. Proclam this proclamation is not going to solve it. It may not even make a dent in it. But what we do and say here today does influence our neighbors and our, our, our children and our friends in, in our community. I am disappointed when I look at the racial makeup of the commissioners and the staff on, on our uh, county commission, as well as uh, the Bradenton City Council. I'm not going to take much time. I'm going to thank uh, Commissioner Bellamy for his work on this proclamation. I support it. And there are thousands of Manatee County um, citizens of my race that support it. Thank you very much, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others who would like to address the board on um, any issue they'd like to see any future agenda? Okay, we had someone on the phone. Um, yes. We'd yes, like to go to the phone caller for mm -hmm. citizens' comments on future agenda. Please Excuse go ahead. You. Uh, are you on. still? Are they ready to speak? Yes, ma'am. We do if, have a. If you could wait, I'm going to the phone's call, then I'll come to you, okay? Go Thank ahead. you, Madam Chair. There is a caller on the line with the last three numbers of 605. 605, we will allow you to talk. Please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes, please. My name is Andra, Manatee County resident. I just want to say nobody's disputing the facts or the data. I'm just appalled that you think it's due to racism. Manatee County has expended a lot of fixed for health departments, money toward MCR, hospitals, free bus passes to all underprivileged people. And we can't just keep blaming it on racism. There has to be some personal responsibility. For Carol, thinks, uh, thinks every proclamation should just be rubber stamped. This is crazy. In the last 20 years, I've never been called a troll by a county commissioner, but here we are. I find it very offensive to every healthcare worker, hospital, mortgage broker, realtor, that you're telling it has served people differently because of this color of their skin. And I am just appalled by this proclamation. It was just, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It was very insulting. I am very offended by it. And yes, there may be some racism with people, but as far as our, our normal day-to-day -day things, banking, everybody has the opportunity to open a bank account, go to school, um, get a mortgage, get a credit card. You know, I, I don't understand how this is a public health emergency for Manatee County, and with that, uh, I, I'm done. Thank you, caller. We, we do have one more, Madam uh, Chair. Well, uh, okay, wait, wait, go wait. ahead, I guess. Forgive me again, it's a uh, caller with the last three numbers of 081. 081, we will allow you to talk. Please hit star six to unmute. And that's star six. Must not be about that. I think we're okay, Manager. Okay. Please come forward and state your name for the record, sir. Good morning, or should I say good afternoon to each and every one of you. Uh, my name is Arthur Huggins. I'm uh, Vice President of Manatee County Pastors Fellowship here in Manatee County. I uh, wanted to uh, say uh, thank you uh, for the proclamation, uh, for whoever supported, got behind it, uh, and insinuated that there needs to be something done here in Manatee County. Uh, as I sat back there, I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, kind of led to at this point, uh, just following some reactions. Um, when I came here, I kind of figured that it would just be something that was said, photo op, and left. Uh, but I would, I would say this after hearing some of the uh, comments, um, that I would be proud. I would be proud to be a part of a board that would even suggest 
uh, and rather than look at it in a way that you feel like it was insulting to you or incriminating to you in some way, to know that you, because what's happening in Manatee County is happening worldwide, mm -hmm. but to say that you are leading the way for other counties to put forth your feet to make a change, uh, I, would, I would stand behind that. I would stand behind that and, and be proud of that. Uh, and it's just mere beginnings. I personally think that there's much more that needs to be added to the proclamation, uh, but I heard someone quote a little earlier that it's a start. And that's, for me, that, that, that sends the signs of being hopeful. Uh, so I want to in encourage each and every one of you today to look, and someone said talk, communicate, talk to people, understand their stories, understand why. And for those of you who don't understand, it lets me know that you really don't understand because you have not communicated. You've not become a part of the total Manatee County. Uh, we're not looking for handouts. What we're doing is looking for a hand up. Uh, you could talk about employment, that you employed certain people, but when you can't talk about us being the employers, you know that there's a problem here. And so I just want to encourage each and every one of you again to understand what is going on. And I would say to you, uh, Misty Servia, uh, the house truly is on fire. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, anyone else who would like to speak on future agenda items? One once, one twice, okay. We're gonna close, ah, oh, geez, I almost had it over with. Almost, made it. there is one more, it's a one. caller with a 081. 081, just hit star six for us, please. Caller, please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes, please. Yeah, my name is Robert Bernie. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay? Yep, yes. All right, thank you. Um, I want to bring up something. I, I think that calling racism a health crisis is problematic at best. It's, it's really a shame that it, the people are so divided that we call racism to solve issues of economic disparities. Is economic disparity a real thing? Absolutely. Is health crisis based off of racism a reality? Absolutely not. I really feel like, you know, there's a lot of people that spoke and had, had really important things to say. And I think it's really a shame that our country is in a place where we can't have these conversations. And any time we do have these conversations, it's a discussion of racism. And to be quite honest, I want to point out something about my life that to the people that say that until we walk in somebody else's shoes, you don't understand. I have been homeless in my life. I have worked hard to get where I'm at. I have lived in other countries and been treated because I am white poorly and been had racism against me because in that other country, I was an accepted part of that country. I understand it. I have also lived in Hillsborough County and had black people close the door on me and not let me through and push against me. I have, you know, had this go out, you know, through my life. I grew up in the South. And I would say that for us to look at this as a racism issue, when we're all trying to work together and have a conversation is really, really disappointing. Because the honest answer is that I've gotten from homeless to a place where I own a company and I'm working hard <laughs> to improve not only my family's lives, but people's lives. And I care about people and I'm hiring people of all races. My wife is actually Spanish and I have mixed race children. And yet we keep coming back to this conversation of racism as being the problem. And the reality is, is yeah, economic disparity is the problem and it's a complicated issue. And you can't just throw money at all of these problems that think they solve the issue. And I really think that shame on all of you for thinking that racism is the catalyst for all of this when there are deeper issues that we need to address. And yeah, there are problems that need to be fixed. But to be honest, I have different employees of different races on my payroll now that I own a company and have worked hard to get here, again, from being homeless to this point. 
and improving my education, which I paid for, and you know, climbing the ladder, so to speak, in a very hard way, and I'm still doing that. And I will tell you, my, my employees have better health care and health insurance than I do because of owning a company, I can't have the same benefits and it's way more expensive for me. I have to pay for all of my health care. So my employees actually have better health care and than I do. Thank and so you. for us to sit here and have a conversation and make it all about racism, you know, it's really, really disappointing because yeah, there are bigger discussions and disparities that we need to have conversations. And yes, we should have a conversation about it. Thank and you, we sir. should all collectively work together for the betterment of all people. But for us to call this a race issue is, is absolutely disappointing and shame on all of you for that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. That is the last speaker. Um, I'm going to close public comment and future agenda items. We are going to be taking a break. Can we do this commenting really quickly? Because I know yes. we kind of went along without fast. a break. Yeah, Carol. I just want to clarify, we don't give free bus rides to low income people, minorities. We, we have a very low rate that we charge for transit. We did during the hurricane. And the only other places that you can get free bus passes, I think, is when you leave hospitals and maybe turning points, right? So there is a minimal fee that everybody pays. It's not, um, we don't discriminate if you have money or you don't or what race you are. Um, I ha will never support uh, defunding the sheriff and I think we've all said that at our last budget meeting in fact we gave money to the sheriff for diversity training so I just want to let everybody be assured when I've heard from public comment that we would do that the gentleman I thank you for talking I was homeless at 15 I and look where I am today I get it but I got to tell you something and I always call it the Andre story and Reggie knows about it because I told Reggie about it a while ago but um and I wish Extavia was here, but she's not. He took care of a lady at Manatee Hospital who had like some kind of neurological multiple sclerosis or something like that. And he took care of her for quite a while and she had pressure sores and he did major surgery on her. So it was time to discharge her. She was a black lady. She, it was time to discharge her and she lived over by the racetrack kind of um, just um, north of Manatee Hospital in that area. We could not get a home health company to go there because they said it was a rough part of town and they didn't feel comfortable. So my husband for maybe eight weeks, every week he went there in his white lab coat and he, I went once with him. And he went and he went and took care of that lady with her husband, changed her sheets, cleaned her up, changed her bed because she was bedridden. After about eight weeks she died and that really bothered him and he said she died because she was black. He could not get any other doctors to go over to see her to make home visits and we went to the funeral. It's the only funeral in 40 something years he ever attended. I think it's Westside, um, Reggie? Yeah. Westfield, Westside? Westside. Westside. We went to her funeral. Westside. So to hear that it is not a health crisis, I respectfully disagree. I've been seeing it for years and um, you know, this is a real life thing. This happened seven years ago before he had to retire because he has Parkinson's and can't operate anymore. But I saw it firsthand. So I had to, I, I wanted to say that, that because um, Extavia had gone through the same thing and I saw it firsthand myself. So again, gentlemen, I thank you for working your way up. Thank you, I'm proud of you for where you've been. Um, some can't do what you did or I did. And those are the ones that we got to try to help. We have to. We got to show compassion for our citizens of Manatee County. So I don't have any regrets for supporting this proclamation. And um, I appreciate everybody on both sides that spoke. Thank you. Is that the last person that we need to speak before we can take a break? Yeah. Y'all okay with taking a break? All right. Ten minute break. Take a ten minute recess. <laughs>
We're going to um, reconvene. We're now on the consent agenda, so I'm going to take citizens' comments on consent agenda items only. Is there anyone that would like to make a comment on any of the uh, items that are on the consent agenda? Anyone, any citizen that'd like to make a comment on any consent agenda items? The only one that was polled was item number 52, if I remember correctly, Carol? Yep. All right. Okay, seeing no one come forward, I'm gonna close um, I move public comment. The substance of the consent agenda <coughs> minus 52. Second. I say, okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. I'll give it to uh, Commissioner Johnson just for the heck of it because it's his last meeting. <laughs> And um, okay, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. All right. Then, so it was next up. Um, all right, next up is we have advertised public hearing items. We're going to take up our consent agenda at 1130. So the first one that we have is the uh, item number 61, adoption of resolution 20-158 regarding the infrastructure sales tax amending project scope. Is that right? Correct. Yes, That's okay. Correct. All right, do we have uh, some, there you are, Jan, <laughs> go ahead. Good morning, commissioners, Madam Administrator, Chief Assistant Attorney, um, Mr. Clegg. The item before you has to do with our infrastructure sales tax list. And as you remember, um, the resolution that establishes the priorities for the list says that any additions or removals or any changes in scope have to come back before you. So the reason this is here before you today is that there is an alignment of what is going to happen at Lincoln Park Pool with the old scope description that was there. And gentlemen, if you could put that up on the board. So this is in the resolution that's before you, but I thought you might like to see for clarity what has changed within it. The highlighted yellow is basically what has changed. So what I'm pointing out it has changed from both pools will have a pool both pools will have pool and deck lighting it's changed to the pools will have pool and deck lighting and then the rest of the yellow information is further additions include a lesson plunge pool a slide shade structure with lounge seating shade structure with spectator seating additional parking and a geothermal system the relocation of the existing basketball courts to the southwest corner of the Lincoln Park property near the tunnel and next to the pavilion is within the Lincoln Park basketball courts replacement project. The reason we have that is so that they're hooked together for clarity. So we're asking that the scope be changed for this. This lines it up with the other items that are coming before you as we ask you to pass the GMP. The only other item I wanted to bring your attention to is that in doing this, in this um, section of the IST, we found an availability of the Coquina Trail Phase Two. We dropped it by 610,000. It's out in FY23. Reevaluation of that project, is that there's some bandwidth there. So what we did is we dropped that project lower, still existing, and then we moved 232,000 and 14 dollars to the Lincoln Park Pool and I can explain further as we go through. So since this is up on the board, let me explain real quick. Remember each category only has a certain amount of bandwidth. The revenues are based on a projection of growth over time with everything that just happened this past year. The, re the overall revenues are a little bit not as, as, as happy as they were before, let's put it that way. Um, currently at the top, if you look in the very first column, the first thing you have is that over time in this one category, subcategory, you're going to receive about $16 million. The total cost allocated for this category is 15.9. So the bandwidth is getting tighter. It was down to 143, 560, 555. So what we did, we looked through any project that we felt that could be pulled back a little bit or perhaps it was not as enhanced as it should be. We just pulled down the Coquina 
phase trail. And at first, the first documents that you got out, we had 675,000 going to it. Now the bottom number, after we did all that, would only leave 78,000 in that entire category for 15 years. So we updated it. And in your budget amendment, we used the second option. We just didn't update the page. So we're updating the page. So what we've done is to make the amount of additional money we need for Lincoln Park Pool, we increased the project in IST to 232,014, and that gives you remaining of 521. That gives you a little bit of bandwidth, so over the next 13 years or so, we have some availability. We're trying to, one of the things that um, your IST committee is looking at, and we've notified them of this scope today, but one of the things they look for is, are you spending beyond that category? And so this is where we're at today. So the main thing before you is the scope change, and it goes in line with the next <coughs> two presentations as well. Okay. Questions? <laughs> There's a lot of moving I'm, parts here. I'm um, messed up. I mean, what, what does bandwidth mean? Okay. Like, so, I mean, let me start there. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me try very simply. You all thought you all were just going to act like you knew it, right? <laughs> So within each of these categories, when I mean by bandwidth, yeah. I mean that you have enough money to cover the projects within that category. And so over time, not knowing everything going on, there's not millions left in that category, but only 500,000, which easily over time can take through change orders or changes to projects which you approve. So we were trying to be um, good stewards and we decided that what well, the BA that's before you is that you're actually taking money from um, reserves in the general fund and matching it. You had bandwidth, there's the word again, you had availability in, for the Lincoln Park pool of about 1.1 million we added to get as much as we could out of it comfortably and then we added the rest which was about 400,000 from general fund for a total increase to the project of 1.8 million. But it's not general fund, it's the Coquina Beach. No, so what how we were able to increase go back to the word bandwidth in that category we lowered that project by 610 and then we increased it back up you know we used two, uh, 200 of it to go back to go to the lincoln park pool okay. the remainder of it we left for the future to follow out as we go through this ist projects so will we have enough to do the coquina yes pro okay that's all i want to know thank you Cool. So, so the Coquina project gets perhaps delayed a little bit. Is that nope, it? It's or? still on target for FY twenty three. Okay, we'll have the money by then. Okay, all right. It's out in the future. So, the main thing we were trying to do is align the revenues that we have right now, and is as we go through once you approve the scope and we go to the next part, I have another slide that will explain all the revenues that are inside the Lincoln Park pool. Okay, and including the general revenues, which yes. you have referenced right. here. Correct. So, all right, everybody clear on this at this point? Okay. Yep. All right, well, um, so this does take a um, adoption of a resolution, um, R20-158 approval changes the project in no, is that it? Am I yes. Right one? 61, yeah, okay. Yes, ma'am. Approval of changes to the project and equipment list to amend the scope of the Lincoln Park pool. I'll make Madam that Chair, motion. Oh, no, let Reggie, it's his. Yeah, I'll make a motion, but a comment first. Uh, we can have a motion, then I have a second? I'll second. Right. Second, okay, now you can comment. Yeah, I just want to, the, the highlighted portion um, are, are actually the changes. Um, it went from pool mm -hmm. to pools, mm -hmm. and then again, when we first discussed this, we talked about a master plan that brought forth amenities and, and things of that nature. So obviously we have to tell you thank you. Um, we are excited. The momentum to the groundbreaking of the pool is coming up. Um, so thanks for that, all the work that you do and for everybody, everything that everybody else is doing. Thanks. Yep, exciting project. I'm going to open this up for public comment. Um, see, we have our partners from the city of Palmetto here, uh, Mayor Shirley Bryant and um, attorney Mark Barnaby, so thank you for being here and for being great partners on this project. Um, 
Okay. Well, we may want to on the next two items. Okay. Well, let's just speak on the next one. So, anyone else who want to address the board on the motion on the floor? All right. Seeing no one come forward, I'll close public comment. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, okay. We're going to move then to item number 66 which is execution of guaranteed maximum price addendum to agreement number 19 TA 003144CD for construction management at risk services for Manatee County Lincoln Park Pool and adoption of budget resolution B21-029. Yes, okay, Chan. Hi. Good morning again, commissioners. What the item before you is approving a guaranteed maximum price addendum. And the maximum price construction is $7.3 million for the Lincoln Park pool. Tom is here um, with me, and we thought you'd like him to explain the highlights of what's going on. Tom? Thank you. Okay, Tom. Thank you, commissioners, Madam Chairman. Um, we're finally here. Uh, so we started out with, as Jane explained, we started out with two pools, um, some pool deck, um, some parking, uh, you know, a, a really nice complex. But as we went through, we recognized that there were some other things that uh, both the city and the county would like to see. So what I have on the screen now is a, a, a rendering of what it will look like, uh, and it shows the basketball courts, and you can see that there, uh, which would be at the northern, excuse me, yes the southernmost side of the um, property. I need to switch it. Is it backwards? Oh, okay, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. North up. See it. No. No, we need to see. Okay. Where's the pool? Okay. The pool's right there. There you go. There we go. So um, the amenities that are there now, we are to the amenities that we had originally proposed, we're adding a, uh, a plunge pool and a slide. We're adding some deck chairs and some uh, shade coverings. Um, we added a geothermal um, heating and cooling system, which uh, is a little more expensive, but will save money, operational money in the long run for years and years to come. Uh, so you, that's money well spent. Um, and, and we are shifting the location of the existing basketball courts, which are, will currently uh, are, reside where we're going to put the parking lot, and we have shifted them to the north, the south, to the um, just adjacent to the soccer fields. Can somebody point at it? He did. Where? <laughs> oh, I'm looking over there. Got it. So that's that's what we're doing. Um, we have the general uh, guaranteed maximum price. We have A squared is our construction manager at risk. Um, We've had a lot of cooperation with the city and we've met with the city. They're all on board, I believe, uh, with what we want to do. Maybe the mayor wants to come up and talk, um, but we're, uh, um, we're happy to move forward. I'm just, you know, if there are any questions about what we're doing or the costs or anything, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, questions for staff? Anything, Reggie? Yeah, I was very, very curious on the relocation of those basketball courts. And I was wondering, um, how it would impact um, some of the other um, things that take place out there at Lincoln, at Lincoln Park. And I, I do know that we're probably running out of real estate, to be honest, to be honest with you. My concern um, with the closeness, if we can put the rendering back up, um, and, and I'm sure we're going to move forward, but I want to ask this question because the future intention is to um, have a scoreboard um, at, um, on both ends of the um, of the football field, and I want to know um, how will the, those basketball courts being relocated there impact that? Uh, we should have plenty of room. It's a very large scale, and knowing that, we'll shift them as close to the trail as we can get them, and uh, and make sure that we have the room to to make that happen. Okay, and and that's what my that's what my concern was because as we continue, and, and again. What we have is a master plan coming, coming, coming together here a little bit. I'm not necessarily sure if we all sat down and say we want this, this, and this, but now we have that master plan on coming forth. And from what I'm looking at, the relocation of those basketball courts, they'll have some um, connectivity through the tunnel, uh, which is which is appreciative if you can come and uh, once we revive the tunnel, and then they can come out to the basketball courts. It is a long walk. Um, from the basketball for the basketball players who've taken you know 
play all night and then have to take that route. But I have a question about lighting on the basketball course. Currently, there's lighting on the basketball course. With the relocation, will we still have lighting on the basketball court? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for staff at this time? Okay. So item number 66 requires a um, motion as well. Which is Madam Chairman. Yes. It's Jan, if I may. All right, Jan. Um, I just want to, if they, can you pull up the PowerPoint? Is that possible? I just wanted to explain the funding okay. in That'd this be matter because that's part of the BA that, that, is this, that you're going to be voting on. Um, give them just a second. So as they're getting it ready, what we're going to go through, what you see on the screen, the very first column is what is actually in the um, appropriations today, and it's at 6.6 .6 million. We're adding 1.8 million to get this contract and award. Um, and as you see, the general fund is is don't, is placing 442,986 into the project, <coughs> and the infrastructure sales tax is placing 1.3 million, roughly into the project as well. And then that gives you your proposed budget of 8.4 million. The part, these, this next item that's coming before you, there's also an interlocal agreement that's gonna happen with, the, with Palmetto. So once you approve it in December, we will come back and we will add that gray section up there. And what that does is you, the city of Palmetto has requested that they do a contribution of $2,001,360. In that, they'll repay it over a period of time. So it's really the general fund that's fronting that money and it will be paid back over time. That will happen. Now, what I thought you would like to see is the very far right column, and that tells you who is investing in the project. So 21% of the project is being paid for by parks, general revenues coming out of parks. You'll then have 30% of this project will be paid for by countywide park impact fees, 25% by IST fees, and 24% by the city of Palmetto at the end of the day. So the item before you today is just the November 10th um, budget amendment. Okay. Um, Questions? For staff, I have one. Go ahead, um, Commissioner Johnson. Again, um, I don't know if it'll come up to the uh, maybe in the next item, but the contribution from the city of Palmetto. You'll vote on it in the next one. Okay, I'll ask my question then. So the item before you in this agenda item is only for the budget amendment today, and it's for that column that says November 10th. It's just adding money from the IST and adding the 400,000 from the general fund. Okay, we actually have um, two actions requested from what I can see. This is also, the first one would be to authorize the procurement official or designee to execute the guaranteed maximum price addendum to agreement number 19-TA-003144 CD, construction management at risk services for the Manatee County Lincoln Pool with A2 group and the not to exceed amount of $7,382,610.03 with a construction schedule of 450 calendar days and authorization to date the public construction bond. That is the first action. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. I will take public comment on this first action. Is there anyone who'd like to address the board on this uh, motion? All right, seeing no one come forward, I'm gonna close public comment. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. The second is adoption of budget resolution B21029, amending the annual budget for Manatee County, Florida for fiscal year 2021. This budget amendment adjusts the fiscal year 20 to 25 CIP. Can I have a motion? So moved. All right. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Bellamy, seconded by Commissioner Trace. Are there any questions, comments? On this okay any public comment on the budget amendment all right all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye aye all those opposed nay 
chair votes aye, motion passes. Okay, and our third uh, item on this request is item number 67, execution of contract for sale and purchase between Manatee County and the City of Palmetto for the Lincoln Park Pool, recording of deed between Manatee County and the City of Palmetto for the property located at 501 17th Street East in Palmetto. Good morning, oh, good Commissioners, morning. Uh, County Administrator, Deputy County Attorney. Um, this item before you is to execute the contract for the purchase and sale of the property that will actually be the parcel of land directly under the pool and the associated um, accessory uses. Uh, in, that, uh, in that contract, there is also an interlocal agreement. That is the interlocal agreement that spells out the relationship with Manatee County and the City of Palmetto as far as the financial contribution. So in that local agreement um, on page three, 3.1B, it talks about the amount of reimbursement by the CRA, which is 20 million, I mean 2 million, not 20 million, I'm sorry. <laughs> the price has been going up, but please don't say that. We don't want to Mark Barnaby's again. having a heart attack right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's yeah. Two million one hundred thousand three hundred and sixty dollars, um, and then again this interlocal agreement, which is part of the, the contract for purchase and sale, also indicates that uh, the city of Palmetto would transfer the land. And if you don't mind, I do have a question for Bill Clegg right now. As I was coming to this to the podium, I noticed that our um, requested action was just executing the contract and did not say execute the interlocal agreement as well. So do I need to make an oral request right now? Yeah, I, I was wondering the same thing yes. when I was looking at the agenda item. If you're looking for the board to have authority to execute the interlocal agreement today, then that needs to be clarified as okay. part of the motion. Okay. So we can deal with that when the I appreciate that. I'm sorry. Well, it, 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 it does say okay. on the action requested execution of contract for sale and purchase containing the interlocal agreement from the city of Palmetto. That doesn't work from <laughs> that a legal doesn't standpoint. Work. Okay. No, 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 that, yeah, no. Well, we no. just want to make sure we're dotting those I's, crossing okay. those T's, yeah. and that's why I asked yeah. the question. So I would ask that when you do make the motion, it does include the um, approval and execution of the interlocal agreement, which is attached as Exhibit yeah. Z to the contract. I'll be prepared to you know, recite a recommended motion whenever the board is ready. Well, we're getting ready. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, are there questions for um, staff regarding, uh, questions for Joy? Go ahead, yeah. Mr. Johnson. Um, the contribution from City of Palmetto, is that going to be paid all up front or is that going to be paid over uh, a number of years? So the way that the contract reads is that it will be reimbursed by the CRA um, I believe it is over a number of years. I'm looking at this really quickly. I think Jan can, can answer that yeah. probably. Right. It's, um, I believe the interlocal we received, it's over 10 years and without interest. Okay. Crummy deal. <laughs> it's a good what deal. If we're all working together. End of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions or comments for... Uh, staff on this deal I have a, a comment I Carol? have been I was a city commissioner or maybe the mayor then but, but when we were in that room over there with Larry Bustle and everybody working out this deal I was here when Joe McClosh decided we needed an Olympic sized pool or a competitive pool when it was in Palmetto and the whole deal stopped and then we um, and then this it's taken many many years and you know, I thank the town of Palmetto uh, for doing this. That's still a lot of money, you know, from, um, fr from them contributing it. I remember this started out at $2 million, $3 million, and now we're up to nine. I, I would also like to point out that Palmetto is also donating a parcel of land. Right, we get that property million. now because we're building the pool right. there. So, yeah, it's taken many years. So um, I think we're all going to be good partners in this. Okay, well, yeah, the, um, yes, please uh, come forward if anyone would like to. Do we have a motion? Do we get, no. Uh, Reggie. We don't have one yet. No, okay, we'll go ahead and take public comment, and we're going to have a motion, but go ahead. 
State your name for the record. And, oh, we're going to have Charlie clean the mic. Good job, Charlie. Don't drop the mic. Clean the mic. <laughs> no, I get to drop the mic. <laughs> Very good. Well, maybe. <laughs> Um, I, in reference to the, the recent question, I would like to comment. Um, I think we started out with a plan a long time ago. And over the course of time, the, the whole project, we, I think it was looked at more holistically, and we've come to a better place today. Uh, the city of Palmetto also did put in four and a half acres of land as well. So th that was um, in addition to what's you know, really being recognized. I think uh, Commissioner Whitmore referenced that. But it's taken us a long time getting here. And in actuality, even though it's taken a long time, I think we're going to have the best end product and the best pool that we could possibly have. And that was the end goal, to do the best thing and have the best pool that that could for, be forthcoming for the residents of Palmetto. It's long overdue. I know pools have been talked about most of my adult life in, in Manatee County for north of the river, so it's a really long time coming. So I, I applaud everybody that's worked on this. It's, it's, it's been a lot of work and uh, a lot of gyrations that have, have brought us to today. So I really do appreciate the county and all the staff that has helped work with us. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to make a comment um, regarding today's action? Um, I'll just say, yeah, it's, it's been a long, long time ever since I've been on this board and before that. We've talked about a pool north of the river for as long as I can remember. You know, and it's not just a pool north of the river. The reality, we all know it because we see the emails, right? We need more pools. <laughs> we got lots of kids that want to participate in competitive swimming. It's crazy, you know, trying to juggle space. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good problem to have, growth. I always still say it, it's a good problem to have, much better than the alternative. But the fact that we're able to put together something so nice, you know, nobody's here yelling at us. We've, we've been yelled at a lot about this pool, but right now everybody looks like they're looking forward to the groundbreaking. I know I am. And I know it has taken a lot of folks to get to this point. So I hope they all will show up at the groundbreaking and feel you know, that they had a little part in it, making it happen, so. All right, what is the motion that the board would That's make? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted to make the motion. Go ahead, no, Priscilla. Uh, no, I just wanted to say this is a very long time. We've been talking about this, uh, like all, most of my adult life also, which kind of for future commissioners, if we'd have bought this thing back in 2005, we'd have probably only spent $2 million, mm -hmm. maybe $3 million. Right. So sometimes, every time we talk, we it's costing us money. Yeah, just saying. That did. Now you know. So, um, more money. so I'm glad to see it's going through. I'm more than happy with the participation of Palmetto. Uh, you know, this is not. A, you know, everybody says they want us to run things like a business. This is not a business. It's a pool. <laughs> no, I, no, I just meant the yeah. whole county is not a business. They want us to run it like one, and we need to be conservative. We need to be. But there's really, if we ran this thing like a business. We get rid of almost everybody because nobody's making money. Just saying, <laughs> just saying, you know. And in business, you're supposed to be making money. So I'm more than happy with what Palmetto put in. And I would just say, for future reference, every time you talk, it's costing more money. Okay. Well, then I'll ready? try to limit my talk. Go ahead. Bill. All right. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> Madam Chair, the recommended motion would be: I move to approve and authorize execution of the contract for sale and purchase and the interlocal agreement with the city of Palmetto and to accept and record the deed from the city of Palmetto and to accept and record the affidavit of ownership and encumbrances from the city of Palmetto, all as substantially set forth in the forms presented in the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Chair votes high motion passes. Let's go forward to the groundbreaking, which is the twelfth or something? Thursday. Tomorrow. Thursday, the Thursday. Thursday tomorrow. November twelfth at four PM. Four PM. So we will see you all at the groundbreaking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everybody for their very tough work on this. 
years now, um, and years of work. Do we have an estimate how long that they think that it's going to take for the construction? 323 days. A year. It says four, we have a 450-day clause in the contract, but that's, uh, you know, obviously we're ready to go. Depending whether. All right, we've had two answers, Tom. Did you want to oh, give a different one? Tom, right, aren't I? You are correct. I so. <laughs> Which one? Both. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's December of 2021. Okay. Cool. Okay. Just time for winter. Thank you. All righty. Yeah, well, winter is now 80 degrees, so. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to go back to item number 52, which was on the consent agenda. And, yes. Uh, um, item number 52 was authorization to classify vehicles as surplus. Mr. Uh, Whitmore. Yeah, we used to talk about this at length. Mr. Case is here. Um, we used to talk about this almost at every meeting, and then we kind of got off the track because we had people like Glenn that would come up you know and talk about why are we getting rid of these vehicles you know i've drive mine forever and why are we doing this is a waste of taxpayers money and literally we used to do this um a few years ago because we did have citizens that were concerned and then i just happened to be looking over this weekend and i saw how many miles are and as uh we are we are familiar those miles mean nothing when you're a, a, a public uh, vehicle so i i had wanted our staff to explain these vehicles and why it's just not a regular one I own at home sure. pickup truck. Sure. Uh, good morning. I'm Matthew Case, Fleet Division Manager, and your Fleet Manager. Um, the vehicles that are on here are uh, have exceeded their economic life cycle. They require substantial repairs to remain in service. Uh, how do we calculate a life cycle? We have historical data via age, maintenance, dollars spent to life to date and also meter, which is your hours or miles. So time, sometimes you might see a vehicle with lower hours, but has higher miles. Sometimes you might see higher miles, lower hours. There's different variables to that. But we have set life cycles for all this equipment. And we find when you run these assets past those life cycles, you have increased downtime, you have increased maintenance costs, reduced fleet availability, and reduced time where these assets are out taking care of our work groups. So we, we have developed a program uh, internally, a uh, fleet replacement program. Uh, we've actually been honored with national awards, and we will be coming back to you next month with uh, a handful of national awards and one global award uh, that I am very honored that we won this year. Uh, but back to the life cycles, when we find that you run these assets past those life cycles, you spend lots of money. So then you have to look at it another way. Do we have old vehicles and spend tons of money on them to keep them going? Then you have low fleet availability. Or do we spend money, buy new vehicles, run them in that life cycle? We just have the PM maintenance that we need to do, cycle them out before they fail at the end of that life cycle. So that's what we're doing. Um, we also developed an internal grading. So we grade an asset A, B, or C. A means that asset can remain in service. B means that asset could need work within one year. C means that asset is failing and it needs to go. We developed that based off the Used Car Retailers Association and developed an internal grading scale. We also appraise the asset and will compare it to what a new one costs. So a lot of science into it, a um, lot of data, a lot of industry standard experts. I have myself, Norman Hagel, and Tracy Brooks also with me. They're our fleet operations chiefs. Uh, they are in charge of maintenance and the replacement program. So, and then it, oops, sorry. And then at the end, then I review it, and every asset that get re, gets replaced, I write yes, no. We keep it in service. We pull it out of service. So. Okay. Thank you. And I remember. Uh, I mean, when I ran my police department, uh, the the police vehicles. And I know you don't do those. The others do. The sheriff does. Correct. But just because you're stopped somewhere, you leave the vehicle running continuously, just like the, the buses, mm -hmm. you, re, you leave them running continually. They don't turn, we don't turn them off at each stop. And can you, uh, and I think that's, you know, the wear and tear on our vehicles, and that's probably why we've been recognized nationally, mm -hmm. because we are more efficient. Is this saving, had anybody run the numbers of what it used to cost us versus what it does now that we have this program? So I can tell you this last year, implementing our results first, we actually updated our replacement program. We saved $200,000 of maintenance costs by replacing those vehicles that we, that we would have spent 
bleeding money into fixing old vehicles with low fleet availability. The other key thing you hit on is the hours. You can calculate for every hour of idle time, that is 30 miles of odometer time. So one hour is 30 miles. 100 hours, <coughs> do the math, 3,000. That's a lot. So hours are big. And you know we do have PPV, high idle, in our EMS program with public safety. So we track those vehicles. They, they run a lot of hours and a lot of miles. So we have to maintain that replacement program and the maintenance program and cycle them out because we can't have them failing when these guys are trying to run them. Same with utilities, same with public works, same with BADS. We have to inspect homes, we have to fix broken pipes, we have to fix ditches. If we run assets till fail, the fleet fails. So that's why we have this replacement program. Thank you. With that, I'm prepared to make a motion to approve that item. Thank you. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there anyone who'd like to address the board on this item, number 52? All right. Seeing no, no one come forward and we'll close public comment. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, guys. Okay. Okay. I think we're going to go to um, item number 62 which is uh, first public hearing on a brownfield area designation for Jackson Crossings Phase 2 Green Reuse Area Authorization to hold the second public hearing on December 15th, 2020 at 9 o'clock a.m. in lieu of 5 o'clock p.m. Do we have any uh, I'll need for a presentation? No, I'll make no. a motion to approve the item. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there anyone who would like to address the board on this item? All right, seeing no one coming forward, I'm going to close public comment. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Well, I'm kind of inclined to go to lunch. Are we ready yeah. for lunch? That or get 65. Sure. 65 is That'll be a while. Uh, going Care's to be act. a bit longer, so I was hoping <coughs> not to. Okay. Oh, what about 68? Report on, oh no, that'll take a while. No. Okay. So I mean, we, they're, well, ready, they're ready for lunch. They're ready for lunch? Okay, Doki, let's, let's break for lunch and come back at 1. And then we can, it, will that work for everybody? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll break for lunch, uh, be recessed until 1 o'clock.
decisions on countless projects affecting the entire county. Commissioner Benack, you served as chairman of the board three times during your tenure in office. You were part of the board that broke ground for the Fort Hammer Bridge in
All right, welcome back to the Board of County Commissioners regular meeting of November 10th. I think we are now ready to move to item number 65, which is a status update of the Manatee Cares Act. Karen, I guess you're gonna present. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Administrator, Karen Stewart for staff, here with a CARES update. Um, I was planning to uh, review the dashboard on our website today during the meeting, but um, we're having a Power BI down in the county. So fortunately, I wrote down the info yesterday, okay. and um, I'm ready to um, give you a, a brief review. So in our community health and well-being category for this round that's currently open, uh, 245 applications have been approved and $6.3 million in assistance has been approved. And of that, 559,000 is dispersed. And this is um, for all the rounds that have been open to date. And you might notice the difference between the approved amount and the dispersed amount, and that is due to the invoicing that nonprofits uh, do for the county to get uh, their reimbursement. So we expect that number to grow as our nonprofit agencies begin the invoicing process. For economic recovery for businesses and individuals, 631 applications have been approved, and that equates to $13.8 million in assistance approved. Of that, $5.5 million has been dispersed to the business community and to individuals for housing assistance. Under government and community facilities, we have $2 million in reimbursement approved. And for public health and safety, we have $6.8 million reimbursement approved. Now I'm gonna talk just a little bit um, more um, in depth about the business side, the economic recovery. Um, for the business recovery grants, um, 296 applications have been approved, totaling 6.4 million. Um, we're getting those checks out within five days. The clerk's office is doing a great job from the time we send the uh, application and the agreement to the clerk. They're able to get the money out. And $4.8 million has been dispersed for business recovery grants. For the housing assistance program, which can provide up to $10,000 for um, delinquent rent or mortgages, and people can recertify for the months through December with proof of income loss, 260 applications have been approved, totaling $1.6 million. Um, we're able to disperse this money um, from the clerk's office to individuals when, within about four days and um, $567,000 has been dispersed. For economic recovery for individuals, this again is the nonprofit agencies who are providing um, resources to families in the community. We've had seven, 75 applications approved and $5.8 million in assistance. Um, and to date, $240,000 has been dispersed. So I wanna draw your attention to the screen. This is on our website. You can see the types of programs that have been funded through the CARES Act for nonprofits. We don't see anything. Oh, you don't? Yeah. Oh, okay, now we do. Okay. okay. Can't see it really well, but um, I'll okay. go through it. It's um, child care, digital, digital learning, tutoring, counseling, um, COVID testing and information, um, English as a second language COVID information, uh, PPE, clothing, personal hygiene products, um, food distribution, including the mega pantry at State College of Florida. And all these food pantries and churches throughout our community have received funding through CARES. In addition, here's the list of nonprofits that are distributing funding for rent, mortgage payments and utility payments and other financial assistance. So these, um, this, these funds here are distributed through nonprofits and are separate from the housing assistance program that we are um, taking applications for through Manatee Cares. Um, in addition, uh, legal services have been um, funded and also um, training programs through Career Source Suncoast. This week, we've spent a lot of time reviewing our processes. We're getting down to the wire on the review time. We have about five weeks left 
to review the applications that are pending and get them over to the clerk's office for payment during the middle to the end of December. We've um, streamlined our processes to double the output of the reviewed applications to be sent to the clerk for payment. And we've done this by hiring additional specialized temps um, using uh, the resources provided by our HR department and Rachel Quinn, our talent acquisition manager. She's been able to find us some people who really have the skills to review these applications and the financial information that are included in the business applications. We also um, have our temp core and we're offering overtime for those temps. And then uh, we're in the process now of utilizing county staff who might work overtime. Uh, they have the skills to review financial information as well. Um, our fiscal tax and some of our administrative assistance. We have a lot of interest in working overtime and we are working through um, getting the payment set up for that. So we hope to be able to get um, these applications out um, in the time frame required. And for just the business applications alone, it would require us to approve 165 applications every week. So we will be working hard to get that done and we'll be pulling out all the stops and it'll be all hands on deck um, working to get this done. Are there any questions about what I've said so far? Yeah, questions, Carol. You know, I have a bet with you one-on-one. -on -one. It is so hard to keep track of this. You guys are working very, very hard, and millions, millions are um, approved. Um, but again, because the clerk requires all this stuff, you know, in some points, like we're getting like $500,000 out for the rental assistance or something. Um, Glenn Jimbalina sent us all an email. We need to do like Sarasota and um, offer 10000 and I said, uh, we've been doing it a long time now. So, um, but my point is, is again, me as a commissioner that um, there, I don't know how much, how much better we can do. The only thing that I ever, that I really see are the food banks and I see the mega drive. I see the thousands that are showing up in parish and at the one at State College of Florida. The other stuff, it's so hard for me to tell somebody where to go. And then when they do, as you know, I sent you um, a physician group and uh, they didn't get it right. And I finally said, why don't you have your CPA work on it? Um, and that's because the clerk is requiring all this. Is Are we requiring anything different than the other counties are? We are not. This is a federal grant right. program and it has um, all the requirements that any federal grant would have. And uh, we worked very closely um, with financial management, with Director Brewer, and with the clerk's office um, in the beginning to make sure that the documents that we require are um, the only ones that are really needed to prove the loss um, for a business to receive um, their business interruption grant of up to $45,000. We also have to have on the housing assistance side proof of, of loss of family income. And these are documents that we have to look at and review and compare to the applications. So um, while it is um, labor intensive, it is a requirement of federal grants often. And um, you know we are going to be audited. In fact, um, we have, that has been started already through internal audit here. So we we just have to be very careful that we get the information that's required, that all the information that's provided to us by an individual, a nonprofit, or a business is correct, and it does take time, and it is frustrating for us too. Yeah, I know it is. And he, I met a man in the elevator, um, and he was going up to one of your floors to bring in the affidavit. He was a landlord um, that he would accept these monies. Now, again, we talked about this last time. Uh, there was one pot of money and it went to a certain date. Well, now there's still a percent of our population that can't, does not have a job due to COVID and may be more behind in rent. What about that? Is it a max up to 10,000? So uh, Director Lopez is coming to the microphone to um, address your questions. We do have other funding besides CARES for housing assistance. Jerry can talk about that as well. Yes, yeah, so for our housing assistance program, we're now in our round four. So our round one and our round three, um, we were, we're using Florida Housing Finance um, 
uh, corporation funding. So it's more than the dollars and the applications that Karen has mentioned, because the one that she did was just for our Manatee Cares. But with all of the programs, we were trying to have them be as consistent as possible, but they all do go up to $10,000. And we're now doing a lot of recertifications, meaning that those that um, have received um, assistance with rent back in July, if they haven't uh, been able to get a job and they still are showing that loss of income, they can come in, provide the paperwork work again and then we reach out to the landlord we get what they're delinquent in and then we're paying through that so we're doing all those recertifications now so they still go through us as like one funnel and no matter where the pots of money coming from you guys are building it out wherever it needs to go yes okay I don't know how to get it out any better but it's so complicated every time you come up here I just I don't know how to tell somebody to do it except go on our website hit the COVID and look that's what I'm telling them. Well, that, that is a good option, but we are also working with our chambers, and let's not forget that um, the Manatee Chamber is answering our um, CARES phone line. They, are, um, they have somebody dedicated 40 hours a week to answering the phone, and they are busy all week. So anyone who needs assistance can call the Manatee Chamber or the Lakewood Ranch Business Alliance. We are also working with the Island Chamber and the Minnesota Black Chamber. In addition to just answering the phone, these chambers are putting information on their website. They're doing business walks. The Manatee Chamber has visited uh, more than 500 businesses to let them know about CARES. And they provide the information about businesses, but for businesses, but also for nonprofits and residents as well. So, um, Can you state that number? I know there's a special number for the chamber, if anybody knows it. We'll get it before. Yeah, I'll we're get done. it for you. Okay, just so the public knows and call. There's a right, special yes. number. Okay, thank you, uh, Karen. The, the timing. Um, we know that this is coming to an end. Um, I saw something about this being the last day to apply. What was that specifically to apply for? What? So we've had the. Um, each of the funding categories open. We've had the business small business grant open. We've had the nonprofit grants open and we've had the housing assistance open all three of those applications will close at 5 p.m. today and uh, this is largely because um, the applications now are way ahead of us I do have some information about um, what has been applied for in those rounds and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute but we need time to be able to review those by the deadline um, in December. We are hoping for an extension. We have requested that and Sherry's been working uh, closely with our, our legislative delegation on the state and federal level advocating for that extension. Um, but at this moment, what we know now is this will end on December 30th and we need to get payments over to the clerk's office by December 18th in order to get payments made in time. So really time is of the essence okay and that's kind of where we stand until we hear whether or not the bill that's pending is in fact approved to extend or perhaps even um, provide a new relief package right that's correct okay all right uh, did we interrupt you or were you in the middle of your I do have I stopped and asked if you had any questions okay. I do have a few more things to say but misty I just want to give a quick shout out to Karen because I, I don't know if it was 10 or 11 o'clock last night when I sent her an email about three businessmen who had some questions about applying and she got right on it, <laughs> sent each of them emails and said, oh my goodness, the deadline is tomorrow, this is what you have to do. So, I mean, literally 24-7, these Thank people you. are on call. Thank you. All, All right. Well, with that great intro, keep going. Thank you. So I'll tell you a little bit about the applications that are pending now, that are closing today. And I just updated this right before I walked up here. So in community health and well-being, 58 applications are preliminarily approved for $560,000. And you might remember that the thing that you could apply for this time was the $5,000 in PPE or food. Uh, distributed to Manatee County residents, including special holiday food. In the economic recovery small business category, there are 798 applications to be reviewed, which could total more than $15.9 million if they were all approved. In the economic recovery for individuals, this is the housing assistance program, 358 applications are, to, are ready to be reviewed, totaling approximately $2.1 million. 
So we need to use our streamlined process, use our temps, use our county staff, and everyone who is available to um, you know, work on Saturdays. We have a, a group working tomorrow. Um, we have our, all, all of our temp core working overtime tomorrow um, to work through this, this process. So we are we're dedicated to it, we're committed to it, and we plan to get it done. Now, the last thing is, cue the document. I passed out a chart to all of you during lunch, and this is our phase three spending plan. This is for the remainder of the money, which is 38.5 million. Uh, this money is um, provided to the county through reimbursement. So we submit requests to the state, they reimburse us. We did receive in-house the phase two money of just over $14 million uh, last week. So in this phase three plan, um, we're looking at um, economic recovery for small business. The applications for this part have already been received. I just mentioned those to you. The application, the economic recovery for individuals, the housing assistance program, those applications have already been received as well. We're looking at food distribution, including holiday food. We're going to open round four applications for that, and we'll have up to a million dollars for additional holiday food. We know how important food is, and everyone's talking about food all the time. You heard uh, Mayors Feed the Hungry this morning, and we want to make sure that we can help those food banks um, with, with food during the holiday season. Um, also, in, in this next round, there will be support for Manatee Memorial Hospital and Lakewood Ranch, Business, uh, Lakewood Ranch Hospital in the amount of $6 million for business loss reimbursement and for PPE. We will also be um, reopening the nonprofit <coughs> category and under community health and well-being for another round of PPE kits at, at $500,000. We, under government and community facilities, we would like to work with the school district to help them with their safe opening for disinfecting, sanitizing, and PPE reimbursement up to $3 million. And you all approve the interlocal agreement with the school district today. The school board will hopefully approve that tonight. We'll get it executed tomorrow and we can move forward with that. Also under government and community facilities, we have um, the government and public venue bathroom retrofit, which includes the installation of touchless faucets and touchless um, soap and towels where needed up to an additional million dollars. Charlie, you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed our bathroom. Yeah. Also, um, in this um, plan, we have $5 million set aside for uh, contingency in case we are able to get that extension. If we do receive an extension, then we would open up the economic recovery for small business grants another time uh, to provide um, 250 businesses with the opportunity to recover their um, loss and to get PPE. Also, under that same contingency, um, if there's an extension, we would reopen the housing assistance program for 200 uh, households, up to $1.2 million. And we would fund programs to retool and retrain workers dislocated in the hardest hit industries. And then finally, we have $7.3 million set aside in this um, phase three for contingencies, um, because we just never know what's gonna happen these days. And so the total um, spending plan here is $38.5 million, and the re reimbursement total will be $38.7 million. And so we will need a motion on this after questions. All right, questions. Carol? Um, I know I, I had originally uh, called all three hospital administrators. Um, HCA didn't take any monies, and so Randy was going to try to see if they would let him take it, and I guess so far they haven't. Um, Yes, we offer, we, we send out the information, sorry, Madam Chairman, would you like me to respond? Please. <laughs> we send out the information to all three of the hospitals. I did hear back from Randy Curran um, about a week or so ago where um, they felt like um, they would not take um, and access any of it. Um, they felt it was, you know, would be best to have other people that they felt might need it. So they responded. Um, I've heard from Manatee Memorial who, you know, I have not seen their information, but they're working on a response and um, Lakewood Ranch is still pending. And Randy told me corporate had 
the corporate organization isn't taking any nationwide. So. We'll be offering it again. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Safe. I don't think. I don't know that 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 would make any differences. But um, we're, um, we're we're just offering it to all three of the hospitals again if the if the other round opens up. Okay. All right, Vanessa. Never mind. Okay. Other questions for staff. I have a question. What about behavior? Like uh, we did something for Centerstone during all this. Um, were were they reimbursed for anything for their PPE? Because you know, Center site Stone, patients. Centerstone was eligible under the nonprofit uh, oh, oh, okay. applications in round one and round two. They did apply for some programming in one, and I think the additional PPE in round two. Yes. Got it. Thank you. <coughs> okay, Steve. Um, yeah, just you know, you know, my pet peeve is reserves. So uh, you know, we're, we're sitting in there again with. 19% out of this thing for contingencies. And I'm just curious, you know, as to, you know, we heard this morning at great length, you know, the problem with food, you know, mm -hmm. for the people. You know, I would think we would want to sit there and take that basically 19% reserve and move some of that up if possible into that food category because a million dollars isn't going to go very far, I don't think, when you start you know, having to buy yeah. food and put it out there, especially during this time of the year. So that's just a thought I had is, you know, do we really need that much reserves? And, and like we say, we know there's a big need for food. Um, maybe that's something we could look at is moving some of that contingency up into that. We created, we, uh, we created the reserve on our own because we, that money will all go back. We put it there because we won't be able to spend it by December. If, if more food could be purchased, that'd be great. That's where it could go. But we're not approved for round three yet. So we just didn't want to not have an identification of the money so that if, in fact, there was an extension, there would be the ability to use it, which, of course, then it would be moved around to any of those categories. So we created that uh, reserve just on our own just yesterday to say we want to keep the money. We don't want to not have a purpose for it. But um, we're not able to get um, that much that much money out um, for even the food between now and the deadline. Well, we can use it for that. In the you know, the agencies aren't able to to purchase it all and to store it all and oh. to get it all out. So it's a it's a really difficult process. Yeah. It's kind of sad. It Text is. Twenty two. <laughs> Quite it is. But they'll probably end up using most of it because. We're using a million last time. Well, we, gave, we, right? we would love to. I mean, yeah. if, the, if the deadline is extended for a year, yes, it will. <laughs> food would be awesome to use it all in. We just didn't want to not have anything identified for the remainder, so that you have you have to have it. You have to have it in a line item, right? Want, I mean, that's right. it. You got to put it in a line item so that you can spend it. Yeah. But um, and and it, it just makes sense that it's going to be extended. I mean, there's nothing magical about December. I wish there was. I wish there was a magic deadline for all this stuff and it just poofs go away, but from what I've seen, that's not exactly happening. Vanessa. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, a big shout out to Blake that, uh, you know, here's a for-profit hospital who's not asking to take any money for any loss of business or PPEs, anything that they've had to purchase. Uh, you know, it just says a lot, I think, about their place in our community and how much they care. And I don't think they get enough uh, kudos from this board for what they do. And, and I just think that says a lot. And I'm very proud of them for that. Yep. Thank been, you. They've been great. Madam Chair, on that. Uh, Carol? Randy said he would like to have taken it, but it's a corporate, war, a corporate policy because this is lot, the money we're giving is loss of outpatient surgeries. All hospitals had to stop outpatient surgeries, and that is why he didn't take it. But he did tell me, I would love to take it, but I got to check with corporate. And then he, and I guess he said he couldn't because it's a corporate wide policy, so he can't go above that. But yeah, HCA is healthy, and they're able to do that, and God bless them. I, so I imagine Doctors Hospital and didn't take any either. I don't it goes know. to show you that uh, it's a well run facility. Their oh, company just, does a great job. We have great hospitals in this community. Yeah. It's you know there there's a world there's a world of differences yeah. between our hospitals that's for sure. Yeah. When one's a safety net hospital, you know I I we all know people that have been in the hospital for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. You go into the hospital and um, you know you, you, people are on ventilators for a long time. I mean I don't know how it gets paid for quite frankly, 
I really don't know how, and there's a lot of people. Right it, it is a deathly situation, so they're going there and they don't have insurance. I mean, Manatee Memorial has to take them. They have no choice as a, right? Safety. Help me out here if I'm, net, if yes. I'm wrong, but they have to take them as mm -hmm. a safety net hospital. Right. They all and, do to a certain degree, don't they? Uh, a certain it's degree. a little bit different, I think, because of the safety net designation, right. well, but you know, I'm not an expert in it. But um, yeah, Mike I has just to take them because they're a trauma center for traumas. Okay. That's for okay. sure. Okay, then yeah. for traumas, it's just um, you know, it's going to be very interesting. Hopefully, these new drugs that are coming online. I, I heard an interesting story this morning about the new um, Pfizer. No, vaccine. it's not the Pfizer. I, it, speaking of people that didn't take any government money and are going to come out with the vaccine, which is pretty amazing. If you ask me, Pfizer. You are um, some good guys in the world. That, uh, yeah. but the um, situation with the drugs that they're doing that uh, help people to not have to go in the hospital, but you have to take them intravenously, but the, so they're not, don't have anyone set up to give them. So it was a very interesting story this morning where this drug is very, very promising, but they can't figure out how to get it to people. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, there's always some little quirk. <laughs> yeah, they talked about having tents outside. I heard the same story. Story, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, I think we're digressing. Did you have anything else more that you wanted uh, to add? Yes, uh, I just need a motion to approve the phase three spending plan and the amount of $38,500,000. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Servia, I think I heard, seconded by Commissioner uh, Trace. Any public comment on the CARES Act funding? Anyone who'd like to make a comment on this motion? All right, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. All right, thank you, and um, good to know that you've got a lot of people that are temporarily working. Hi, hi, Karen and I probably should ask this, we were discussing it. So how long does a temp work? I mean, what kind of a contract do these folks get to do this? They're, them. Th th yeah, they're not under contract. Okay. It's as long as we need them, which in this, you know, could be through December 30th or a little bit past that, depending on whatever kind of billing or, or additional paperwork needs to be done. Um, but we have a contract with the temp agency, so there's no right. contract with the people. And, um, you know, if they work out, great. We love them and they work overtime. And I'm told um, from the staff that um, they all want a job with Manatee County government. And some of them have gotten jobs with, the, with Manatee County government, which is why we keep having to replace them. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Well, as long as there's job openings, I guess that's a good thing. Okay. All right. Well, keep up the good work. Hopefully you don't have to work all weekend. Um, all right, we're going to move to item number 68, report on the 2020 state of EMS and authorization to write off public safety departments uncollectible fees. Good afternoon. Oh, Jimmy. Chief. James Crutchfield, your EMS chief. As I was listening to you all talk about the hospital system, I think it was a perfect segue as we uh, do uh, a quick presentation, all things EMS, for the next couple minutes. So this is your state of EMS for FY20. <clears throat> Do I click? No. Okay. Uh, this last year, we focused a lot on realigning the organizational structure of EMS itself uh, within several different sections. Uh, so we added a position, or we converted a position this year to better align our services. And there's three main prongs within the EMS division itself. Operations, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they handle all the day-to-day -day operations and the management functions of the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, that's led by Assistant Chief Lou. He handles large-scale incident functions, employee relations, which is coaching um, and recognition. He also serves as the infection control officer and supervises eight field supervisors. The administrative function or the administrative prong uh, within the division is led by Assistant Chief Mark Jones, uh, and he handles all the human resource functions, uh, career ladders, onboarding, offboarding, and serves as the department's primary liaison to the collective bargaining unit. And the special operations, which is led by Assistant Chief Tim Nowak, 
Um, that manages all the special things that don't fall in between the other two main categories. Those are all the fun things, I would, I would say. Uh, so he oversees uh, the SWAT team, fire medic program, the bike team, spectator coverage, and the community paramedic program. Mm. So throughout the last fiscal year, uh, I could share a lot of anecdotal stories and operational performance, operational performances, but it's important uh, for me to share like the data behind the stories. Uh, my director calls me the data guy, and uh, I, I do I have lots of things to show, and it might be a little bit overwhelming, but it helps paint the picture of your system performance here in the county. So this slide here, uh, there's a lot going on in this slide, um, but this is call volume by month. And one of the biggest things to point out here is the best is yet to come. Our busiest month is coming up in March, and that's based off a of five-year data trend. Uh, but more, more importantly, uh, between FY18 and FY19, we saw a growth of 9.2%. Mm. This year is an off, off year because of COVID, um, and we dropped a little bit, but I want you guys to hold on to the 8.9% increase as we go through some more data points, because I think it'll help paint the picture of your system performance here. So much like the call of the month, March being the busiest month, we are able to trend call data throughout the week as well. Uh, Fridays are, are the busiest and Sundays are the slowest. Uh, this last fiscal year, we ran 51,000 calls, and they took approximately 47 minutes per call to run from start to finish. I think that as we continue to paint the picture here, it helps highlight how busy your EMS system is. Um, a few years ago, uh, the previous EMS chief painted some pictures for you all in 2018 to move the system from a 2448 schedule to more of a blended model where we had a mixture of 12-hour trucks, peak load trucks, and 24-hour trucks. This, can you click it one more? So, this kind of shows the importance of having the peak load trucks and why our system kind of peaks and then goes back down. Um, so right now, we have 19 trucks that are available ambulances. I'm sorry, we have 20 trucks because we just added Mayaka. Um, and the busiest time of the day is what's highlighted there on the screen between 10 and 5. Um, and it's been the same for the past five years. Uh, we have 10 ambulances that are on a 2448 schedule, four ambulances that are on a 12 hour shift, so a 24 hour period <coughs> split into two, and then um, four trucks that are just a peak time frame. We also operate one ALS fire engine. So a few slides earlier, we were talking about call volume decreasing by 8%. Um, this is uh, alarming for anyone who watches data trends and things of, of, of such. What we're seeing here, or what I'm trying to show you all here, is even though the call volume has decreased, the acuity level has increased. So those are people who are really sick that are calling 911. Uh, we're experiencing here in Manatee County what is similar to being experienced across the nation, uh, but we're not getting any run-of-the-mill calls anymore. Uh, we're having a high acuity of Delta-level calls than we've seen over the past three years. Those are your stroke alerts, cardiac arrests, overdose, um, which is taxing on the 911 system, and it's taxing on employees. Uh, because there's no mix between high and low. It's all high, high incident calls. 41% are not transported to the hospital. That's about 21,000 calls a year. I know a lot of you guys are interested in uh, what's going on in the 911 system, and I'm the same way. Every time I see an ambulance that goes by with lights and sirens, I, uh, I wonder, you know, who's inside, what's going on? I can't really share that information with who's inside, but I can tell you what types of calls that we transport every year. Um, and 
this information here um, is particularly interesting for public health and doing preventative health measures. Almost 20% of all 911 calls here in Manatee County is a fall. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's alarmingly high. Uh, 20% call 911 because of a preventative issue, a fall. Um, and if you go further down, what I just highlighted there um, is the, ep the pandemic outbreak. Those will be your COVID calls. So as the news and the media have, have picked up on all things COVID, uh, our system is, is still busy doing day-to-day -day EMS things. Um, you know, I, I some other information that I put it up on the screen here uh, is, is information that I'm sure you guys are well aware of, uh, but all 911 calls, about 50%, are between the ages of 55 and 85. And we have a, a close to 50-50 mix between male and female. So the COVID response is far from over, and we're still tallying everything. And the EMS industry has made some unprecedented, unprecedented protective measures. Uh, Manatee County was the first county in the state to have a COVID positive patient transported by an EMS agency. Um, and since then, we've really hit the ground running with policies, procedures, and really trying to do the right thing by our employees and the citizens here. This slide is incredibly busy, uh, but I was trying to walk you through all the things that we've been doing in EMS and public safety to keep our employees safe and continue doing the job that we get paid to do. Uh, we quickly identified uh, that the local healthcare system was really not geared to deal with a pandemic. Uh, but one thing that we did realize soon was that even though we weren't geared to handle that, uh, we were quick to collaborate and make some group-based decisions as we moved forward. The EMS leadership in its, in its whole um, really focused on doing things to protect the employees so they're able to continue doing their job. Uh, we did some mandatory wellness screenings uh, that is still going on today. Um, we've transported over 1,000 COVID positive patients. We've had uh, over 190 exposures of our employees. Um, I could hit you guys with numbers and flashy things all day, but I think that um, as we continue to navigate through the COVID response, it's just easy to get lost in the minutia and not remember what we, what, what all we do in EMS. So back to the three prongs, I just wanna highlight in each section some of the things or the major accomplishments that we had over the last fiscal year. In administration, um, you know, we, we have to continue to train, right? And we have to continue to hire uh, employees as they come here. Uh, but one thing that uh, we really focused on was moving to a just culture, which would allow us to um, not take away the punitive action, but capitalize on coaching opportunities instead of disciplining everything that someone has done wrong. Operations. We continue to have a zero drafting policy where we haven't drafted any employees, which was mandatory overtime since 2018. Yeah, yeah that was a major accomplishment. Um, yep. And Larry has been one of the huge driving factors of that. Mm -hmm. We also were able to work with our hospital partners more than we ever have in the past. Um, and some of that was related to COVID, but also it's just with our collaborative approach towards everything. But we instituted a no diversion policy in the community, which was helped by uh, the health official, Dr. Jennifer Bency. So no hospital goes on diversion unless it's due to mechanical issue. And we've also realized a record low uh, attrition, uh, which uh, Director Stroud has pointed out to me a couple of times. Special operations, it seems to be very busy for a new section within EMS, but We've also hit the ground running there. 
Our support services section within uh, special operations now works seven days a week to maintain all equipment that's necessary by Florida statute and state mandates on an ambulance. Uh, we've instituted vending machines in some of the busiest sections of the county. And there's this big flashy drone uh, we've been busy with. We've also uh, have been deployed to multiple areas of the state to help them. Part of the special operations section oversees the community paramedic program, and I did want to take a couple moments just to talk about that uh, section within EMS as well. Again, another busy slide. Uh, it's hard to cram all the great things that EMS is doing into a slide presentation. Um, you know, I, as Director Sauer once called the community paramedics, they're the EMS ninjas of public safety, and they really do accomplish a lot of the hard tasks that a typical paramedic or ambulance is unable to do. Our LCSW, which is funded through Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Florida for a four-year period, is busy addressing social determinants of health, which was talked about earlier today. Uh, we have also have a federal grant that come through the Florida Department of Health Manatee, which allowed us to increase community paramedic capacity by doing remote patient monitoring. And um, at the very beginning of the COVID response, uh, the community paramedics changed their workflow to be focused solely on COVID and keeping people out of the hospital system as we navigated a surge in medical calls. Through the last fiscal year, uh, you know, they've been busy. Uh, they loaned out over 120 different durable medical equipment. So those are your wheelchairs, walkers, hospital beds. Um, we don't track what we give out for like diapers and non-reusable medical supplies. And they've been to over 2,000 medical appointments. I stole this slide from one of our results first interns and I just wanted to put it in front of you all one more time. Um, so every dollar that's spent in the community paramedic program, uh, 4.2 is uh, seen in return for savings. Employee engagement. It has been challenging. Um, I, I think this whole year has been challenging. I'm speaking to the choir here. Uh, but it turns out I think we've really hit the nail on the head uh, due to COVID. Um, it was challenging, but we made some pretty difficult decisions, and um, it really has turned out to, for the best. We've been trying to find ways to continuously recognize and celebrate the small stuff, as I find it to be very important to me. Um, every month, we host a peer-led, peer-driven monthly recognition awards uh, for the EMS responders, um, and that has dovetailed into the telecommunicators in the 911 center and also with all the fire districts. Um, so we're unable to meet in person, but what we have been able to do is do it virtually over Zoom, which has been well attended to say the least. Another milestone that in the EMS division that we focus on is the collar, brass, and pinning ceremony. Um, you guys will recall that those are usually held in the board chambers, but we're no longer in the board chambers right now. But it's an important milestone in any uh, first responder's career. So it's important that we are finding ways to address those needs and keeping employees engaged. So we did a drive-through pinning ceremony at one of the EMS bases. Uh, it was in the garage, but it was still well attended. Uh, this next slide here, uh, even though we've had COVID uh, for quite a while, uh, we still were able to do some community awareness presentations, lots of Zoom-based presentations, um, and a few small group presentations with the, with the Boy Scouts. We continue to support and engage employees at the national level as we send employees to national conferences. Uh, this slide here was to do a service comparison and to kind of capture and memorialize what the transition took place in 2018 uh, because it's still fairly new. Uh, EMS has been delivered here a certain way 
for a very long time. Uh, again, we do not do just 2448 schedules. We have a blended schedule where we have staggering 12-hour shifts, which, ma which marches out to the peak load of the system. We'll skip that one. Okay, so I say DMS billing for last, not because it's least appealing uh, than the rest, but um, it's not as flashy for sure. Uh, but I will say that EMS billing is the birthplace to the budget, and medical billing is tough. Uh, there's an entire industry that focuses on medical billing, and I'm going to do my best to give you a quick glimpse of the medical billing inside EMS. Again, just one slide here. Uh, but it is critically important to our division and our division's health. So in addition to the slides that I showed you all earlier, it's important that we kind of reference that as we walk through this. Um, and it really helps you understand the analysis of the patients that we serve here in Manatee County and how bills are generated um, is important. The payer mix here um, I have up on the right, you can see, is mostly Medicare. So again, going back to the average age of our patients that we serve is 55, bet between 55 and 85, this is uh, to be expected. What is not really being discussed here is the Medicare reimbursement rate which is one of the lowest, um, aside from Medicaid, but Medicaid is not a large uh, user of our system. Um, our EMS budget is 76% personnel services, which is salary, overtime, and benefits. So I think that's also important to remember as the reimbursement rates continue to like diminish and dwindle. And understanding that um, the average ALS reimbursement rate for a Medicare patient is $346, but we're billing $618. So on the left-hand side, we bill for $14 a mile, but Medicare reimburses at 7.62 per mile, okay? Um, BLS, we bill for $323.53 on average, Medicare will reimburse $291.42 on average. The state of Florida is not super unique, uh, but we are unable to balance bill here due to House Bill 221. Um, so what is left over is left over. Moving forward in 2021, we have lots of initiatives. Uh, we can mark the first one off, Alpha 14. Uh, that has already been accomplished. Alpha 21, which is gonna go in the university corridor area. Uh, we have an RFP going out for cardiac monitors. We're gonna continue to prepare for accreditation. We have another Raptor bus that's coming in. Uh, we've partnered with the HR department to continue to enhance our attrition and do a results first retention pilot process. We have also uh, have our collective bargaining unit renegotiations coming up this year. And before we move to the next slide, I'm gonna ask that my director will pass out, we have a a packet of all things EMS, just because I didn't want to take all your time this morning. I could spend all day talking about EMS. That kind of highlights some more uh, data points and more things that we've accomplished in our division uh, this last fiscal year. Thank you. And I do have an action request of the board. Thanks, Jake. And that's to remove all uncollectible accounts for ambulance user fees, and that is 
for December through December. And with that, I will take any questions. Uh, the action requested, as I read it, says authorization to remove public safety department's uncollectible accounts, which includes ambulance user fees, ambulance user returned item fees, refund check issued in there, and animal services non-sufficient funds, and stop payment checks totaling 5.3 million roughly for October. So is that actually the action requested? Yes. Okay. All right, just want to clarify that. Uh, Carol. Can I ask questions, or do you want, I mean, do you want a motion first before we oh, ask? you can ask questions. Okay, I have, um, first of all, the COVID testing, do our, uh, our field workers, do, uh, our EMS paramedics, do they get, um, EMTs, do they get COVID tested routinely, or just when they're symptomatic, or that you think they've been exposed? Uh, we follow the same policy that all county employees follow, um, and if they want to test, they can get tested any time but we don't routinely test them unless there's a reason to. And approximately how many um, of your employees have been tested positive and had to uh, be off the workforce since all this in March? So I would say that is going to be a little fuzzy math if I had to be completely honest with you, Commissioner, because we transport positive patients and some of the medical procedures that we do are aerosol generating procedures. And if they do not um, wear the proper PPE for the safety of our workforce and the patients that are calling 911, we will proactively remove them from the schedule. How about just asking that question then? How many of you had to isolate? 190. Okay, and that's since March. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, you said that we don't have any diversion, that we've stopped that. That, how are we going to do that during season? Because for those that don't know what diversion is, means um, once a hospital gets full and they don't have enough nurses on the floors or in the hospital to take care of any more patients coming in, they go on diversion and then they go to the other two hospitals. And I think there's only one hospital a, lot, a time allowed to be on diversion. So have you have stopped that? Yeah, we've, we've stopped that, and we've stopped it with a lot of open communication. Good, it's so important. the hospitals are working together. Yeah, yeah, the hospitals are working together, and we're also implementing the first watch. It is a data surveillance tool okay. that allows data sharing at almost real time between all facilities. And I'm glad you brought up about, and I, we don't agree with this, and I've met with you guys about this. I, I still think, I, and I think what you've said is, um, not many EMS, of course, we're the first in the state on a lot of things, but not many EMS uh, take insurances. For instance, um, if you have Medicare, but you have United Healthcare as a supplement, you don't take United Healthcare, correct? Just Medicare. So we have a third party billing. For Medicare supplement. So our billing vendor bills all available insurances. But so Medicare would be like the category. So there's. Uh, Humana, there's I know. you know there's several different forms of Medicare. We we have some contracts if that's what you're asking. I just know that we don't bill commercial insurance and um, and again I met with staff and and I understand where you're coming from. I've been told you know that it's pro it's not going to happen, but but I still think if you hired a billing company that credentialed us and billed, we would save a lot of uh, we would be able to recoup some of that money. Um, if you looked at the gray areas where commercial was and others, I know you can't do private pay because those are usually people without insurance. So I, I, it just um, bothers me. And, and again, now let's, you, you just said the average bill is about six or $700. Medicare pays 300. Do you balance bill the patient or do you write that off? That has to be written off. It's but, against yeah, the law. It has to, I know. Okay. Because you said balance bill. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and I want to thank the community paramedicine, um, a young, and her 50-year-old uh, RN developed Parkinson's, and um, she called uh, called me asking for help. She couldn't get a ride anywhere. Her meds were too much. She couldn't afford them. And, you know, Parkinson's, you rely on your medicines. Um, her doctor, her insurance was all messed up. I didn't know what to do, so I called Community Paramedicine. And thank you to your uh, organization and um, MCR uh, she has handy bus now, and she's only in her 50s. So I just want to thank you that this is the kind of things that they case manage so they keep them out of the hospital because she didn't know where to go or where to get her meds. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.
I, if, if you don't mind, I will just want to provide a little bit, uh, I guess, clarification. We do have a third party contract with a billing company that does all EMS billing for us, and that's A and B. But are you providers of insurance? Yes. So, uh, no. No, I didn't think you were. So what they're doing is some commercial plans have out-of-network benefits, and they're, you're probably getting some monies, correct? Yes. Yeah. I was just wanting us to be providers of insurance, but again, nobody, I think, does it. Hmm. That's what I heard. So I'm going to lose that battle, but I'll bring it up every year. Try to get, recoup some monies. I, I can give you a little bit um, greater insight on that. Um, get closer to the mic, and then we can probably hear you. I can give you a little bit closer insight to that. So us, much like any EMS service throughout the, the country, we bill as an out-of-network provider. Right. If, and if we were to sign on as a network provider, our, our reimbursement from the insurance company would be much lower. Oh, I understand it, okay. but that's why Manatee County went on Aetna for our employees, because then we had to pay our providers less, because they pay like, um, Aetna pays like 80% of Medicare rates. So um, all of our employees, and we received that um, positive income that we didn't have to spend out for health care. So yeah, I get it. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, can I have a recommended motion, please? I'll move the recommended motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there anyone in the public that would like to address the board on this issue? Anyone? There is someone on yes, the line? Yes, Madam Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 445. We will allow you to talk. Please hit star six to unmute. And that is star six. Hi, caller, please state your name for the record. And you have three minutes, please. Caller is unmuted. Caller is unmuted? Yes. Okay, caller, we can, we need to hear you if you're going to speak. Must be having trouble. Okay. All righty. Well, um, okay. There's no other public comment. I'll close public comment. Um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. All right. Um, at this point, we are ready to go to our two o'clock time certain. Uh, we've got like two minutes um, before our two o'clock time certain. Reggie, you're taking off at two because you have an appointment. If you'd like to just tell us where you're going, <laughs> I will be um, I will be seat speaking um, to a group via via Zoom about the um, the Florida Council of the social status of the black men and black boys and I'll be speaking there um, at 2, I think. Charlie is going to um, prompt me when it's time for me to go. Okay. Their program starts at 2, and he say, he think it'll be about 2, 2.15. And Madam Chair, once I finish, I'll be right back. I'm not leaving the facility. Okay. I'm going in another room. That staff has helped support this, so I'll be right back. Okay, great. Thanks. I thought I'd fill a little time giving you that opportunity since... Uh we're coming up on the 2 o'clock hour, which is uh, our time certain where we're going to have a discussion of ongoing issues relative to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic and the extension of the local state of emergency. And uh, Sherry, you want Thank to go you, ahead? Madam Chairman. Members of the board, um, that is correct. We'll be at the end of this. Uh, Mr. Director Sauer and I will be asking for an extension of the local state of emergency. This is a week 28 update, day 252 of our reporting to the board. Next slide. Uh, just to update the board, last two weeks ago when I was here, we were pending the outcome of the governor's um, determination of extending the state of Florida state of emergency, which ended on November 3rd. He did make that decision and Executive Order 2276 was approved by the governor, which takes the state of Florida state of emergency through January 2nd. Next slide. Again, as we've been reporting, these are the seven areas of the guiding principles for the governor's plan for reopening and what he's been following. We're in phase three, and we moved to phase three with the governor on September 25th. Next slide. 
Um, it's a little small to see, but um, I think what we'll do is just remind you that we have three areas that we report on from the administrative time frame, excuse me, from the administrative area for benchmarks, the syndromic surveillance, epidemiology, and the outbreak decline, and the healthcare capability. Um, if you'd like to go to the next slide, Jake, I can, these are the four slides from the Florida Departments of Health website from yesterday. And um, just to indicate where we're at, I know Jake's going to go over in more detail. About a week ago, the state of Florida did change some of their um, reporting, and now they're looking just at the seven-day rolling average. So in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see, as of yesterday, 2,125 cases positive, 122. Hang on one second catching up with you here and that's for Manatee County that puts our seven day average at right around 5.7 percent and the 14 day average at around 6.2 percent in the bottom left hand that is the state's average and how they're running for their seven and 14 day in the upper top right hand corner this is what we're tracking for any changes to the actual numbers in the epidemiology and outbreak decline area and you'll see that we we are still we are standing there at 334 deaths unfortunately for manatee county 154 non-residents and 13,960 residents 909 hospitalizations and then at the bottom right, this is the one that is important to watch. It's the metrics, the health metrics chart. And you can see um, back on um, October 26, there was a peak in all areas. And it would appear there's sort of a downward slide. I think Jake's going to give you more of the day-to-day -day and update information. But I wanted to close out with saying that we're at right at 31% of the population of the county that have been um, tested. And um, that's 127,182. You saw all big lines out here today when you came by because there is there has been a, an increase. Mm -hmm. When you get to our reopening strategies, which is the next slide, you'll see we're in November. We're at 31%. And you heard from um, Karen Stewart that we are just closing the three category areas for our CARES Act today. Where our government area will remain open and we continue to work with the governments. And um, nothing has really changed in that category that's highlighted in yellow since I last spoke. And I'm going to sum it up again, going to the next slide with reminding you about the executive order from the governor, 20 276. And that leads us to the last request again, which is extending that local state of emergency for seven days. And I'm happy to turn it over to Director Sauer, have all the more details. Any questions? Any questions for Sherry? Uh, Carol. Uh, Sherry, I told you the Herald Tribune called me this morning, and they said our, our positive rates have gone up 50%, but I just haven't had time to look. Or uh, Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it, when Jake comes up, he'll be talking to you about, he'll show you some charts of the exact levels that have changed. Okay. So we can let him answer that if you don't mind. Thanks. And, and the number of people standing in line for testing, I, I didn't even realize that until I drove by it this morning. Um, I've been, the last test that I got, I did get down in Sarasota. It was a drive-up test. There was not much of a line. It, there's the, really the only alternative for people that want to do drive-up is um, to go down to Cattleman in Sarasota. Is that correct? As far as I know, that's correct right yeah. now. Yes. Okay. I think that's why you've seen a lot more people here, too, standing in line, because the Lincoln site was moved to here due to um, us beginning our project over there, and the, the UTC site was closed because of construction be going to begin there for the Moat Marine Aquarium and uh, move to the cattleman site mm -hmm. yes and it, it's still um free for mm -hmm. any florida resident i assume to come maybe jake can confirm that suppose. to the um testing here i know we were a little bit worried about a, perhaps needing to close down if there was a storm but it looks like we've dodged that bullet for now and um it's just remaining open is that correct mm -hmm. okay mcr is free too mcr is free also yeah all okay. their places offer it 
Okay. All right, Jake. I just want to say Jake from Manatee County. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. From State Farm. <laughs> Jake from State Farm. Who are you wearing, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you wear a red shirt on? Red shirt, yeah. Good, good afternoon, Commissioner Jake Sauer from Manatee County. Uh, public safety. I was ready for him to say State Farm. Okay, uh, just to give you a quick recap, and, and, and as usual, all of this data is from yesterday's uh, Department of Health report. 50.6 million global cases, and that's an increase of 7.5 million since October 27th. 9.9 .9 million cases in the United States with over 237,000 deaths, and that's an increase of over 1.3 million and 12,000 deaths since October 27th, 2020. 832,525 cases in Florida, with 17,121 deaths, an increase of 60,536 cases and 672 deaths since October 27th. 13,960 cases in Manatee County residents with 334 deaths, uh, and that's an increase of 1,079 cases and seven deaths, deaths since October 27th. So as uh, County Administrator Corey was, was talking to you earlier, um, our, six, our, our positive rate for the last 14 days is at 6%. Um, we were at 10.2% on July, on July 26th in the middle of our uh, spike of COVID-19 cases. 5.9% positive rate for tests in the last seven days. And just to remind you, we were at 9% on July 26th. Mm -hmm. 25 new uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations since October 27th. And Manatee County EMS is averaging approximately four COVID-related calls per day. And our EOC, as always, uh, remains at a level two activation. On this slide, this graph shows the number of new positive cases per date, as well as a seven-day average, which smooths out outliers in the data to show a trend. Since September, a steady rise in the number of new cases has taken place. In early September, we averaged approximately 25 new cases per day, but that number has almost quadrupled and reached as high as 96 on November 2nd. While these numbers are not as high as the daily totals we saw during the peak of the outbreak, it is something to pay attention to closely moving forward and is evidence that the pandemic continues to spread. When looking at fatalities by date, it is clear to see that there have been two distinct surges in fatalities, with the first peak occurring in mid-April, which can largely be attributed to outbreaks within our long-term long care facilities, and then the second beginning in mid-July, and that can be uh, attributed to uh, our surge in cases that we experienced then. This is just a quick breakdown of how, how our, it affects our residents and positive cases. Still remains about the same, both uh, affecting both males and females equally. Um, and our uh, median age range has increased by one to 40 years of age. And the highest category of positives within Maids County remains 25 to 34. This, uh, provides, this slide here provides data surrounding COVID-19 in our local hospitals. In July, local hospitals had no hospital or ICU beds available on several occasions during our, our peak. In more recent days, however, the number of COVID positive patients has decreased compared to the peak of the pandemic uh, to this point. Early September was also around the time of the fewest COVID-19 positive patients in local hospitals. We have seen a few increases and decreases in these numbers since then, but overall, our hospitals have remained in fairly good shape. Public safety will continue to engage with and insist our, assist our hospitals with any unmet needs through our healthcare work group, which meets weekly on Wednesdays, I'm sorry, Tuesdays. One concerning thing to note regarding COVID-19 and hospitalizations is the CDC yesterday published a study that shows approximately 10% of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 are readmitted to the hospital within two months. There are a lot of unknowns regarding long-term impacts of the disease on the human body, which is just another reason prevention is so critical. Local testing sites, some of the testing sites that remain available to the public include from partner organizations such as MCR Health, 
NMCR has done a tremendous job of writing testing for our residents and they have tested over 27,000 people visiting their facilities in the county for testing and testing, continue, testing continues to be available at MCR clinics uh, for pediatrics and adults. The Florida Department of Health, Manatee, continues to provide testing at mobile home parks, migrant camps, and other targeted populations within our community. And Florida Department's Emergency Managed drive through at Cattleman Road continues to operate, and there have been no changes to the hours of operation there. And then due to previously scheduled construction in the area, as you know, as we talked about, Lincoln Park has moved over here to the Braden Area Convention Center, and they recently just changed their hours to 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. with no break for lunch. <clears throat> Manta County and all its partners should continue to advocate for individuals to get tested specifically if they exhibit symptoms or if they have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. Individuals, individuals in these categories should be tested and self-isolate to limit the spread of the virus within the community. Just want to touch on the, the Binax rapid test. Last time I uh, addressed you, we talked about this test a little bit and this is being distributed by the Florida Department of Emergency Management to our long-term care facilities, as well as our 55 and over communities. We have worked with the Department of Health, uh, our EMS division, as well as emergency management. We're starting to collect those tests for those 55 and over communities, and we're scheduling uh, testing events in those communities with EMS and the Department of Health. So our goals moving forward, Monitor hospital system for increases in COVID-19 prevalence. To date, we're doing very well with that. Test 2% of our population each month. Continue targeted messaging through Mask Up Manatee and our social media. Provide testing for underserved populations through the Department of Health Manatee. And develop and execute once vaccines are available, a plan for vaccine distribution. Uh, any questions? Questions? Vanessa. Yeah, uh, Jake from, I mean, Manatee County. <laughs> uh, when you were talking about the spike of positive tests, how, what you didn't mention, I don't think, or maybe I missed it, was in the spike that we saw in positive testing, <coughs> how many tests were given and the results came back the same day? Is it a, was it a high amount of testing or, you know, where is that at? For um, uh, the spike that we saw in, in September or? In or September. Those, those tests were all done through PCR, so it took about 48, I'm sorry, because it was during that spike, it took about 72 hours to get tests back. Is that what? Is well, that what? what I'm curious about, and this comes up all the time, you know, like if we have 90 tests that come back positive, mm -hmm. okay, well, out of those 90, how many tests actually came back? In other words, what's the percentage of testing that was done? So I'd have to go uh, back and being look at that. Day. I'd have to go back and look at the at the data to to see how many tests we did and how many came back positive, but we don't typically look at how many tests you do, um, and then how many come back positive for that one single day. What you look at is overall seven and fourteen days. If I'm testing a certain population of the of the community, mm -hmm. and it's coming and it's coming back more than. 10% um, you know that you are not testing enough of the community. Okay, right. well, and I understand what you're saying. I was Good just point. curious, you know, if we have hypothetically 90 tests that come back positive, is that out of, you know, 3,000 tests? I mean, you know, how do we know, you know, whether or not when we hear 90 tests came back positive, overall though at the testing that's been done, how do we really know where we're, where we're at? You know, are we going back up percentage wise? Or I realize right now where we are, but you know, I see two different percentages all the time. So I'm not really sure what's what with that. Do, you, do you see what I'm saying? I don't. Okay, never mind. <laughs> well, we used to talk about it all the time. So that you know, how many tests came I, I, back that we were. I never delineate between how many tests were completed that day and how many were positive. We look at the positive, the positivity rate of that day's testing. Yeah, um, and, you, and want, you look at it from a whole week? And we look at it seven and 14 Every days day. out. Um, and I can go back to where we are now. Yeah, I, that's I can, just I, what I'm curious about. You know, are we seeing more positives come back recently uh, for oh. the amount of tests that's I'm been on done. the same page with you now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So no, during, you. Our, during our spike back in September, we were as high as our daily positivity, positivity rate, sometimes reaching as high as 15 to 18 percent mm -hmm. daily right seven and 14 averaged between 11 and nine percent so we're not there yet um, 
we, we're seeing a gradual, what we call a moderate increase mm -hmm. in positives now. Uh, we're, we're nowhere near where we were in our spike in September. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. But the, the percent positive is always going to be the positive based uh, compared to the number of tests. So it's, it, it isn't going to matter the number of tests, right? I mean, if you have fewer tests and you have more positive, the percent positive is going to go higher. If high, I right? tested everybody in this room and, you know, uh, over 90% come back uh, positive, if we this was the nice. county, I know I'm not <laughs> testing enough of that population. Okay. Currently, we're running around 6% for a 14 day mm -hmm. average. That's getting onto the border if that continues to go up through the months, especially in the 8, 10%. We know that we are not testing enough of, pop of the population, that the population is positive. There's mm -hmm. more positives out in that population than we can test. All right, I've, I've got a question. We've got like if 500 a day. Go ahead and put us on the floor. Jake, with what you just said, maybe we're kind of getting to what I'm <laughs> wondering here. Um, Right now, we're only testing those people that come forward that want to be tested. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Correct? Or that go to the hospital or something mm -hmm. and, and they're not feeling well. So, you know, and we right now we've, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we've tested a, a little over 30% of our population. Yes, Is that correct? So, you know, we are certainly doing a great amount of testing, it that's seems correct. like to me. So. That's, I guess that's what I'm asking or wondering about is, you know, where do you finally say, okay, we've tested, we're like really hitting it and we're doing well with the amount of tests that's being done. We've, that's been, we've been saying that. We're, we, uh, we are really hitting it well um, and we have been for quite some time. During our spike, we could have ramped up um, more tests to make sure we were getting a better picture of the community. We, I, I always, when I do this presentation, um, to others, I always say there's a couple canaries we send down into the coal mine to tell us if we are getting into another spike. One of those is community demand for a test. Right. So if you look at today, right. there's a long line of the community wanting to be tested. Typically, through our experience for the last, since we started this in March, when community demand goes up, that's our first telltale sign that there's community spread. They believe that they've been exposed or they're exhibiting symptoms and they want to get tested. Right. So that's one. Our seven and 14 day averages are our second telltale signs of the canary coming back sick. We know that typically for the last almost month, we've seen that in gradually increase our seven and 14 days as we move forward. It has been not, not exponentially. We're nowhere near where we were in September with our spike, but we see it gradually increasing every time that makes sense yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it does and if i could ask you one more question um hospital stays are we hearing that the hospital stays generally are uh still increasing lengthwise or is it a little bit shorter have we have in other words have we made really any um um, good results in how we're treating the patients that are actually ill enough to be in the hospital. So we certainly are working with our hospital uh, work group. We, we've certainly noticed and we've had those discussions that there's much more different modalities to treat these patients and obviously more knowledge now than there was at the beginning to treat these patients. Are they still learning a lot in how to treat these patients? Absolutely, because as this virus uh, progresses, it, it affects different age ranges and different types of people. So, uh, you know, one of the conversations uh, re relied on less of a ventilator type uh, approach right. and more positive airflow, sort of like a CPAP when you go to bed at night. Right. So they, they're always constantly trying to develop better ways to treat these patients. And I will say, our, our local hospitals and for most of Florida's hospitals, they're in much better shape than they were at the beginning and definitely during our spike today. And it's funny you'd say that. And the reason I ask was because I know, you know, I, I try to talk to the different hospitals and in talking to Blake, I'm hearing that hospital stays and so forth are going very well, that mm -hmm. they've definitely seen a big difference. And so, you know, to me that's saying, well, maybe we've, you know, really learned a lot over the months and, and we're we know how to treat it better than what we did before. I would say that's true. Yeah, but I'm hearing too that that's not necessarily the case in all the hospitals in Manatee County. So that's why, you know, one reason I'm asking, it's like trying to get my finger on the pulse there. Yeah, no, all, all three hospitals are doing an excellent job. 
uh, treating and managing those patients. Um, as with the CDC uh, that I referenced back in my, in my slide, a, a study they did, uh, and we're, we've seen that before, we discussed that in a, on, on one of the work groups. You know, they, they come in, they get treated for COVID-19. Uh, you know, obviously a hospital is one of the last places you wanna go. So once they do come into a hospital and get treated, they get discharged, they have to come back in to the hospital system for a second round of care because of the COVID-19 COVID virus. So, like I said, it constantly evolves and changes. Um, when we seen our spike, we got to a very alarming spot in our hospital system. We we're talking no beds, one and two beds for the right. entire hospital, right. I mean, for the entire county. Um, but, but since then, they've managed that very well. Um, they're more on the, on the aware and on the outlook of what it takes to keep uh, available beds open. And our Florida Department of Emergency Management has sent down a, st a stockpile of ventilators for us to use and hand out to those hospitals should they need it. So we do feel we're in a better spot than we were during our spike. Yeah. yeah. And you know, commissioners, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but Debbie Woosley, who I think yes, worked with Forgive passed. Me Not, yeah, her, um, her <clears throat> husband just passed it. away from she COVID. So he had yeah. been in the hospital for quite a Cal while. Carrie, Carrie okay. Woosley. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's what yes, I heard Carrie. That. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, Dr. Woosley, uh, now that we're talking, he did a lot of good service to this community. He helped with the um, forget-me-nots a lot. He helped his wife, but he was a good chiropractor here in Manatee County for many years. Um, the, the hospital's uh, mortality rate has gone down. I watch the deaths every day because that's how I know that the modalities of treatment are getting better, and it's all was trial by error, and I'm sure you can agree with that, Jake. <laughs> Um, oxygen levels, really the only time you go in the hospital now, you can go in the ER, but if you can be maintained by one or two liters or four or five, of course we heard one day eight, but if you can be monitored and taken care of at home with home oxygen, they are sending them home with various medications and um, so you're not seeing the emissions like we did. But, um, and when you do see an emission, it's because they need that antiviral. Um, the, the plasma, I don't even, don't even hear that much anymore if they're doing that, but the decadrons and stuff, that all needs IVs. Um, the hospitals, uh, what you're seeing maybe is, I think Lakewood Ranch and Blake, their payer mix and their neighborhoods are uh, commercial and they use, most of the people that live in this area have insurance. Uh, probably Manatee, where you're seeing higher lengths of stays is because it's a safety net hospital. And I don't know of one durable equipment company that will send you home and for free give you a home oxygen. So I don't know how they're managing that. And I would like to know, um, I don't know if uh, Sherry CARES Act's funds could even be used for that to decrease the length of stays. Because sometimes they're there because they don't have insurance and they can't get those, um, dur that durable equipment at home. I know so many people now that I can't keep track that are positive. And most of them are in Manatee County on oxygen at home, being monitored by their physicians, not trying to go to the emergency rooms. If they do, and they can go home, they do send them home. Been very, very sick. So that's why I wondered about these numbers because Sarah's so, Herald Tribune called me and I'm thinking, well, well, I can't keep track of how many people have it now. Well, I, I'd, like to con I'd, I'd like to caution <laughs> you about um, focusing so hard on, on hospital stays and hospital bed availability. Yes, we, we, we monitor that. Our, our, our spike in positivity rate uh, back in September is, is not what we're seeing today. Right. We're seeing a gradual increase. Now, when we talk about if we continue that gradual increase for the next two, three months, that's when we're going to be in that type of situation again. It's, mm -hmm. It takes a long time mm -hmm. to get to where we're taxing that hospital system. I mean, we're talking about uh, <clears throat> doubling our positivity rate back to when we were in September, when we get to a situation like that, that's where it's really critical for a hospital bed availability. Uh, and, and the deaths follow even later than that. So um, th I'm not ringing any type of alarm bells, but I, I think that it's very important that we keep our eye on the ball here and we note, we note that we are seeing a gradual increase every week of positivity. And eventually that's gonna catch up to us. And the hospitals, they are, um, I know they do COVID house testing unfortunately since the last time I saw y'all my husband fell it's in the hospital again and broke his hip so he has to, he had to have a COVID test before he's going to be discharged but when they're positive do the hospitals they have to report it to the state 
also the health department, right? There, there is no, there's no test that you can take, the public can take, without it being reported to the okay. health care, the Florida Department of Health. Thank you. All right. Other questions, comments? Um, Priscilla. I move to extend the state of emergency. Second. Second. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Trey, seconded by Commissioner Baugh. Anyone like to make any comment on the state of emergency um, extension? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6 0 because Reggie's not here. And I, you know, I. I do appreciate, um, you know, your report, and I do think it is going to be very important to keep a very close eye on the hospitals. <clears throat> I know we have really good coordination. It's very hard to follow those day-to-day -day things. You know, yeah, you're down to ICU beds, and then you have plenty. And so I don't really know how it all works, um, but it does. Uh, it is concerning when we know that we go into a time where we've traditionally had um, a very tight, tight uh, supply of hospital beds just because you know I, it's no secret that I've had a sinus infection that's going on for two weeks you know have had lots of COVID tests don't have COVID that's great but people are you know experiencing all these other bugs that are going around um, and uh, may cause um, people that have more luckily I'm a pretty healthy person and don't have lung issues but other people that do they may end up in the hospital mm -hmm. so it's not going to be all COVID we know that it's it's other things that are affecting people so um, we just need to be aware and um, I just hope for the sake of people that are standing in line today was an interesting day because we had a storm coming uh, just rainstorm oh. and um, you know I don't know if there's a way to provide them with some sort of shelter we're standing, you know, there usually tents it's yesterday, but the hot down. sun is probably the worst. But they had tents yesterday, but they took them down because of the wind. Oh, they did take yeah. them down because of the wind. Yeah. Is that right? Because I went by okay. yesterday. Okay. But it's just, um, you know, obviously people are nervous and you, know, you got kids in school and that all that kind of stuff is, is <laughs> ramping up the probably a lot of the parents get nervous because their kids get sent home for various reasons or they're going to various activities and it's just, um, you know, it's just going to be a tough time for people and we just need to be aware of that and do what we can do yeah no, absolutely and uh you know chief crutchfield's presentation march is ems's uh busiest month that is that's peak season that that's snowbird right. peak season and that's when things are um tight in all corners mm -hmm. absolutely right so Okie dokie. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, we, we were uh, at this point anticipating requesting a local state of emergency because of Tropical Storm Etta. I do have uh, Chief Litchauer behind me. Should you have any questions, I can tell you that the track of that storm has uh, tracked further west, um, favoring us out of the cone of uh, uncertainty for that Wonderful. storm. So we are not requesting a local state of emergency. It is projected to continue to move northward towards the uh, Panhandle, oh, uh, Louisiana uh, area. Oh my God. But the conditions are very unfavorable for that storm once it gets up there. So oh. it could even uh, be downgraded to a depression at that point or, or be null altogether. All so um, we can give you a presentation if you'd like, but we're not, ex we're not uh, requesting a local state of emergency at this time. Or we can answer any questions that you guys might have about the storm. No, I guess we'll take the good news for today. But as we all know, with the weather in Florida, you got to turn it on every day and see what's going on. <laughs> Seems to change on a regular basis. But uh, that sounds like good news. I'm glad we don't have to have two states of emergency yeah. at one time for various things. But we appreciate y'all watching that for us and staying on it. I know I was on a call on Sunday with y'all listening, listening into the report. And I was so impressed by the number of people that were on that call reporting in and ready to go should there be another another emergency in this county so do appreciate all the staff and they're you know 24 7 they have to be ready to go so thank you thank you thank you very much okay all right well um we have two things to do yet as far as i can tell we have um a 230 time certain or we have also the annual performance evaluation for county administrator Sherry Corrier. Which do you guys want to do first? Let's do the, get the eval over with. Yeah, What's the other Sherry. one we have to get do? Get the eval over. The recognition of your wonderful. Oh, the do you guys last. Incredible. Well, do you guys commissioners. 
<laughs> At least that's what I want. Sorry, I got the podium. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's do the, um, okay, we will go to the annual performance evaluation for County Administrator Sherry Corrier. Um, I'll go ahead and give you guys just kind of the background because I guess it falls to me to do so. Um, so we approved at our meeting of June 18th, 2019, um, the employment contract for County Administrator Sherry Corrier. And as a requirement, um, we had a six month performance evaluation to be conducted with an annual ev evaluation in November of each year. And so that is what we're doing. We're doing this event annual evaluation for Sherry's um, performance according to the contract. And you all got a copy of the contract, you know, mm -hmm. what the things were that we were asking for. It looks like we did not have um, full participation of all the commissioners. I'm not sure what that's about. All I have is a uh, breakdown of the numbers um, and how Sherry scored and then the comments. Kind of the same we did as when we did Carlos. It's basically the same kind of format. Did you all get a copy of this yet? Uh, I thought we yeah. had all seven. I saw a chart. I thought we had all seven. No. Mm -mm. No? No. Oh. If you add all the numbers, it's only six in oh. each um, each one. But I'll go through it kind of kind of quick. Mm. Basically, on uh, the question, administration of all county departments, the vast majority um, scored uh, Sherry as it exceeds oh. expectations. There was um, a few meets expectations and um, just a very few needs and improvement. I, actually, I'm not reading this right. It's it's kind of it's hard for me to read this chart, so I'm going to try again. Just read it. <laughs> all right, administration of all county departments. Five of the commissioners said exceeds expectations. Can't get any better than that, Sherry. That's the number one. And then one meets expectations. Carrying out directives, policies of the board's county commissioners. Five exceeds expectations. One provided no answer. Communication with the board of county commissioners. Five exceeds expectations. One meets expectations. Preparation and management of the county annual budget. Five exceeds expectations one found it unacceptable strategic planning and goals four exceeds expectations one meets expectations one needs improvement leadership public image and community relations five exceeds expectations one needs improvement annual report three exceeds expectations two meets expectations one needs improvement position classification and pay plan for all positions in, uh, um, in county service Two exceeds expectations, um, three meets expectations, one needs improvement. Attendance, I don't know how anyone could rate anything other than outstanding, but someone decided they needs improvement. But maybe that person said that you work too much. You know, <laughs> that could be a problem sometimes. People yeah. get burned out because I don't know anyone who is working as hard as you are in trying to keep all of these balls in the air. Um, Judgment and decision making, four exceeds expectations, one meets expectations, one needs improvement. And then we have a list of all of the comments. Basically, most of the comments are extremely supportive of Sherry's management style, extremely supportive of her ability to have the respect and admiration of her department heads, and the team succeeds due to her leadership. She's hands on. She's um, created team atmosphere, impacted staff moral, morale positively. She also works consistently to support directors and policies, always carries out the board's directive in a timely manner, carries out policies, great communicator. You know, that was one that I highlighted, um, great communicator. And um, she's on call 24 seven, works hard to, to make sure that all, all, commissioners get the same information, which is not easy. And one time I thought I was the only one getting some information and she corrected me, oh no, everyone gets the same information. Yeah. Annual budget, uh, budget's the biggest priority. Sherry looks at it from every angle to properly execute it with appropriate amendments as needed. Very transparent. Um, this year was an exceptional year for preparing the budget and constantly modifying to reflect changing conditions. That's what we had to do, right? Mm -hmm been able to, to juggle those balls again. Strategic, strategic planning and goals, great vision, forward progressive thinking. Um, always provides excellent communication on this dynamic document, resource-oriented, 
As the mother of results first planning, Sherry excels at putting forth a clearly defined strategic plan with measurable goals for the county staff. Right? No, we all agree. She's the mother of results first planning. Mm -hmm. That's who I first heard it from was Sherry. So <laughs> interesting. Um, and has worked out very well for us. Leadership, public image, community relations, excellent. She has a very, very, very um, supportive relationship with the community. I think you all know that. Um, and your report, again, results first, emphasize, comprehensive, thoroughly explain how we meet our goals. Position classification and pay plan for all positions in county um, service. Does a great job, work with personnel and finance, a great team, obviously, which is important. Attendance, I already kind of talked about that. Judgment, decision making, sound, excellent. Um, her long uh, record of service and experience uniquely qualifies her to make logical and rational decisions in a timely manner. Additional comments, great year of performance in the midst of a pandemic. Kind of sums it up. So I basically think that Sherry got a walks on water review. Um, I personally think she deserves it. Um, we've talked, she and I have talked a little bit about uh, whether or not there'll be a pay raise um, proposed and um, she's not uh, seeking that at this time. So recognizing that we're having, that we're in a situation where, you know, we are tightening up our, our belts as we always do. Um, that's not on the table today for pay raise, um, y'all can bring that back. Um, she's you know, gonna take whatever pay performance kind of thing that, that the uh, staff will have. Um, I did ask for the county attorney to look at a uh, increasing the rollover amount to the um, amount of um, vacation hours she can carry forward. Tell me if I've got that worded correctly. To make it match the county attorney's contract. It was something that um, Bill Clegg put in his contract update, and I agree with that. I think that it um, should be um, uh, modified to be consistent with the county attorney's contract, but I would need a motion to direct the county attorney to bring that back if you all agree that that is something that we could do to modify her contract. I'll make that motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to direct, the, yeah, there'll be comment time, to direct the uh, county attorney to bring back a modification to the contract to uh, reflect the um, vacation hour rollover. Right. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Baugh. Thank you. I just wanted to say that contrary to what some might be believing here, I'm not one that turned in a review. So you have six, not seven, and I did oh, it sorry. intentionally, so. Why? Oh, I'm just wondering. Oh, you're, you're the one that didn't? I did not. Okay. And I did not because I think I would rather have a personal conversation with Sherry individually rather than publicly to discuss my thoughts. We all would. Uh, well, we were told we had uh, to do it this way. I'm sorry. That's the way I chose to do it, and oh. I can do that legally. So um, I just wanted everyone to know that there were only six, and mine was not one that yeah, was negative was, or positive. Was, I didn't yeah. do one. Well, I did say there were six, yeah, so I don't know if you were out there of the room. Is. I looked, when and, I, and there were... There were six, so I didn't oh. want someone thinking it was me. It wasn't. Can we not do this? Because I'd rather not do it publicly either. Well, okay. no, I, yeah, I'm going to ask the county attorney. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty clear that we have to do provide a review pursuant to the contract the way it's approved. So, you know, whether or not you can do that do without have having it publicly written down, I don't know. Well, <laughs> Madam like Chair, <laughs> members of the board, there is a section in the agreement called performance appraisal that says in November of each year the board will review and appraise the job performance of the administrator. There's an exhibit attached that is the evaluation form. It, it doesn't necessarily mean every single board member has to do it, but there is a process where the board reviews the administrator oh, each year. Really that is in the contract. Cool. So and we don't it has to, to be done right? in November. That's what we've done. Well, yeah, yeah, honestly, yeah. I don't know if it says the board will do it and the board members say, hey, I don't want to do it. I don't think. I think you got to modify the contract, Madam actually. Chair. If y'all would, you know, prefer, I will be happy to write it down, but I really didn't think it to be appropriate at this point. And that's my decision. And as a commissioner, I have the right to make that decision. Um, I made one in June. I'm not going to do one now. I'm period. I like Vanessa. I would rather not we did do. not ever do one for Ed. It was not. We put it specifically in this, and we had a big fight about it, whether to or rather do not. I so, agree with Vanessa. I don't want to do well, you guys can do whatever you want as the Thank board, you. but if you have an ordinance 
or whatever this is, was resolution. Oh, agreement. If you have an agreement that was approved in a public meeting, and in that agreement it states the board will review, I think you're supposed to review. You got an agreement that was approved in a public meeting? That's my thought on it. I didn't. I don't say that you have a choice well, just to say, Madam that. Chair, well, I just assume not. You're sitting there as chairman, and your job as chairman is to run the meetings, not to run the commission individually. And I'm not going to do it. And I have my reasons. So thank you. <laughs> I, oh my God. I honestly don't care at this point. But you know, that's okay, up to the public to decide whether or not there's you're meeting the requirements of the agreements that have been approved. All right, Madam, Madam Chair, I just have to ask a question. I mean, I, I. If I don't have to do it, I would rather not do it publicly. I always thought we had to, we but I agree with Vanessa. If it's legal, we don't have to. Do we do the employees and their personnel files when they do a performance eval? Does it have to be in writing? Yes. Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. What'd you say? Yes. 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 All right. All right. Well. <laughs> Okie dokie, um, uh, Misty. But they're not Since we're commenting on the yeah, process. I, I will just say, I, I, every commissioner can make their own choice. That's right. perfectly fine with me. But I do think that it is a very clear way to communicate to the county administrator how she's doing in a written evaluation. And I do feel it's important to have it in the contract. So okay. that's my two cents. Well, and I also feel that, again, we represent the public. You know, we're not here as individuals. We're not here as, you know, I don't personally have just a personal opinion. This is my job, you know. This is my job. I represent the public. The public expects certain things from their commissioners. They want to know how do they think. They want to be able to tell me if they think I'm wrong. And they have every right to do that. And you know what? My eight years, from my experiences, they don't hesitate to tell me when they think I'm wrong. <laughs> you know? <laughs> just, no comments. <laughs> from the gallery. Gallery. Your So, I, you know, I just, you know, I think it's, uh, it'll be an interesting time for y'all. Carol? Well, um, while we're on this, uh, I just have a question. I know um, Sherry's going to get her contract to match probably what Carlos has and what our county attorney has with the vacation, correct? That That's is what the, the motion of this is for. Motion. Okay, but why aren't we doing a performance evaluation since we just did one, but there's no reimbursement attached? I mean, wasn't it like we've always done it when we've done Carlos? We did a a reimbursement. I mean, I know she's not asking for it, but well, I can tell you why. I think she's kind of worked a million hours since COVID, and she deserves it, and she's getting paid less than any county administrator in this area. Okay, now, I well. think I'm right. Am I? Sherry, Do you, you know? wanted to make a comment? Yeah, there's the, you know, the language in the contracts are different for any contract in Mr. Clegg's contract, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Palmer's contract. But in the contract that you approved for myself, the, um, the, um, if there is a market adjustment recommended for the county employees, then the administrator is eligible for that. Yeah, At, you I mean. all helped us approve in the last two year budgets to put in place the pay scale market changes mm -hmm. to bring our staff up to level. And so we didn't need to make that market level adjustment, which is why I'm not asking for an increase. It's certainly in that clause says you can consider compensation adjustments annually. But um, again, as was explained, I think given what's been going on, um, you know, I, I prefer to to try to just uh, carry over the time that I haven't been able to take because of COVID. This is an unusual year. It's not going to happen again. And um, it's not over. It's not going to happen again. And um, so I'm, I'm good. That's right. Yeah. Not going to happen <laughs> right. again. We're going to get a great vaccine and we're going to move forward and we're going to get back to <laughs> being somewhat normal. That would be wonderful. Right. All right. Um, Oh my, that would be even more wonderful. So, uh, okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the motion on the floor, which is to bring back the contract to adjust for the carryover hours? Okay, seeing no one come forward, I'm gonna close public comment. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. 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 All right, uh, chair votes aye, motion yes. passes four to two. All righty. Again, Sherry. Can I um, just say, you know, I just, I, I think we're again rushing to judgment. I, it's not that I don't disagree that maybe we should have the rollover, but again, we just that we just blew this by in 30 seconds, and I think well, we should have had more conversation to 
understand what it meant, what the financial obligations are to the county by allowing the rollover, and I'm not saying she's not, shouldn't be entitled to it, because it has been a rough year, no question about it. But I just don't think we're, you know, really uh, venting the, the consequences of it fully. I know I don't, didn't feel that way. I don't know what Bill's, I'm sorry, or Mickey's rollover provision is, or Carlos's, yeah, and, same as you know, no. but I think this, I guess this motion is strictly one where you're going to bring it back and make a recommendation before it gets done, and I won't be here anyway, but I just felt well, I needed to explain why I, you know, I'm not in favor of it at this point. Yeah, and it not. probably should have been explained a little bit better. It, it, what, you're at 400 hours it's now fair. based on what the contract allows. It'll go to 475. It's actually a fairly minor increase. It just is to match the county attorneys. And, and quite frankly, I mean, Carl. the reality is every at-will employee at the will of the Board of County Commissioners needs to make sure that they're um, protecting themselves. And I admire someone who does that because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I think that, um, you know, I had no problem with helping our county administrator, who I said I think has done a great job, but that's something each one of you have to evaluate. I'm sorry it wasn't explained better so you knew what exactly the costs are, but it's not a significant cost, but it is something that I think is important enough to make her on the same. I mean, you know, who, do, who does the board hire? Two people. But I just think the public should, you know, be aware of what the cost is to the taxpayers. And well, technically, we didn't vote on her getting it. We voted for the attorney to come back with a new board yeah, and say right. what's going to happen. They're actually going to vote whether she gets it or not. Right. Correct. I, I was going to say the same thing. I think it's cost neutral. It's a benefit. It was part of her compensation that she just was unable to take those vacation hours. So it's not anything in addition. It's cost neutral is how I looked at it. Yeah, and it's, you know, when you're a county employee, you really don't have any cho choice because it's written, you know, it's a standard maximum what you could buy out, blah, blah. Well, but I think I can explain one thing, if you don't mind. It might mm -hmm. be what Steve's looking for. And, and just to clarify what uh, Commissioner Servia said is that uh, when you've been with the county for a while, um, you, you know, in other roles, you have, we have certain limits for county employees up to 400 hours a year mm -hmm. that you can, you can maintain without any of the extra rolling into your sick time. Okay. So, um, um, I would like to think this is a good thing, but, um, I have probably in excess of about 2,300 sick hours and those will never be paid out so those are you know, only up to the amount allowable if i would ever when i would retire or when i would leave the county i believe it's up to 500. so there's already a considerable amount of that time that will never be you know acquired by so what would happen would be anything above and beyond the 400 right now would roll into sick time and so it would not i would not get it wouldn't be accountable for me i wouldn't be able to get it Go to the mic, you Steve. Yeah, can you see? Year. That you can go out a whole year if, if for some reason, you know, you'd left that you, you would get a year where the county, other county employees are limited to. Well, there are our sections in my, in my contract that um, dependent upon how you uh, depart, so to speak. If your contract ends, it ends. But there are other various sections, like three or four different sections. Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm just saying. I just... I think that all needs to be brought forward when they come come back at some point. Not going to be our job. Go ahead, Carol. Well, maybe uh, hopefully Steve Wood could reconsider. I don't know why Vanessa voted against it, but I do know that there are people in this community that don't want Sherry in this position. And, you know, and I've heard it during the election cycle, uh, people uh, trying to get other people to take in this job. Sherry's worked her butt off for Manatee County. She is asking for what Bill Clegg has now. And I just don't think, um, Steve, I mean, I, now that it explained a little bit, maybe you would reconsider it, but we all know what's going on. It's just not being said publicly. And I know for 100% fact that this is what's going on. So, uh, and I just want to know, you know, has Sherry done a bad job? Has Sherry missed any work since she's been here? Has she not pulled out a major pandemic with employees working night and day for us and we've still been able to function? I mean, you can't say that she hasn't done that. 
So I just can't believe that we can't give her what Bill Clegg is going to be making and Mickey Palmer has. It just doesn't make sense. And thank you for not taking the increase in salary. Um, I respect you for doing that, and I'm glad you explained it. But um, I know what's going on here, and I think it needs to be said publicly. So, Sherry, I'm sorry you have to be put through this. Uh, Ed had to go through it a couple times, too. But um, most of this community, 99% of this community, think you're doing a great job. And everybody, every one of your department heads behind you feel the same way. Okay. Vanessa. You know, Commissioner Whitmore, you seem to think you know a lot. You All don't right. know what I'm thinking or what I'm thinking or why I'm thinking it. So I don't particularly care for your accusations because they are off base. No one has asked me to do anything. I do what I feel is the right thing to do Good. for the citizens of this county. So please, you make your votes, I'll make mine. Okay? And they In the meantime, explaining. I don't know why anyone else does what they do, why they vote the way they do, but I think the vote's been done. So let it go. Okay. Well, anyways, <laughs> Steve, please. Yes, can I call the question? Yes. Didn't we already vote? We already, we already, voted. Voted. We already yeah. voted. We don't it's have five a question. To two. Oh, no, four to two. <laughs> Exactly. Darn good question. Because you Darn were explaining yourself, question. and then it got into a dialogue. Okay, <laughs> we're going to move right along. So you explained Moving yourself. right along you to started. one last activity, yeah. and this is uh, where we're going to recognize the outgoing commissioners. And Sherry's going to take the lead on this. Go. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, this is what is a difficult agenda item right here to do, to say thank you to the three outgoing commissioners. You, as you indicated, we have a lot of the senior level staff here. And um, we put together some um, important milestones, but on behalf of the county administration, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to Chairman Benack. Thank you, Commissioner Trace. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for all your efforts here. Um, we have, uh, we're hoping that folks will come over and um, get a chance to say goodbye, but with all of the work that you put in, let's just start off real quickly with a brief video to kind of remind you of some of the amazing milestones that you've already achieved. And on behalf of the county administration, all of your county citizens, thank you for your indelible duty. Oh, that girl looks familiar. Mm -hmm. Wait, we gotta get the music. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioners over. Betsy Benack, Stephen Johnson, and Priscilla. How do we say goodbye to three people who've given so much and left an indelible mark on the county commission and on our community? Commissioners Betsy Benack, Stephen Johnson, and Priscilla Trace have dedicated a combined 16 years to serving Manatee County on the Board of County Commissioners. In the past four years alone, you've provided calm leadership and professional guidance through public emergencies like Hurricane Irma in 2017, the devastating red tide summer of 2018, and the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. Together with you, our government has achieved major milestones, opening the Fort Hammer Bridge, establishing a solid spending plan on local projects through the infrastructure sales tax, and responding every year to the need to fund local law enforcement and public safety needs for a community that is growing by 10,000 residents a year. Coming from a very different background, you each brought a unique perspective and expertise to the board. At large commissioner Betsy Benack's many years of experience in planning both in the public and private sector helped her make informed decisions on countless projects affecting the entire county. Commissioner Benack, you served as chairman of the board three times during your tenure in office. You were part of the board that broke ground 
for the Fort Hammer Bridge in 2015. Today, the bridge shortens commutes for parish residents who work in Lakewood Ranch, and it creates a faster link for the young families of Lakewood Ranch wanting to reach the Fort Hammer Rowing Park and Boat Ramp, and one day, Hidden Harbor Park. You've also been with us for critical milestones in constructing the massive 44th Avenue Extension Project that will connect Lakewood Ranch to West Bradenton. Your planning background helped us form the Southwest District to reinvest in some of our aging neighborhoods, and you helped create the Livable Manatee Incentive Program to encourage construction of new affordable housing units within mixed income developments for future homeowners and renters. District 3 Commissioner Stephen Johnson's extensive background in accounting and finance provided expertise in analyzing the county's budget, and he brought a steady hand to the chairman's seat in 2019. Along the way, you helped bring about a number of important projects in your district, including expansion projects at Robinson Preserve and the Nature, Exploration, Science, and Technology Center, or better known as The Nest. The Nest opened in 2018 as a beautiful new elevated treehouse education center for environmental programs and educational courses for the public. This year, a new canopy zone at Robinson brings a new adventure park element to Robinson with boardwalks, rope bridges, climbing nets, and slides that will create a new generation of Robinson Preserve lovers throughout the area. The GT Bray Tennis and Pickleball renovations are scheduled for opening in late 2021, and those were important projects for you. You have also been a huge supporter of our local tourism, and you helped obtain millions of federal and state dollars for beach renourishment projects like the one completed in 2020. District 1 Commissioner Priscilla Trace brought the perspective of a local business owner and a fifth generation Manatee County resident with close ties to agriculture to the commission when she joined us in 2016. Commissioner Trace, you've seen firsthand the impacts of all the growth and added traffic in Parish over the past four years, and you've pushed hard for infrastructure improvements to serve your district. You were with us when we reopened the Rabonia Community Center and you fought hard for state dollars on the Rabonia stormwater and sidewalk project beginning later this year. You also helped bring about Palmetto's first dog park and needed improvements to the soccer and softball fields at Blackstone Park. You also lobbied our state leaders for funding to help on 44th Avenue and on Moccasin Walla Road which will be widened soon to meet traffic demands in North County. We also could not have begun work at State Road 675 and 62 without your relationships with FDOT officials. Beside that, your persistence in selecting the appropriate name for the Parish Community High School and your continued concern of sidewalks and intersections in the Parish area show your level of knowledge of your district. We'll miss your passion for Manatee County and your ag roots that make you our biggest fan of Farm City Week and the County Fair. We'll also miss new photos of Kamish the pig on Valentine's Day. On behalf of the County Administration team, our department directors, the 1900 people who work for this government, and all the residents of Manatee County, we want to thank you commissioners for your hard work and commitment to Manatee County for so many years. We wish you the best of luck and we can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Well, it was it was hard to just find a few things because you've all done so many things. But we'd really like to um, have you come up and receive a special gift too. So if you want to do that separately, Steve, would you like to come up first?
Commissioner Johnson, on behalf of all of your coworkers here, all your board, we'd like to present you with a remembrance of your time as a commissioner on the board, and thank you very much, and hope if you have a few things to say, you might want to go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll yeah, put, put it, it down, down before I drop it. Um, <laughs> yes, it's been a very interesting four years, as we've noticed in the uh, slideshow there, with uh, starting with... Uh, the Hurricane Irma going through the red tide and then into the uh, um, the um, what's this thing we got now? Oh, the, that COVID thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of got us all worked up a little bit. Um, so it has not been a, a, a boring moment ever, for sure. And I and it's all the help that the employees, that the staff, that everybody puts forth that makes our jobs as commissioners a lot easier. And that's, you know, you're the ones who are the worker bees. We just sit there and take the direction and then we usually beat a subject to death as yeah. best we can <laughs> at, our, at our meetings. Um, but, you know, it's been a real pleasure and a real honor having lived here in Mantee County for 44 years. It's a great way uh, to kind of end my uh, working life at this point from the standpoint of getting into politics, which I never thought I would ever consider doing, and I don't think I will ever consider doing again. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I thank all of you, and uh, I think the appropriate way to end my, my talk is I'm gonna sit there and um, yield to Betsy when she comes up to talk so that she'll have more time to <laughs> go ahead and expound on her experiences here in the county. So thank you all very much. Commissioner Trace, would you like to come up, please? <laughs> Looking around that mask. Thank you, Commissioner Trace. On behalf of all of the county employees and all of your county administration, we'd like to present you with something to remember us by. When you don't have internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I'd ever forget y'all. Um, looking at that thing, I sh probably should have combed my hair a little bit more often. <laughs> well, I have just a few words, and, you know, I will keep it, as always, short and sweet. Uh, but we just had this presidential election, and y'all all know, since we kind of talked about it earlier, about the library. I read a lot, and I read a lot of history. In the late 1800s, we were told that the republic will not survive, that we are divided as a country, and we're not going to be able to make it. And Thomas Jefferson, who beat his very, very good friend, John Adams, and then they never spoke again for about 30 years, said, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have, we have been called by different names, but we are brothers of the same principle. We are all Republicans, and we are all Federalists. People, let's get over it. We're Americans. Let's do what we're supposed to do. And now that's to get to the job of, of governing this republic. Um, I just want to say how honored I've been. I said I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> I've been pretty good about it. You have. Deep breath. No, I don't like to cry in public. That's okay. It's un-American. <laughs> it's actually very American. Deep breath, girl. Come on. How much it's been an honor to serve District 1. That's my people. I was born there. My parents were born there. I had a grandparent born in District 1. Mm -hmm. it means a lot to me. And me and my friends and my new friends that I've met there, we've done a lot. We have got a light at Canal that's coming with Reggie's help, and we got one at Rutland Road. We realigned in 62, got the Parish Park going, and I've worked very hard on Shell Roads, which a lot of you people don't think is a big deal, but let me tell you, it's a big deal if you live on a Shell Road. 
and we've done a whole lot of others. I'd like to thank the administrator, deputy administrators, and department heads, but mostly the people that make them good. It's the people under them, the people that are actually doing the work. We sit up here, and every time we ask for something, it is giving to us. Why? Because they want this county to be run the best that this county can be run. And we have the best. I can't believe that anywhere that there's a better administration than what we have. I'd love to thank Mary Ann. She was our she's administrator. Here. She's, she's here. here. She taught me a lot. And I said, you know what? We can't replace Mary Ann. No one's going to be as good as Mary Ann. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Vita came in. And Vita is outstanding. Mm -hmm. And Celeste and Diane, they make us, they make us what we are. And they help us. And I don't think we are so lucky. We have the best county administration that anyone has. And most of y'all know I'm very spiritual. May not look like it. But for the new guys coming in, remember Proverbs 17, 27. It's hard to tell a fool if he keeps his mouth shut. Set me up. <laughs> Please, may I? I move we close. I call the question. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Benack, if you wouldn't mind coming up. And again, thank you so much for all your years of service and your leadership of the board this year. We really appreciate everything. <laughs> Put that over here. Thank you. Oh gosh, um, you know it seems a little bit surreal that this day has come. Uh, at one point, I was all in to run for re-election, and then I was all out. <laughs> I was not defeated in a race, contrary to what I read in the paper. Um, <laughs> I made the decision not to run for another term. But I will tell you that I too am extremely honored to have had the opportunity to serve as an at-large commissioner in Manatee County for eight years. Um, I can't help but think ich bin ein Berliner. Maybe some of you know what that means. But in my case, ich bin ein Manatee Countyan because I came to Manatee County in 1983 as a 26-year-old planner and started working for Manatee County, and I actually lived in Sarasota County at the time, and I thought, what an incredible place. I want to live in Manatee County. And um, I've always been an extremely patriotic person. My father served on our city council. I had two uncles that served on the school board. Always have been very, very much into public service, so I was thrilled to get the opportunity to serve, um, beat out a guy that had been here for 26 years, um, but I am so honored and so grateful to all of the people that I have met. You meet a lot of people when you're in this job. You meet some great people and you meet some people that you do not agree with and they don't agree with you. But it still is a great, great community um, because largely because of the staff. I've known Sherry for almost 30 years. Um, you know, I've known many of you for a very, very, very long time. And I, um, I'm gonna miss the day-to-day -day, um, being a county commissioner. I can't even imagine what it's gonna be like to be retired. I don't know what the heck that even means because um, I've basically worked my entire life since I was 16 years old. And uh, more than half of that was in the private sector, but being in the public sector has been so important because I know how hard the staff works. And I know how much it, it means to all of you to be able to be successful and do the right thing and have the long view. It's not easy to have the long view. So I don't know what else I can say other than um, I will still be around. I still want to be involved. 
Um, I want to thank Vanessa for making me chair. I do enjoy being chair, for nominating me as chair. So um, I've enjoyed this uh, third term being chair. I think we've accomplished a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, it's time for me to step down, take care of my family, and um, that's what I'm going to do. But I just want to say thank you to everybody for all, the, all of the support that you've given me throughout the years. You've always been there, and I, I think that Manatee County is in very, very good hands. So thank you. And I would just mention, I think we have maybe some folks in the audience, um, Chairman Benack, that want to step up or may want to speak. I don't know. You may want to ask. I know yeah. some folks uh -huh. have come. I did have one person signed up to speak. I'm not sure I should recognize her because she does. She doesn't even live here. But Lucy Malakas, my sister, signed up to speak. <laughs> oh, it feels so good. <laughs> She'll cry for me. I don't cry for you. <laughs> I cry for Argentina. <laughs> Argentina. I uh. I, I have to start out by saying, on my drive down here, I was about five minutes into my drive, and what comes on the radio but Bohemian Rhapsody? <laughs> and I think, oh my gosh, this is a day to remember, and everybody up in heaven knows, because they played that song on there, they made them play that song, it just cracked me up. But I have a few words that I would really like to say. <clears throat> I have known Betsy for over 63 years. <laughs> when she was in high school, she set her mind to go to the University of Michigan, go blue. She not only went there, but also received a scholarship. I will admit, when I heard what she was majoring in, something about planning, I had no clue what that was. Planning what? All I could think of was good luck getting a job. <laughs> Fast track several years. Betsy was now working for the county, planning something. I still had no clue what. I even visited her office once and met Misty, and she was planning something too. And I had no clue what. Eventually, Betsy went to work for some group that was planning an entire community. Her descriptions of this new community, along with regaling me with stories about Manatee County and her absolute love for the county, were interesting. But I continued to have zero knowledge of what she was talking about. <laughs> Then Betsy told me she was running for a county commissioner spot. Now, I must admit, I am not at all political. My interest in the political field is and has always been education. I had absolutely no clue what a county commissioner did or why. When the primary election was looming, I decided to come visit her and see what she was talking about. She put me and our mutual friend straight to work waving political signs. It seemed like all day in 110 degree heat. We had a lot of fun and certainly doing something very new for me because I still had no clue what it was she was actually running for. What I did learn was there were a lot of people who believed in her, trusted her, and voted for her. So apparently this commission thing must be a good choice for her. I was able to attend her watch party where I met so many people who undeniably considered Betsy to be an amazing woman who would be an excellent commissioner. Now let's jump forward to 2015. I decided to move to Florida and live in Manatee County to be closer to Betsy and live in this county. After making sure she introduced us, my husband and I, to it seemed like every beach, restaurant, tourist attraction, and nature preserve, it was once again time for the primaries. So once again, I got to wave signs. This time my husband joined me. And still, I really had no clue what she did exactly. <laughs> then she invited me to a meeting and everything changed. I actually saw what she did and it was impressive. After attending that meeting, I started becoming more involved in the community as a volunteer for organizations that she set me up with. My husband and I made a point of watching as many meetings that were live streamed as possible. I was constantly mesmerized by Betsy's knowledge about so many things involving Manatee County. We actually called these live streams the greatest reality TV show ever and really looked forward to watching them every week. It was apparent that Betsy always tried her best to be 
adequately, if not superiorly, prepared for whatever was being discussed. Her knowledge of the law and the land rights of Manatee citizens was amazing. Her discussions and her decisions were based on that knowledge and not on emotion. Even in times of adversity, Betsy always maintained a calm demeanor, never showing frustration, anger, and indecision. Although I must admit, there were times that I could tell she was getting a little bit frustrated. She always made her decisions based on facts, the laws, and what was best for the citizens of Manatee County. Betsy had to make the difficult decision to step down as a commissioner for the sake of her family. I will admit, both my husband and I are not exactly unhappy with this decision. <laughs> now, Betsy can relax a little bit, though, and I highly doubt she will. But now, we can visit all those wonderful amenities and volunteer in Manatee County together. <laughs> Wearing a mask, of course. And maybe she will stop saying y'all. Drives me crazy. In conclusion, I need to say how very proud I am to be your sister. How very proud your other brothers and sister are. How very proud our parents are that you are their daughter. I brought mom with me. No. And now, I know what a county commissioner is and what you guys do. She was a good one, and she will be missed. Thank you. Y'all should bring your sisters with you. So. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. I, I, I'm at a loss for words. I should have prepared a little something, but Steve, Betsy, um, Priscilla, I just, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you all greatly. It's been a, a privilege and an honor to serve with you in this community, um, showing up at different events and, and serving and, and handing out, uh, Betsy, uh, I think it was um, Betsy and I handing out groceries, going to the various lunches, dinners, gatherings. You get to know people like that when, when we're all serving in it together. And I'm going to miss you three so much. Uh, but I just wanted to get over here and say goodbye to you. And, and I, I, please don't be a stranger. Please, you've got, well, got my numbers on your cell, I know. <laughs> so, um, and I still want to meet Kamish, Priscilla. <laughs> I still want to meet Kamish. Better get there before barbecue season. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'd like to see him while he's Kamish and not seconds. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I, I'll miss you and all that you do, and I'll see you around. And please stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. All right. All right. <laughs> Joe Hendricks, Anna Marie Island's son. As a member of the media, I know what a tough and thankless job you guys have. You guys put up with a lot. It's a hard job. It's an endless job. And on behalf of all the media, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else that wants to speak? Or unless it's... Uh, this is time for cake. <laughs> time to eat. Okay, uh, Misty. Yeah, I I can't not speak. I'm I'm so honored to have worked with all three of you and and Betsy. I love what your sister said. Wasn't that great? <laughs> We're gonna have to clip that out. That was perfect um, because Betsy is a a born leader, right? I've known Betsy a long time, thirty years I think. Um, independent, brave, and. Uh, known as the Dragon Lady for, I don't know, maybe that was like 20 years ago, someone Jensen, called you the Dragon Lady. And Jason, at the time uh, it was a Tucson. sexist remark, really. I mean, because she was asking for some landscaping, I think. Um, but you embraced it, you know? <laughs> um, you, you've been described by many people I know as wicked smart, and it's so true. And uh, I always told my kids to find people like you to hang out with, because that's how you get smarter. You learn, learn from people like that. Priscilla, Jefferson and Adams' comments were spot on. Or it could have been written today, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, those are really good. I've really enjoyed working with you. You're straight up. We can have a laugh and have fun and then have a really serious conversation in the next minute. I'm going to miss that about you and, and all the experience that you have as a farmer. You're a hydrologist. You're, you've got business savvy skills, you know, the soil, the weather. I mean, you brought a lot to this board and we're really going to miss you. And uh, Steve, I'll never, ever forget. You know, the answer is money. Now tell me what the question is. And that, that phrase comes to me all the time. And I always think of you and I'll always remember you for that. And I appreciate your background and what you've brought to the board. I'm going to miss you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Carol. I'm going to, uh, of course, I'm going to miss all of you. Uh, I've been through this pony show many times. I think this is my 12th. Uh, I had, uh, eight, yeah, my 12th election but i've been in politics since 91 and um you know i'm very anal and all of you know about sunshine so i can tell you everything i i can't really tell you much about business except how you perform out here but i can tell you everything about betsy's family her husband what her husband's going through xavier your dog javier sorry javier. Um, the trips to Michigan, the cabin, the maple syrup, uh, I mean, you name it. That um, I'm from Michigan, but I moved here when I was 14, so you live a, a part of life that I never was able to, and I live very curiously through you. I love your husband and your family. Your little grandbaby looks just like you, and um, like mommy, but just like you. So, And I know that she's the love of your life. Pris, uh, Never met anybody like you. <laughs> I uh, got to really know how, where the Wisnet sense of humor came when I went to your dad's funeral. I'll never forget the mattress story, and that was that you brought up. Uh, uh, the family brought up at the the funeral, and then I got you. Um, I've learned a lot from you. Um, you are down to earth. You, I, as you know, tend to be uptight. I don't laugh a lot. And even Priscilla said that she's got me to laugh a few times and just try to let things roll off. But um, you got a good family. Um, to see you up there break down, that is not Priscilla Trace. She tries to be strong. I know she was hurt during this election. I know that this upset her. And I'm glad that you showed the people how much you really cared about your uh, your district, and you know I love both of you. Now, we got Steve here that I've learned on how many loans, first loans he's given everybody in Manatee County, <laughs> Boletaries, Carlos, many others uh, I've learned about. And actually, Steve and I have quite a few friends in common. Chip McCarthy, didn't know he knew Steve, at, I mean, um, Steve Johnson at all, and I'm sure you didn't know he knew me. Dr. Sider and your very close friends. I've been friends with them for years in another world. Um, loved your um, input in this, your sense of humor, your, your grandbaby, your daughter, your son. Again, I've learned a lot from all of you, and you know I love you to death. Am I getting you upset? You better, oh, and I got you those socks. Show them again. I had to, I had to make them a little more wild and let his hair, well, not hair, but let his hair down. A, and let his hair down a little. I had to, we went up to Tallahassee and I wanted to make, uh, get Steve a little more uh, wilder. So, yeah. So, you know, we couldn't do, can't talk about work, but we sure had fun. It was, I, I, I'm different. I consider my friends forever. I don't have family, never really had, except my husband, my daughter. But and you know our grand our, our kids. But I've always considered my in my head my fa my friends are forever, and I consider you all. So love you to death. All right, uh, Reggie, I think, and then uh, I'll go to County Attorney. Wow, bitter, bittersweet moment uh, to Priscilla. Mm -hmm. I have learned so much from you, and just watch your demeanor and the way um, you address difficult issues. I think it's very important to know that you and I built a relationship before I became a county commissioner. And one thing that always amazed me about you is that when we left that meeting, you did not disconnect. You stayed in contact, and we continued to do things. And this is when I was an executive director at the youth center, still is. And you continue to say that you're going to fight and get things done um, for the community in North River. And you have done that. Mm -hmm. 
you've, you've done that, and we have um, found ways to continue to make an impact north of the river. And not only your, your, your leadership will be missed, but your knowledge. Um, you bring a sense of knowledge to, you brought a, a sense of knowledge to the board that I don't think many of us had when we started talking about certain issues and things of that nature. Um, but I'm just thankful of our relationship and the things that we have had the opportunity to get accomplished um, north of the river. Please, sincerely, don't stop being my friend. Mm, you won't. Because I will continue to allow you to be a mentor in my life, allow you to be someone that continues to show me how to care for our community and just work, not get caught up in the things that's going on to the left and to the right. Focus on getting things accomplished. To Mr. Steve, you're talking about a brain in, in some of the comments. And I, I recall Steve and I walking down the road. We decided to walk when we were in Washington um, from one spot to the other. And um, Steve was a, a, an individual. We just talked candidly to each other. And it wasn't necessarily about issues in Manatee County. It was about life. And he gave me some pointers um, on life and, and started talking about opportunities for me and how he would be willing to, to, to help me. And I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. And, and I thank you um, for the, the work and the things that you've done. And I'm going to be honest with you. I love Coquina Beach <laughs> and the different things that have taken place out there. And I know um, that that was something that you spearheaded and that that was your baby. And I think the community owes you a big thank you for doing that. And I, and I, and I appreciate that um, to Betsy. <laughs> okay. I, have, I have built a different type of relationship with Betsy. The first time I met Betsy is in 2015 when I became the executive director at the Palmetto Youth Center. Mm -hmm. And I set up a meeting with all the commissioners and had an opportunity to meet with them. And I was late for Betsy's meeting. And you should have saw the look. She was probably late. <laughs> you, should, you should have saw the look She's late. that Betsy gave me. I was um, immediately intimidated. I was very apologetic. <laughs> and the conversation of that meeting, if I don't know whether or not you remember it, Betsy, but it was with you myself and Ray Dowling. Yeah, I do remember. And we were talking about lights in the Memphis area. And I stand here right now and tell you thank you because you gave me some ideas and some things on how we can proceed with that. And I don't know whether or not it was put on the bike burner then, but I can tell you right now that we have the Memphis lights. And I, it has a lot to do with that information that you gave me in that meeting and the support from Ray Dowling. Of mine, you are. You are to me. You are a very, very intelligent individual, and I do not know how you do it all and keep it all together and continue to make sure everything is aligned. So my hat go my hat go off to you and thank all of you for your leadership and allowing me to learn and pour into me so I can be a better Reggie. And I'm sure our community thanks you also. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Palmer, glad to see you here today. Madam Chair, good to see you. Um, I, my, the legal pad is blank. Uh, I have no prepared remarks. Um, I, I, I nevertheless knew that I was not going to miss this this afternoon. So even though I have turned over uh, uh, the legal aspect of the county commission meetings to my successor, Mr. Clegg, uh, I knew that this is an afternoon that I did not want to miss. And so I want to say to, well, let me say, first of all, the position of county attorney, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a position that prohibits it's the occupant of this chair from becoming too personal and too close with any of the seven commissioners. Mm -hmm. Because it is our job to approach, uh, you know, our, our responsibilities objectively and independently day in and day out and to provide the best independent advice that we can, uh, uh, regardless of the politics involved. And so it is difficult to, uh, to become friends with any one commissioner or two or three or however many. Um, but I look forward, in light of my, my forthcoming departure from county government, to, uh, to um, I look forward to becoming 
friends, true friends, with each of the three of you as opposed to uh, uh, professional relationships. I look forward to becoming true friends with each of the three of you. All three of you have been extremely respectful uh, of the office of the county attorney uh, in my time as county attorney, and, and you have no idea how much that is appreciated. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I just, you know, each of you has my cell number. I've got your cell numbers, and I, I, I intend to, to foster those friendships more than I ever have before. And so thank you each for your excellent service uh, over the years, and, uh, and uh, yeah, let's not be strangers. Sure, sure, go ahead. So, um, Mr. I would like to say on behalf of the office, I mean, I think most of the people in this room know what I mean. The county attorney's office is not the good news department of the county. We <laughs> tend to have to bring the more difficult stuff <laughs> to people. It has been a great pleasure to work with all three of you. You've handled that with professionalism such that it's made it much easier for us to do our job, and you've brought your various disciplines to the table, finance, agriculture and planning in ways that have been fascinating for us in working with you. At the risk of singling out one of you, Madam Chair, I, I do want to make a couple of comments about how you've handled some of the really difficult controversies that we have weathered in these last few years. I've been doing this for 24 years. The worst controversies I've seen were in the last few years, and it just so happened you got to chair the board through all of them. When we are dealing with controversies where we know we're going to court, no matter what the board does, mm -hmm. it's not just the lawyer that's sitting next to you, it's usually Sarah or me that's looking at it, but a lot of people behind the scenes who are going to have to defend it. And you handled those things with a very steadfast, professional and cool-handed approach that gave us all a great deal of comfort and confidence and we all admire you for that, and we thank you for it. Thank you. Yes, Vanessa. I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, with what Bill Clegg just said, just remember, I think I probably nominated you to be chair both times that he's talking about when it was really difficult <laughs> that, Now that he reminds me of that, I'm not sure I should thank you. Now you reminded me of all these um, nightmares. But. <laughs> no, I can think of a couple of things that Bill is talking about that, that have been truly controversial and very difficult, and you were chair. Um, but that being said, Priscilla, I did not know you until you ran for county commission. I did not support you, as we both know, when you ran, but I have found you to be uh, extremely good at what you do. Um, contrary to so much belief, I did not uh, even know your opponent. Um, I really thought you'd still be serving on the board, and I'm sorry you're not. I think you'll be a, uh, that you'll be greatly missed. Um, Steve Johnson. I was going to save the best for last, but, you know. Um, you have truly been a good friend. Um, you've taught me a lot. When it comes to finance, you are the best. Um, you've been really, I think, in so many ways what this board needed and said so many of the things that needed to be said in the last four years. I'm going to miss you. Um, I. Uh, it's going to be tough not to see you here on this board. You've been wonderful. Betsy, you and I ran together the first time. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we celebrated our victory party together at Lou Marinaccio's Lou's. house mm -hmm. right. in the concession. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I sit back and I've watched you uh, over the last eight years, and you've done a tremendous job. And it is an honor for me to have been able to serve with you. So I thank you for that. I'll miss you. Thank you. Carol, I, I saw Will Robinson in the audience, our state representative, and I wanted to recognize that, that he was here today. And thank you for coming to say goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, I just, you know, Will and his dad, and I just, his dad was such a supporter of mine. I still remember him at mm -hmm. my victory party and uh, how excited he was. So some great memories. You know, we have great, great, great families here in Manatee County, and um I don't know that we can say a whole lot more, Priscilla. I'm done. You, you're going to be missed. You're mm -hmm. going to be missed because of your knowledge, because of what you have brought, 
And um, you know, it's not fair. Mm -mm. It's not fair. You should be you should be the one, but that's not the way politics works sometimes. I'm an ag person. It's never fair. Never yeah. fair. You can have the best crop in the world and the world market is terrible. Yeah. Worst crop in the world, great market. It's yeah. life, you know. Well, they're going to miss you when you're gone because you never know what you have until it's gone sometimes. Isn't that another song? Um, so I don't, I don't know. We could. But we should recognize uh, we have Commissioner elect George Cruz here. I don't see any of the others. So welcome to the board, and I'm glad. Thank you for coming today. It was good. It was nice of you to come today. Yeah. I talked to George a long time ago about him wanting to run for this spot, and uh, he worked hard, and he, he won the spot, and I think he'll do a great job. So. Well, Madam Chairman, Sherry. you know, uh, this is 2020 and it's a really weird year, right? Now and what? So it's heading this way. We could not let you go without doing your last service here. And this wasn't something we planned, but um, Director Sauer needs to step up and oh, we need no. to declare a state of emergency. What? For You're kidding. Oh, oh crap. <laughs> Are you kidding? Dave, don't you say it. Don't do it. <laughs> Just say it. Uh, after such a... Um, Wonderful. Listening to the, the wonderful comments uh, of, of the board uh, while that was occurring, my, myself as, um, as well as Chief Litchauer got texts from various other partners from the National Weather Service and some local meteorologists and they said, sorry, but uh, the, the 4 p.m. track that's going to be coming up is going to bring the storm much closer to us than we thought. And we could be looking at tropical storm watches in effect for that's our okay. area northward on the west coast. So while I have you all here, yeah. um, and it's 2020, I think your last action probably should be to enact a local state of emergency for tropical storms. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Whitmore, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. Anyone who'd like to address the motion on the floor? Can I ask Jake, what does that mean for me that lives on the island? Gale force winds, I mean like 45 mile an hour winds? Well, obviously we, we're gonna have to wait till the 4 p.m. update releases. Okay. They, they, they don't give us that much information. They did give us some text, but uh, um, what I believe it to mean is that the storm, because it's, it's uh, slowing down and meandering, it's okay. been very unpredictable from the beginning. However, yesterday we had uh, a morning, an afternoon. We had another morning today uh, update, all tracking west. So we were very confident in it. Um, something has occurred that made them think it's going to track uh, more to the east, closer. I mean, the exact words from Dan Noah was, it's going to come closer to you than we expected. So what that means to me is we could see some uh, gusts of wind especially for the barrier islands, maybe some low-lying flooding in certain areas that are prone to flooding in the past. Obviously, when we get that 4 p.m. update, we will push that out to all of you guys so that you have the latest. It's probably the vacuum that's being created by three of us leaving. I would agree. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Go on the island of love. I was figuring those people in Louisiana have already been hit three times for blowing very yeah, hard. Yeah, blowing very hard. I yeah, would if I was them. Wow. Watches just mean, you know, that the, a tropical storm, just that you wind. should watch it, you know. Right. When, if, it, if it continues to track east, we'll eventually move into a, a tropical storm warning. Um, and that's when we'll have a, a firmer impact. But, you know, we're looking at another Thursday, Friday event. Okay. Uh, well, better to be safe than sorry. So we are prepared and ready. And we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay. I told you we should have just gone. Reggie? Yeah. Sir, this Thursday, am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at Thursday, Friday, possibly into Saturday. It's a very slow moving storm, and that's the problem with predictability. In, in those we want days. Friday. We don't want it oh, to interfere duh. with the groundbreaking. Yeah, <laughs> we want Friday. Oh, shoot. I just remember you were yeah. there. Yeah. All right. I'm pretty sure I opened that up to public comment, didn't I? I remember. Oh. Yeah. No. I think I said. Can well, we? I'll tell you what. If there's anyone who wants to make a public comment on the motion to declare a state of emergency, um, is, you, now would be your time to come forward. Okay, I'll close public comment and... Can we have a plan, too? You'll let us know if we can't do Thursday. Absolutely. We'll, we, we're in constant contact with, yeah. with Sherry uh, a day and night about this. So we'll definitely push out the latest information as soon as we get it. Okay. All righty. Madam Chair, 
But before we adjourn today, we ought to also acknowledge the presence of our state attorney here as well. I think that's Mr. Brodsky behind the mask. Behind mask. Mm -hmm. It's good to see you, Ed. And Melissa. Congratulations on your victory as well. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's good to see everybody here today. So, um, Sherry. Okay, and else? thank you. Sorry about that. You had to have one more final motion. It's not your fault. Motion. <laughs> um, and so thank you very much. It, uh, it's an honor to work for all of you, and it's an honor for the citizens here to be able to say goodbye. And uh, we have a ceremonial area here just adjacent to this room. We've asked folks to stop by from 3 to 5, and so we hope you'll stick around and uh, accept some folks as giving their fond farewell. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else for the good of the order? If time. not, we are adjourned. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. Boom. <laughs> yeah, <keep going. laughs>